Please welcome our MC to the stage, Near Foundations, Marcus Hibero. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thank you all uh, for being here at day two of NearCon. I uh, hope you are all well rested. I uh, hope you got your coffee in you. If not, then make sure to visit my man Esco bar just outside the speaker area for some uh, amazing coffee. Uh, because we definitely have a, a full packed agenda today of some uh, value-driven conversations, panels, talks, uh, but not just here at the Hacker HQ. Um, we have some different topics across all the venues as well. Uh, you know, there's the NearCon HQ and then the Community HQ as well just down the road. Uh, so make sure you pull up the NearCon app, check the schedule, make sure that you identify talks and panels you want to visit ahead of time uh, so you can make sure that you're there. Um, you know, here at the Hacker HQ, we have uh, five deep tech booths uh, just outside uh, where some amazing teams are showcasing the awesome stuff that they're building. So make sure to check them out, get involved. You also get re rewarded with NCON, uh, which is the currency being used here at, at NearCon uh, to get food, swag. Uh, so definitely make sure you rack those up. Uh, just don't gamble them all away, please. Um, so uh, without further ado, um, you know, to kick things off for the day, I would love to welcome to the stage uh, Pagoda's Dio Ortega, who's going to talk to us all about onboarding Web2 users into Web3 with FastOff. Let's give a round of applause for Dio, everybody. Good morning. Uh, welcome and thank you for waking up early to talk about onboarding. I know it's an exciting topic. Uh, you probably all heard a million times that we need to improve onboarding in Web3. Onboarding is broken. We need the next billion of users to come, and so we need to fix onboarding. So let's start with some self-reflection and see uh, what a typical Web3 onboarding flow looks like today. So if you go to an app, uh, let's assume you're on your phone because most of the traffic today is mobile. You check an app out. like It's, it's a Web3 app, and it asks you to pick a wallet or choose the wallet or log in with a wallet. So basically, you see all these styles with a bunch of logos, a bunch of names you never heard of, and you have no idea where to start. So usually, people just pick the first one. Uh, in trust, that's, that's a good choice. So you pick MetaMask. It asks you to download an app, which is a little sketchy because you just want to go to a website, but you still do it. Uh, then it says, OK, I need to create a wallet for you. And people start creating a wallet. They still don't know what that means. And the next step is to write down a secret recovery phrase, which is kind of like, a weird name uh, for, for, for your seed phrase. And so people just kind of like grab a piece of paper without fully understanding what they're doing. They write a bunch of words. And then we ask them to repeat those words back. So basically, this starts looking like a test. Uh, I think I'm going to fail. But you kind of like keep going and, and start kind of like repeating back your seed phrase. Then before you can do anything on chain, as you know, you have to pay for gas. So the next step will be to onboard funds. So you have to pick an on-ramp solution uh, that kind of like is compatible with your banks and your cards. Uh, once again, you see a bunch of logos you never heard of, you never seen, and so you have to pick one. Usually, people go with the first one, uh, and then you still have to kind of like figure out how to pay for that for that gas and kind of like what payment method you're gonna choose. Uh, when you finally go back to the app, they ask you again to connect your wallet. So you connect your wallet. And you're finally, after 10 steps, uh, you're ready to start signing messages and transactions, which most of times they, lo they look something like this, a bunch of JSON, some code that people don't really understand. So that's the typical Web3 onboarding. Now let's compare it with Web2. Web2, three simple steps. You click Sign Up. You select something like Sign With Google. And you're done. You can start trying the app right away. So how does this translate into numbers and metrics? Uh, so let's first start talk about conversion rate. So conversion rate is the amount of people that end up creating accounts from the first screen of your app. Uh, it's pretty low for Web3. Uh, it's as low as 15 to 22%. Uh, every time you ask people to kind of like write down a seed phrase and, and, and come up with a seed phrase, uh, the number for uh, an, an onboarding flow without seed phrase is 62%. So you're losing a lot of users just because you're asking for all this complexity right away. Um, we should also talk about activation rate, which is the amount of users that end up submitting a transaction on chain from everyone that starts kind of like the onboarding flow. In here, we see an increase of 106% when we do gasless transactions. So this was an experiment run by Decentraland. Uh, they had kind of like an A-B test where people, some people were prompted to kind of like onboard funds and pay for gas, and the other ones could submit their first transaction for free. Of course, free always wins, and they saw a massive increase in activation rate. 
And the last one is the cost of acquisition. So how much money are we spending to acquire each new user, uh, each new Web3 user? And here we see that cost of acquisition on Web3 are about three to seven times higher than Web2, mostly because not a lot of people go through the entire funnel and not a lot of people get through the final steps. So we're basically losing money, losing users, because onboarding is kind of like so complicated. So now I want to talk about FastDot and why uh, we think this is a much better solution for new users uh, that are new to Web3. Uh, I'm going to talk about three main features. The first one we call zero-step onboarding. This basically means that if you have an existing user base in Web2, you can just create wallets for all of them uh, instantaneously. You don't have to ask them to uh, kind of like write down their seed phrase or anything like that. And so you have a much higher conversion rate because they don't need to do anything. They just need to log in, and they'll have a Web3 wallet right away. Then users can also sign up and recover accounts with just an email address. So they, they don't need to back up anything to iCloud. They don't need, again, the seed phrase. And so this results in much lower customer support volume because, as you know, uh, we have kind of like emails from users every day saying, I lost my seed phrase. I want my funds back. What can you do? And, and there's not a lot of things you can do. Uh, and the last one is gasless transactions. So we have a meta transaction relayer that basically allows us to pay for gas on behalf of the users, which means that their first on-chain transaction will be completely free. They don't have to onboard funds. They don't have to kind of like figure out on ramps And of course, if this all goes well, we see a much higher activation rate. Besides those three features, um, FastDot is also free to use, and it's open source, which is always uh, pretty nice. This is what the experience looks like for, for the user. Three easy steps. We first, and you can try it today on near.org. You create your account with just an email, you verify your account, and then we ask you to create a passkey. So the next time you log in, you don't even need a password or an email verification. You can just uh, scan your face, your fingertip, and, and you're, you're into the app. Um, so those are the three kind of like easy steps of FastDot. Again, much higher conversion rates we've seen since we made this change on year.org. Now, because we're abstracting a lot of complexity away uh, for new users, and of course, that comes with some trade-offs in terms of control, uh, we need to think deeply on who are we designing for and which type of users we are not prioritizing. And this is kind of like intentional, and you always have to prioritize groups of users. So for FastDot specifically, the experience that I showed before, we're thinking about users that are new to Web3. Most of them, of course, or all of them are coming from Web2. Uh, they're also new users, so they don't have a wallet. If they already have a wallet, they'll be able to use it, of course. Uh, and they're mobile first, because as we know, most, most of the web traffic today is mobile. We're not prioritizing for this specific product Web3 power users. So all of you developers that have kind of like advanced use cases for wallets, uh, and also users that are using hardware, hardware wallets, because again, that's the gold standard for self-custody, uh, and if you have a certain amount of funds, or if you feel uh, really nervous about kind of like your, your, where your assets are, hardware wallets are still the best solution, but they're not for everyone. Um, I also want to talk a, a little bit about what we're working on right now. So we're working on a multi-chain version of FastDot. So currently, FastDot only works for apps transacting on Near, but you probably heard Ilya yesterday talk about account aggregation. So with FastDot, we allow a user with one single account to control multiple addresses, multiple wallets, and multiple chains. Uh, you just have to log in once, and you can kind of like own and manage assets on all the chains that are compatible. And your FastDot account is still recover recoverable with just an email. So you don't lose access to any of those addresses in multiple uh, chains. And we're also going to allow gasless transactions through something we call multi-chain relayers. So basically, we're going to have relayers on every single chain that we support. We're starting with EVM chains. Uh, and then users can submit transactions without paying for gas, just like they do today with uh, regular FastDot. The last one is the ability to offer restricted and trial accounts. So this is pretty handy if you're offering accounts for new users that can easily get into trouble. They can go to a website that is malicious. They can sign all their assets away. And so you're able to restrict certain transactions, like transfer the entire balance uh, and, and kind of like keep users out of trouble so they have a, a good, successful uh, first experience in Web3. Um, if you're interested in multi-chain fast start, I, th uh, I recommend that you check out David's talk. David is our engineering manager for fast start. He's going to be on this stage at 3 p.m. today. 
and he's going to talk a little bit about how multi-chain signatures work and kind of like how multi-chain fast stops works and what kind of chains we're, we aim to support and functionality as well. Now, the last thing I want to leave you with is how to get started. The SDK for FastDot is available today. It only works on, on year for now, but we have a testnet release for multi-chain FastDot planned for later this month. Uh, so definitely stay tuned. If you scan this QR code, you can go directly to the docs that have like a step-by-step -step guide on how to integrate it. Uh, and yeah, if you have any questions, feel also free to reach out uh, to me uh, after. And, and now I think we still have time for some questions. Uh, so yeah, feel free to, to ask any questions. I don't know if there's a microphone, go ahead. Yeah, so today we, we only support Nier. Multi-chain fast dot, we're prioritizing EVMs. So we got, we'll have a long list of EVMs that we support for, for the test and release, yeah. So the recovery is just with an email. So you get a link on your email, and then you recover access to your account. So we just check the email. Good question. So if you lost your device, most of the wallets as a service solutions today, you also lose kind of like the share of the key that is stored on device. In our case, you can always recover with an email. So if you lost your device, if you have access to your email, you can still recover access to your account. So you just we just send you a link of confirmation, and then you get access, you create a new pass key, and it's kind of like available on your device. So you talk about near wallets? Yeah, near wallet. So we, what we basically did with near wallet, we would send you an email that had kind of like your seed phrase. So whenever you wanted to recover, you would have to find that email, click on a link, and, and again, if you deleted that email, the specific email with your seed phrase, you would lose access. With FastDot, is different because we never send you the seed phrase for your email. We just recover through a decentralized MPC recovery service. And so you don't need to look for the original email, or it's also not very secure to have your seed phrase in, in an email in plain text. Uh, so it's different because we can recover through the MPC service instead of kind of like encoding in, in the email itself. Yeah, go ahead. Not today, but yeah, we're working on that functionality. So you'll be able to kind of like confirm your old email and then change to a new one. Uh, can, you, can you talk a little bit about, ab more about the use case? So you, once you log in, especially on near.org, you can select if you log in with FastDot or with a wallet. So FastDot kind of like acts as a wallet, so you can still log in with a Meteor wallet if, you, if you'd like. Got it. So, so that's also a feature we're working on, which is kind of like a way to export a FastDot account into uh, kind of like a regular self-custody. So if you want, you can like graduate from a FastDot account to, to a wallet. Uh, and we're, walk, we're working on a feature where you basically add a new uh, full access key, uh, and then you just, you're just able to transact with your regular self-custody wallet and also FastDot at the same time. Any other question? If not. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dio. Uh, yeah, I mean, in all the work we're doing, uh, you know, focused around mass adoption, it's certainly important to make that initial onboarding experience as familiar and easy as possible. Um, so check it out. If you haven't already, just go to near.org and you can uh, see how fast auth works in person. Before our next uh, um, talk, I just wanted to let you all know, I mean, if it's getting a little bit loud, we do have the uh, headphones you can put on so you can hear without uh, any outside noise. Um, but next up, I'd love to uh, welcome to the stage uh, Charles Garrett and Gautam Ravi, both of Pagoda, who are going to be talking to us about building a thriving Web3 developer network on near.org. So let's give a round of applause for them, everybody.
All right. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Gotham, uh, and I'm a product manager at Pagoda. And uh, this is Charles, also an engineering manager at Pagoda. And we're here today to talk to you about building a thriving network for Web3 developers on Near.org. Um, so I want to start off by talking about the origins of the Near.org gateway and kind of give you some context. So Near.org um, was introduced as one of the first uh, boss gateways um, back in uh, April of 2023 at the Consensus Conference. And it was launched to showcase a lot of the different functionality of boss and provide an example of a fully functioning decentralized application that had a really robust user experience. Like I said, Near.org was built on the boss stack. So a lot of the features that you s see in the experience were powered by different layers of the boss. Um, so starting from a user onboarding to um, Near.org, they could use FastAuth like Dio just walk through a very seamless onboarding experience to create an account. They had the ability to um, use search and discovery functionality to look for any entities built on boss, whether they're components, applications, posts, or even profiles. Uh, developers had the ability to uh, look at source code, fork any components that exist on Near.org and publish them in their own applications and components and use the gateway as a method for distribution. Um, and kind of under, underneath all of this, we had uh, social functionalities that were integrated in all aspects of the experience. So any developer could create a profile, um, make posts, follow people, build their network within the ecosystem. Um, and this is all powered by the protocol at the foundation. So seven months later, um, we've had a lot of usage of the gateway. Uh, I wanted to kind of paint a picture of uh, how is Near.org being used today, who is it being used by, and what are the different use cases that have popped up. So starting first and foremost, the bread and butter of the applications built on BOSS are decentralized components. We have over 12,000 components that have been built, uh, published on BOSS, um, and that are viewable by you know, anyone that uses Near.org today. The gateway is also a very key channel in the ecosystem for publishing and distributing applications. So we have over 250 different applications that have been published on Near.org um, that range from different functionalities like ecosystem apps, like DevHub and Horizons, um, DeFi apps, social apps, consumer apps. And so all these are examples of fully functioning decentralized apps that are being published and distributed to the thousands of users that are already on the gateway. And finally, I think the people matter the most. Um, we have over 250 monthly active devs that are publishing components and applications, as well as over 31,000 accounts that have been created on the gateway today. So we have all these people. We have all these components that are being published. Um, who is using the gateway today, though? Like, what are the different audiences, and then how are they using it? So we've uh, really discovered three different audiences that have been using um, Near.org over the past seven months. Uh, the first, as I mentioned, is kind of like our core audience, which is developers. Um, developers really use this as a, as a specific resource to guide in their development of BOSS applications, giving them an easy ability to discover anything that's built on the BOSS, um, providing them with examples of how it's been built, and giving them the chance to distribute it to the entire ecosystem. We also have ecosystem organizations and DAOs that are part of Near that are using Near.org to um, mostly from like a social aspect of things to build a community and connect um, and talk to different people in the ecosystem, as well as general ecosystem contributors, which make up a majority of that 31,000 um, number that I, that I mentioned before. Um, so a lot of these uh, folks are using a lot of the social functionality that exists on the gateway today as well to build their network um, and, and meet more people in the ecosystem. So over the past seven months, there's really been two different use cases that have popped up on the gateway. The first is that Near.org functions as a specific developer resource. Um, like I mentioned, there's a lot of different functionality on the gateway where developers can really you know, sink their teeth in and understand how the boss works. And so some of these examples are component and application search and discovery. Um, we also have a lightweight sandbox where developers can tinker with code and, and view how some things are built and get an understanding of, of how a specific component or application was built on BOSS. Uh, they also have the ability to fork, publish, distribute any components and applications. And since Near.org is kind of a central gateway for the entire ecosystem, it's also an important way to, to kind of wayfind and point developers to the right resources. 
On the flip side, near.org also serves as a, a social gateway for the ecosystem. So we have social profiles, we have posts and generated, user generated content. We have a global activity feed. Um, and anything related to a social network is, is kind of on near.org today. So when you look at the gateway, when you log in as a new user, you're kind of confused as to what the specific experience is. Is it a developer resource? Is it a social network? Um, and that's something that we've been kind of wrestling with over the past months too, trying to figure out what is the, you know, the right approach for this experience, given it's a central gateway for the entire ecosystem. So what's next? We want to double down on supporting our developer audience. We believe that developers are, are you know, the key to success for the near ecosystem, um, and we really want to build a product that caters to this audience. There's a lot of different pain points that you know, we've observed developers face when, when building on near as a new developer or even a, an existing developer. Um, navigating an entire decentralized ecosystem is difficult, and sometimes the resources and tutorials are distributed across different channels. Um, another thing that we've, we've understood is that differentiating between the quality of components and applications on our gateway is not the most intuitive process. Um, and the ability for developers to build reputation in like a, sp a specific place where everyone can view and understand you know, their role in the ecosystem is also not that intuitive. And a new developer coming into Nier will definitely have a lot of different questions when thinking about whether Nier should be the platform they, they need to build on. Um, what is possible on Nier? What has been built and what should I build? What resources and tutorials are available that will help me guide, uh, guide me in my development process? And are they robust enough to support me? And then underlying, uh, like underlying, is, is there a strong community that's, that's also existing to support me? So all these questions are things that a, a new developer would be considering when thinking about joining a new developer platform and ecosystem like Boss. So all, those, all that being said, we wanted to introduce today the near.org developer network. So we're going to be taking near.org a step forward, pivoting a little bit from our approach of this kind of pseudo social network, pseudo developer resource, and going all in on, on developers. And so there's three specific pillars of this experience that I'm going to highlight in the following slides, which are learning and building, discovery, and community. So this is kind of like a mission that we, we me and Charles put together about what we think or vision, sorry, that of what we think the developer network is going to be. So near.org will cultivate a developer's growth in their journey towards building high-quality applications, growing the economic potential of those apps, and moving along the pathway to becoming open web advocates, experts, and even founders. And as Ilya mentioned yesterday in his talk, founders are like the, really the key to success for how to build quality applications on Boss and the open web stack. So I want to dive a little bit into the three pillars, and then I'll pass it on to Charles. Uh, the first is learning and building. So this is really the bread and butter of the experience, what we want to be most focused on, which is providing developers with access to high quality resources and tools that will enable them to p build powerful applications. Um, I'm not going to go over all of these features, but one of the ones I wanted to highlight is that we want to provide robust documentation and tutorials that are really available um, on near.org in a structured way that not only cover front-end development of decentralized components, but sort of every, every layer of the boss stack. How can a developer use each layer to build a robust application? Another pillar is discovery. So something that I mentioned before, but really how do we help developers gain inspiration, investigate, and understand what's possible to be built on the blockchain operating system? Um, and so this really comes down to application discovery. How do we make sure that anyone can build an app, distribute it, and also help um, showcase that app on our gateway in a way that um, you know can differentiate between the quality of apps. So what's an app that's actually like a robust, a, a well-built experience versus one that's maybe not? Um, and so um, one of the PMs on our team, Tiffany, is doing a lot of work to um, you know build this experience out. And you actually can see a more robust DAP library that's recently been launched on our gateway. And then the final pillar is community. Um, this is one of the you know the underlying things that al always should exist in a developer's experience. Um, and so we're going to take the social aspects of the gateway today and transform those into social functionality that really caters to a developer's workflow. Um, and so one of the ideas that we're thinking about, you know, diving deep, deeper on um, in our roadmap is, is building out a groups functionality that allows developers to create smaller, more niche communities on the gateway, um, as opposed to having to interact with, you know, a global activity feed or, or like a large social network. So those are the three pillars. I'm going to pass it on to Charles to talk more about 
specific experiences. Thanks. Yeah. So why use near.org? Why be a part of the developer network? It's because near.org features the end-to-end -end tech stack of open source, common good features that form the fastest Web3 development platform for building Web3 experiences, distributing them, and getting feedback from users and developers. It's an entry point into the open web ecosystem for new and experienced developers alike. And since people learn in different ways, whether you're more of a visual learner that likes to learn from being hands-on, building experiences and getting feedback immediately, or if you're more theoretical and you prefer documentation and interactive documentation, um, we've updated this to, pr to provide wayfinding that really meets your needs where you are in your development journey uh, and, and to meet your, your learning preferences. We're making these changes, such as improved navigation, because of the feedback that we've received from our community members. You are telling us what you need for an improved experience on, on near.org uh, and to enhance your ability to be most productive. Near.org is where to go for guidance on how to use any layer of our Web3 tech stack, from RPCs and validators, nodes, to streaming data and decentralized UIs. The projects and founders that are building on the blockchain operating system continuously prove that this is the fastest Web3 development platform. You can instantly fork and customize from thousands of UI and data streaming components with built-in social and content moderation features and discoverability that works across boss gateways. You can also start small and only adopt the pieces that bring the Web3 functionality that meets your needs. You can choose from existing apps, spin up a GraphQL API, and subscribe to the on-chain transactions that interest you. Um, you can also use our De decentralized interface guidelines component library or any of the community-generated component libraries to quickly piece together a UI that meets your needs that's always accessible and available online. No matter which part of our open web tech stack that you use, know that you're supported by our motivations to nourish the ecosystem, to provide excellent resources, to incentivize additional providers to offer similar services that decentralize our offerings, and to provide thoughtful designs to offer the best experiences for developers and users alike. At a recent front-end development conference at CSS Camp, uh, I really like how Cassie of Cassie.codes explained this. She gave a great presentation on SVG programming and went into the depths of how programming in SVG is similar to programming in the document model of HTML. And she described it as front-end fills to be ever-expanding, shifting further and further into the realms of computer science. And you know, front-end frameworks are becoming increasingly depth. They can increasingly require a breadth of knowledge that feels more and more like full-stack development, meaning you've got to summit a huge learning curve before you can get some UI and get some feedback and see some changes that you want to affect with minimal effort. Decentralized UIs, we're aiming to change this. Decentralized UIs on NIR's blockchain operating system makes this more simplified. We provide rich UX capabilities with composability and one-click deployment to community-managed infrastructure. And you still have the option to learn as much as you want and go where your interest takes you, from staying on the front of front-end development to the middleware and data layers to the back-end supporting blockchain infrastructure. And what smart contracts did to web services, we want to do to front ends, making them autonomous, composable, always accessible, and cryptographically secure. This ensures that you know who generated the content that you're looking, looking at. There's provenance. You can trace back all the UI and data components. You can see how they're being used and accessed by the community and determine what, may, what works best for you. Um, let's see how easy it is to find a component that we want to use. So I can go to our DAPS application library, and let's say I want to build a component that shows the history of widgets, and I want to sh quickly revert code. I can go to develop, or I can go to search, and search for history. Boson.near's widget history component looks interesting. So I can open that and preview it. This looks to give me most of the functionality I want, different commit versions. I can further inspect to look at the code, check out the source, look at the statistics to see how often this component is being referenced, how often it's updated, look at its dependencies, get an idea of the code that's being used, and say, yes, I want to use this. Let me fork this component, start to customize it, 
check out the preview, build upon that. That looks good. I can save that online. And now I have a complete component that works, and I can build my app on top of that. At Pagoda, we are stewards of public good services that form the stack of our open web platform, the blockchain operating system. All of us are designers, developers, engineers, and product strategists at Pagoda. These are our motivations. You know, we're here to provide these services. Here's another view of that tech stack that shows the, the services as opposed to the motivations. So at the foundation here, we have NEARS always available blockchain supporting multiple L1s, our data aggregation platform, RPCs, indexers, query APIs, and what we just learned yesterday about supporting data availability, easy user onboarding with account abstractions, fast auth SDKs, and meta transaction relayers that allow developers to pay for certain users' actions and further abstract away from the user that there's even a blockchain behind the experience that they're enjoying. And then there's discovery engagement on our near.org and near.social gateways where we have our application libraries, social feeds, content moderation, social DB, search, and web push notifications. And of course, there's these centralized UIs where you can reuse and customize from a variety of components and applications. So how can you get involved? Anything that you see, you can influence. It's all open source. You can own it, you can customize it, and you can change it. If you see something you don't like, you can improve it. You can affect that change with as much effort as you're willing to spend, from simply submitting a form to tell us what's wrong or what could be better, or opening a PR to submit the code, which I would love to see, <laughs> and affecting that change yourself. Um, you can also get involved by simply being a fly on the wall. Since we work in public, everything we do is on GitHub, from our roadmaps and planning, technical discussions. You can be a fly on the wall and see how we're working, learn from that, and even influence our future roadmap by getting involved with communities like DevHub uh, and joining our community town hall meetings. Thank you. Here's a, a couple ways that you can stay in touch with Gotham and I. Our near social addresses. And this QR code will take you to uh, the Pagoda platform page where you can see all of the, the formal announcements for everything we're releasing. Thank you. Thanks. Any questions? We have some, yeah, we have a couple minutes. Any questions? Yes. So, sorry, could you speak up? Uh, Yeah, that, that's a really good point. So the question was, how do we satisfy GDPR and, and you need to be able to delete content, support the user's ability to delete things? How does that work on blockchains when things are, are ever present? Um, so we really implement that at the gateway layer, where at the gateway, we are hiding content. So if someone, for example, a gateway user, we've had a few requests where people want to exercise their right for data deletion. And we delete that from the areas where we have the ability to. For example, any of the services where we're storing any auxiliary data related to the user, we can directly delete those. And then the, the components that you see that, that uh, implement our social feeds, on all of those you have the ability to report, hide content at different layers, similar to other social networks. So you can hide something from your own feed, which essentially stores, that, stores some information locally and ensures that you don't see that. And we also have the ability to hide accounts, block accounts, or block specific posts that will prevent them from being displayed on any gateway that is using that exact component. That doesn't remove them from the blockchain. We can't do that. But we can prevent the further distribution and make it harder to access the content. Anything else? Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Probably over. All right, thank you all for coming uh, coming up here and talking about that. Uh, we're going to enter a short break before our next panel. Uh, definitely make sure to check out some of the deep tech booths, grab some coffee, grab some drinks, uh, but stick around because uh, the next panel is definitely going to be one not to miss. So we'll see you all soon.
Hey, hey. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. I appreciate it. It's good to be here. Good to have you all here. I uh, hope you had a good break. Stretch your legs. Got some coffee. We have some more uh, great speeches and uh, panels lined up. Uh, so next up, we have Pagoda's Jacob Lindahl that's going to talk to us about uh, exploring elegant prototyping with near SDK contract tools. So let's give a round of applause for Jacob, everybody. Hey, everybody. How's it going? My name is Jacob, and we're going to be talking about elegant smart contracts. Going to get into a little bit of smart contract security, talk about a little bit of coding, uh, and then we have a product announcement, or maybe two, at the end. All right, so writing smart contracts is hard. You know, uh, we've been in the, this is the Hacker HQ. I'm sure we've all had uh, a taste of coding in our lives. And writing smart contracts is hard, because in order for a smart contract to be ready for production, it needs to be two things. It needs to be correct, and it needs to be secure. What does that mean? Correct. Well, it's pretty simple. It just means it does the thing. It does the thing correctly. It does the right thing. It works, right? That's what correct means. Well, that's how I'm going to use it in this presentation. And it also needs to be secure. Basically, that means our smart contract doesn't do the wrong things. So we want our smart contract to do the right thing and to not do the wrong things. Unfortunately, this is not, it's not really a balanced issue here. Because if we have a smart contract that is incorrect, but highly secure, we basically have a rock. And a rock is not very useful, but I guess it's secure, <laughs> right? Uh, but if we have a smart contract that is correct, but insecure, you can actually build an app around that, because it's functional. It works. You can build an app around that. You can build an ecosystem around that. People will see, oh, this application works and I might deposit money in it. I can, maybe it's a DeFi contract or a market maker or something, and I can deposit money into this smart contract, and it works. Unfortunately, if it's insecure, you end up with charts that look like this. This is uh, from Chainalysis. It's a graph of the total value that's been lost through crypto-related hacks over the past seven years, and we're not trending in the right direction. Last year, according to this particular analysis, uh, around $3.8 billion worth of value were lost in cryptocurrency-related hacks. And uh, that's not good. <laughs> so what could a potential solution to this problem look like? Well, one of the first things that might jump into your head is auditing. And that's a good thing. Auditing is great but auditing should not be the only security measure that you have in your, development, uh, in your development process. It's really great as a last step. It's that final third party check saying, yes, I'm signing off on this, this looks secure. But it shouldn't be the first step in your security process and it definitely shouldn't be the only step. Let's try and get into a security mindset here and have a little quiz. So we're going to do a little bit of audience interaction here. Um, I have two different code snippets that we're going to look at. They are derived from uh, either real life smart contracts that have been exploited or from audit reports that I have read. So these are, uh, they're not exactly real life snippets because they've been simplified down and they fit on a slide now. Uh, but these are actual real life vulnerabilities that existed at some point in the wild. So this is the first one. Imagine we have a smart contract that allows users to deposit the native token of our network, in this case near, to our smart contract. And then this function, the idea is it allows you to withdraw the number of tokens that you have deposited. So let's read through this line by line. First, we're going to grab the caller of the function, uh, call it sender ID. Then we're going to remove the entry from our balance record because we're withdrawing all of our near, all of our near tokens from the smart contract. And then we'll send the number of near tokens that we have in our balance record, in our balance sheet, to the caller of the function. Does anyone see what might be wrong with this particular function here? Raise a hand, call it out. David, in the back. <laughs> Yes. 
Yes, that is exactly right. We are deleting the record uh, in our balance table before we then try and read that record. And so, of course, this code never works properly because every single time we run this function, the balance record will not exist because we already deleted it. All right, uh, that was the first one, pretty easy. Here's our second one. It's a little bit longer, and it's fairly similar in intent to the, f to the first code snippet, except in this one, instead of the user depositing native near tokens, we are depositing fungible tokens that implement the NEP 141 contract standard. The idea here is, okay, maybe the user doesn't want to withdraw all of their tokens, they just want to withdraw some of them. That is intended, that's not a bug in this particular piece of code. Uh, they might want to just leave some of the tokens in the smart contract. So let's step through this line by line. Again, we get the caller, then we loop through all of the tokens we want to withdraw. We make sure that the balance record in our balance table uh, says that the caller of the function has enough tokens that they say they want to withdraw. Then we send them that number of tokens, and then finally we remove the record from the balance sheet. Does anyone see what might be wrong with this piece of code? Sorry, they're bringing you a mic. <laughs> uh, it could be uh, repeatedly to withdraw those uh, amount of money, right? You say a little louder? Uh, repeatedly to, to withdraw those money. Repeatedly withdraw? Yeah. Yep, that's exactly correct. If, if I specify that I want to withdraw, uh, say, say I have legitimately deposited 10 USDC or something into this contract, and I say, I want to withdraw my 10 USDC, but I specify USDC 30 times in my list of tokens here, I will be able to withdraw way more tokens than I am entitled to withdraw. All right, so hopefully that whet your appetite, got you into kind of this security mindset, and let's talk about some principles for smart contract design. Uh, and these are kind of principles for secure smart contract design. So we have four of them here, we'll go through them one at a time. Uh, yeah, there we go. First one is trustless. We talk a lot about trustlessness. I'm going to split this word in two. We'll say trustless. And the idea here is we have a lot of different entities that are talking to our smart contract, and we really don't want to trust them too much. Uh, I'm going to call out two specific areas that I see a lot of excessive trust uh, in different smart contracts that I've read, particularly in audit reports. Um, the first is don't trust user input. As we saw in that second example, that second code snippet, it's possible that unintentionally or maybe even maliciously, a user could provide a payload that causes our smart contract to work improperly. So make sure to validate that user input. The second thing is don't trust other smart contracts. In particular, this might crop up when you're interacting with, say, a token, uh, like a fungible token smart contract and you just assume, oh, this implements the NEP 141 standard, this implements the NEP 171 standard, and you just assume that it works properly. And a lot of times, that'll work just fine. It'll probably work just fine in your testing, but when you're out in the wild, there might be a smart contract that claims to implement NEP 141 correctly, but doesn't. Maybe it was an accidental bug, or they just slightly modified the contract, but still try to work with applications that support NEP 141, or maybe it's an actively malicious smart contract that claims to implement this standard, but doesn't actually. So the, those malicious smart contracts could potentially uh, take advantage of that assumption, and that's a recipe for disaster. Our second, uh, our second item here is to make the invalid impossible. I'm trying to make these like really short and pithy statements. Uh, if you do a Google search for make invalid states unrepresentable, that'll bring up a whole bunch of articles about this very topic. But I chose this particular illustration because if you think of the data structures and the way that your smart contract handles data as like a mold, and then your data that you receive as input from other smart contracts, from your users, so on and so forth, as uh, something you're pouring into that mold, you want to design that mold in such a way that no matter what data comes in, if, if you can get it to fit into that mold, it's going to be valid data, right? You just want to be able to have this contract about the data that your smart contract is dealing with, where you know if it fits in this data type, if it fits in this struct I've designed, this enum I've designed, so on and so forth, 
then it will be valid data. And as much as possible, we want to operate with these really strong guarantees about our data. So make invalid states unrepresentable. Design your data structures in a way to avoid supporting invalid contents. Next, we have one truth. Have one source of truth for the data in your smart contract. If you have multiple different places where you're storing the same data, that can cause some synchronicity issues. And I chose this uh, illustration of a funnel here to kind of uh, illustrate the idea that if you have one source of truth for your data, you can also really tightly control how that data changes, right? There's only one way to access this data, and in order to access it, you have to go through all of these different checks, all of these different verifications, and those are always going to be in sync with each other because, well, there's only one thing to be in sync with. Finally, test for failure as well. Of course, we want our smart contracts to be correct. We want the happy path to work, and that's a really easy thing to test. What's not always as intuitive to test is failure. We want to make sure that, yes, our smart contract works where it's supposed to work, but we also want to make sure that it fails where it's supposed to fail. So, test for failure too. Finally, uh, doing all of that is hard. And it is. It's really hard. It is hard. It is hard. Um, so, luckily, we have a bunch of tools at our disposal to help with this. I'm going to particularly call out the programming language Rust. Huge fan, anyone who knows me. I really like programming in Rust, and luckily, Near Protocol is built in Rust and supports it as a first-class citizen for smart contract programming. So we have this really strong type system that comes with Rust, algebraic data types, fancy enums, fancy structs, and it makes it so that, oh, it's a little bit harder at, uh, at first, a little steeper, uh, steeper learning curve to get started with Rust, but once you get used to it, the Rust compiler actually becomes like a friend. It's helping you to code correctly. The second thing we have in Rust is powerful macros. If you're someone who might be coming from a little higher level programming background, something like JavaScript or Python, the idea of metaprogramming or macros might be new to you. A macro is basically just code that writes code. So metaprogramming because we're programming the programming language. This is an example of a macro invocation in Rust. Derive debug there, uh, kind of highlighted in that bluish green color and it expands to this big long thing and you'll see here it's it's actually taking into account the item that annotate that it was attached to that message struct so it prints out all the fields and it prints out the name of the struct so on and so forth so this is the idea of meta programming my team has taken all these ideas these security concepts and the powerful tools that rust avails to us and designed a new smart contract library called Near SDK Contract Tools that provides a bunch of one-liners implementing a bunch of different contract standards and not just the NEP standards but other tools as well so you can implement online multi-sig wallets, you can implement ownership, you can implement uh, role-based access control, uh, contract pausability, there's even a uh, more optimized account ID uh, utility in there as well, and a whole bunch of other stuff that hopefully you will find useful. The one-liners work just like this, so this is kind of your boilerplate that you'll see very often in a near protocol uh, smart contract that's built in Rust. In order to implement, say, a fungible token, then all you have to do is, well, import it from the library and then add one single line and you automatically implement three different contract standards. Luckily, the way this library is designed is you can choose the amount of magic that you want in your smart contract. So here, there's a lot of magic going on. Uh, you just have the one line, and it does a ton of stuff. But this smart contract library has layers of magic that you can decide to implement all of the different standards manually and connect them together by yourself or use a little bit of magic here and less magic elsewhere. It's very flexible, modular. It doesn't tie you into uh, just this ecosystem. It plays very nicely with the other smart contract libraries that are available for near protocol. And of course, if you want to extend the functionality of this library, there are hooks that make it really easy to say, make your fungible token pausable. And again, this is a, a high level of magic that you're seeing right here, but uh, you can kind of choose the amount of magic that you want in your smart contract. This is just the highest level for the most concise code. All right, so that was magic 
but I hear you, you're sitting there, you're saying, I don't want to have to learn a whole new smart contract library in order to, uh, you know, leverage these uh, primitives that are available in this smart contract library. I just want to get started, get off the ground running quickly. So my team has also designed another tool that is available on the boss. It is called the Contract Wizard. You can scan the QR code right there to access it or go to near.org and search for Contract Wizard. It'll pull up this user interface and you can right away just generate the code to get you started uh, writing a smart contract that implements all of these different standards and takes advantage of the power of the Rust programming language. And also this smart contract library was designed with all these security considerations in mind as we were writing the library. So that is all I have for you today. That's the same QR code that was on the previous slide. So scan it and start writing your smart contracts on Near in Rust. Thank you very much. All right, it looks like we have a little bit of time for questions. So I would love to take questions from the audience if you have uh, anything that you would like me to uh, detail a little more. Yes. Sorry, they're, they're bringing you a mic. <laughs> uh, will it uh, enlarge my WASM file? Because I, my WASM file is really big now. Your WASM file is really large? Yeah, really large. So you want to optimize it? Yeah, so if I use your, your tools, it, it will be a larger? Oh, it will not be larger because this uh, smart contract uh, library is composed mostly of macros. You will only oh. generate extra code when you actually invoke the macros. So just by including the library, your smart contract won't be any bigger. Okay, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Any other questions? What, what's the next step? What's the next step for near SDK contract tools? Well, um, one of the things that we're really excited about for, oh, does this back button work? I don't think, oh, there it goes. Now, now it just went really far back. Okay, so um, some of the things that we are working on for near SDK contract tools is, well, more standards like the multi-token multi standard that's uh, next up, as well as uh, for the contract wizard. We have some really high hopes for this because this is really, really just the start of uh, the contract wizard with the relayers and the um, other fun stuff that has been announced at NearCon. We are hoping to make it so that you can not only generate the code, but also generate the WASM blob and even deploy the smart contract that you generated directly from the boss. So those are some things that we are looking forward to in the future. We have another question over here. Hi. Will you do the same thing for the soulbound token? Because it was pretty uh, successful with the NDC election. And yeah, I, I think reputation will be something on near. And uh, yeah, I would be very glad to see that for soulbound token. A soulbound token, so like the idea of an NFT that's non-transferable? Correct. Right. So um, we have the non-fungible token standards, NEP171, and we have the macros that implement that all for you. And if you recall here, we have different hooks here. Now, you don't, you're not restricted to using just, say, the pausable hook. You can also write your own hook for different uh, life cycle methods of the different standards. So, for example, there exists a transfer hook for NEP171. And you can implement something in there that will make it impossible, you know, uh, say, error out, panic every time a transfer is attempted. So you could make a token that implements the NEP171 standard, but disables transfers quite easily. Mm -hmm. Are there any plans to add uh, async Rust when calling other contracts <laughs> inside of the uh, contract library? So, <laughs> uh, there is... I've been discussing uh, some very 
primitive plans uh, with some of my coworkers. We've been talking about uh, thinking about adding some async Rust features, maybe in this library, maybe in a different library. It hasn't really been decided yet, uh, but in particular, uh, some async Rust features might be coming. Uh, I might have uh, taken a chunk of time directly after NearCon <laughs> in which I'm going to attempt to implement that, uh, but that's not necessarily a guarantee at this point in time. <laughs> Definitely of interest, though. <laughs> Thank you for the question. All right, and it looks like that is our time right there. So thank you, everybody, for attending. And uh, use near SDK contract tools. Awesome stuff, Jacob. Super important, and you know we definitely appreciate all of you uh, geniuses that are working tirelessly towards, you know, trying to build the cures for this cancer of Web three. Uh, for this next uh, panel, we're going to pivot a little bit more towards community, particularly on a regional level. However, uh, we are just going to pause a little bit um, because we're just waiting uh, one minute for one of the uh, panelists to get up here. So sit tight, and uh, I'll introduce them in just a minute or two. All right, thank you for your patience, everybody. We're back, we're here, uh, we have everybody. So look, there are a lot of amazing people in the NEAR ecosystem. I've had the pleasure of working with some awesome people over the years, but this next lineup uh, that we have coming up are some of the most amazing people that I've had the pleasure of working with. They've been around for a while, contributing immensely to the NEAR ecosystem. I wish I could share the stage with them today, but the honor today goes to NEAR Foundation's Riley Leva, uh, they're going to be talking about Web3 Frontiers, Insights from Global Near Regional Hubs. Let's give a huge round of applause, everybody. Ah, David, here. <laughs> uh, so we are in the line, I guess. So hi everybody, I'm really happy to see you all here. I hope you've had like a wonderful conference so far and I'm really happy that you're actually tuning in for this topic because it's very close to my heart because we're going to be discussing regional development and we have this amazing lineup of speakers here that have been happy to collaborate for the past couple of months, just getting to know them and it's been an amazing journey so far. So we're going to kick things off with Vietnam and uh, you know, we've been seeing Vietnam thriving for, for a long time now. And actually, you just, in a, a month back, put together an amazing conference called Near APAC, which is pretty much, you know, showing the way for NearCon as well. So maybe you can tell me a little bit more about, like, how the event went and uh, what kind of impact did it had on the local community as well? Yeah, for sure. I think uh, leading up to the event, our team had to spend up to, like, six to eight months of preparation. We had a wide variety of different audiences, so planning all the activities and coming up with a good communication strategy was a big part of it. And so we had to de-research our audiences, find out guest speakers, work with a few strategic partners, and ultimately distributing all of that was quite a lot of work, but I think ultimately at the end of the day, the results kind of speak for itself. And as you mentioned, we had up to 20 people that showed up across both day, 25,000 registration. I think for the hackathon that was a part of that as well, we had over 200 projects. So the sheer number really shows the amount of in kind of enthusiasm or interest that Vietnamese people really have for blockchain technology, and more specifically for NIR. And through the event, I think, has really cemented NIR as one of the more promising layer one blockchain for a lot of people to really discover. I don't think this is limited to just developers, but also from a lot of our partners, uh, traditional Web2 businesses, as well as university. So leading up to the event, we also run quite a few programs at universities, uh, little mini hackathons to kind of get the student engaged. And uh, yeah, I think at the end of the day, a uh, huge part to the team uh, was a big first major event that we hosted. So a lot of lessons that we learned, but hopefully we're gonna see something even more spectacular in the following years. Yeah. So are you planning to actually have the event next year as well? Is it oh like yeah, that? We're, we're, we're hoping, yeah, we're, we're planning right now on some things that we knew. I think I had a talk with uh, Cameron 
uh, about a week ago on some of the ideas that we can run for that as well. So yeah, very exciting. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. Very happy to hear that. So maybe we can jump uh, ahead with Cameron. Through, you know, near OG, been running strategic initiatives for near foundation, now part of the NDC, and also leading our hub in the USA. So maybe you can share a little bit more about how things are going in the USA. Are you seeing any specific like emerging trends and how are we actually doing things in US right now? Totally. Um, it's not a surprise to a lot of people here, but crypto is kind of hard in the US right now. Um, the regulation is you know, really limiting a lot of potential innovation, um, but that does not mean people don't want access to their money, data, and governance. And so I think it's really just about kind of shifting this narrative a little bit, and I'm really happy to see kind of near refocusing on the open web because um, this is ultimately why I'm here and why I think a lot of people in the United States would also be interested. Um, AI is sort of taking over as well, and so this sort of refocus to AI after you know Nier's origins, uh, starting as an AI company, is super helpful. Um, so, you know, just as a as a as a metric, I do throw around every once in a while. We sponsored a hackathon at Stanford not that long ago, and there was over 280 projects that submitted. About six of them were building in blockchain. That's not very many, and so they're all building AI projects. So I'm very interested in seeing how we can help bridge this divide. And uh, especially as more concern happens in AI, like there was an executive order recently uh, by the President Biden to uh, limit, I guess, the amount of uh, like compute a, like certain large language models can have. And so there's a lot of hysteria kind of coming. And so I think that this is a potentially great opportunity to actually push the narrative of the open web rather than focus on the speculative nature of crypto. Um, so we're getting there. I'm optimistic. That's really cool. And actually, you just had an event related to AI yesterday. How did that went? That was great. Um, really just trying to get all the AI builders that are focused on Nier together. Um, you know, there's not a huge moat in AI right now. Uh, it's primarily like compute, data, or like you need hardcore researchers on your team to build new models. And so uh, really what we're seeing is a lot of like chat GPT wrappers or just some sort of like applications using them. So I'm really excited to see more cutting edge research around uh, building smaller models that can you know, do inference on chain. Mm -hmm. uh, again, this is like very new and we're gonna probably need a lot of research and money to go <laughs> into this effort, uh, but there is a lot of interest. So, um, and ultimately it's like, there's all this Hollywood hysteria and stuff about Terminator and you know, people are scared about AI. So I actually think crypto can be seen or blockchains or the open web better yet as a solution for people to sort of own their digital selves. And Americans are very interested in that. That's really cool. I'm really looking forward to seeing more things happening there with that topic. But yeah, jumping into Korea. Hi, Scott. Hi. It's great having you here. And actually, our journey with Near Korea started like a year ago in November. So I think congratulations are in order. Thank you. Thank you. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about how things are going in Korea. I know that there's a lot of gaming related activities happening, but what are your like main learning from the past year, for example, yeah, main highlights? Right, yeah. Uh, first of all, um, I'm really glad to be uh, part of the NIR uh, ecosystem. And last year in NIRCON 2022, we are not near Korea. So, so it's been a year now, and we are very hev heavily focusing on the gaming, uh, bringing a lot of good IPs onto NIR. Uh, we partner with you know Netmarble, uh, Marplex, and uh, Kakao Games. We made some of the major referee gaming companies in Korea. So interestingly, uh, Korea, uh, not only the gaming companies, but entertainment companies, uh, any enterprises, you know, big conglomerates, they are all very interested in you know Web3. And I think they uh, are believing that you know uh, near is where uh, AI and blockchain kind of intersects. So we are getting a lot of inbound calls. And that's why we kind of brought, uh, invited SK Telecom uh, to be here and uh, uh, re uh, uh, having a keynote. Um, she just did that. And then um, I, uh, we are also very focused on uh, bringing uh, and building a builder's community, developer's community. Uh, Rust language is not necessarily the uh, formula language for Korean developers, but you know, we're trying to uh, 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 bring a lot of young talent, you know, college and universities um, developers uh, onto near. And for example, we throw out a, a glitch hackathon. It's, it's a multi-chain hackathon. So we had an Avalanche, Polygon, BNB chain. Um, um, who else? I forgot, but we won the uh, hackathon. The near team uh, won the hackathon, so it was very meaningful. And um, we, we are continuing to uh, do a lot of hackathons and side, side events. So um, uh, 
yeah, I think Korea, uh, and they're opening up uh, STO. The Korean government is opening up security token offering, and they are coming with a guideline. So I'm, I'm very bold on uh, real world assets tokenization. I think it's coming uh, very soon from Korea. That's awesome to hear. And so, Aida, you've been with Nier for more almost two years now, right? Almost. And you know, if you we counted, like in the normal years, it might be like ten. It feels like ten. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh. That's fair point. But you've been actually leading near, you know, uh, near in seven different countries. So what's that like? Do you actually have like different strategies for all of these different countries, or what's the approach there? Yeah, it's it's uh, very interesting because you have a uh, seven smaller countries and each one has its own culture uh, but it's also very similar in another way and like similarity in the languages um, geographically it's not so far away so for us it was um, at first uh, we needed to set up all of the operations on the terrain because a lot of it was about just like uh, making uh, all of them aware of what near actually is a lot of them knew about the other chains such as ethereum solana was active polygon was active but not a lot of them knew what near was when we were starting so we had a lot of catching up to do mm -hmm. uh, so obviously we decided to do a lot of the meetups being on the ground so we took some time to like logistically organize everything but like we combined that with uh, a lot of meetups, uh, we sponsored key conferences. We also did a lot of PR and marketing, uh, which was very important. Uh, we tapped into the enterprise partnerships. So like we did the, uh, partnerships with the entertainment companies. We did the partnerships with companies such as MasterCard. So we just wanted to make sure that uh, Web3 in general, but through near is present within the whole region. Uh, and I think a year and a half after, uh, I can like really say that when you say Web3, if people know what Web3 is, people also know what NIR is within the region. And I think this was really important because we see a lot of other chains coming into the region now. Um, South, like uh, uh, Eastern Europe has been um, very famous for its IT development in Web2. We have a couple of unicorns came out uh, out of the region recently, so uh, we are really working hard on enabling the new generation of developers and actually switching the existing one and the founders into the Web3. Uh, and hopefully, in I, my, my wish is in two to three years, potentially see like a huge, huge company coming out from the region into the Web3 space. And even bigger wish is that they built on here. So that's kind, of, that's kind of the goal that we are aiming towards. I think it's a really good dream to have. <laughs> But yeah, in terms of like different initiatives, understandably all countries are different and you have your own stories, your own backgrounds and so on and so forth. Maybe you, each of you could actually share like what have not gone right? What are the main learnings that you've actually gone through throughout the, throughout the journey here? Maybe Cameron, you can yeah, pick I us can up. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, we sometimes near ecosystem, uh, we may sometimes talk about things a little bit too early. Uh, boss was uh, I think a, a version of this um, super cool technology like composable modular react components decentralizing front ends being able to just like drag and drop a uniswap component that you know points to ethel one or you know quick swap to polygon zkvm and just embedding this in your site really cool but you know the messaging didn't always land really well with people because uh, people were confused about kind of what blockchains were to start. Uh, the second thing is like people don't really understand operating systems. And so when you throw it all together, uh, you really leave people confused. <laughs> and so it did take a little bit of you know, teaching about like you know, uh, building on this and actually getting people to see it themselves. So I'd say messaging can be improved, uh, but at the same time, the thing is there. Like we, it, it, is, it makes perfect sense to me that this is the right approach because what we can do is actually then go to any web developer boot camp in the world that teaches JavaScript and get them to build fully decentralized front ends. That's really cool. And so we haven't really cracked that nut totally yet because I think we still need to improve some of the developer docs and you know platform like development platforms and also just like the greater economy. So like if we, you know, I've said this analogy before <laughs> internally, but um, we need to make sure we're not filling a bucket with a hole at the bottom of it. If we're filling a bucket with a bunch of developers and founders, that there are very clear pathways to support them outside of, you know, just our core onboarding or like top of funnel programs. And so 
Um, I'm looking forward to see how these solutions can be built across all regional hubs, because at the end of the day, we're all doing the same exact thing, um, and also working together on the messaging and uh, translating educational content. So um, it's super early, like all of us started about in the last year or so, and so we're all sort of getting our operational you know, foundation set up and the distribution set up and between the different uh, hubs. We only run hubs in San Francisco and New York to start. Uh, we do plan to expand in 2024, which is really exciting. And it's going to be even better if we have messaging locked down and you know, other partners to scale with. So I'm optimistic, but these are the things that can be improved. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, to, to Cam's point, and I, I completely agree. Uh, I think one of the things uh, that we also saw maybe not working the best was the lack of communication within the ecosystem which in the end resulted uh, in being a lot of, like doing a lot of the double work. Like there is a lot of like double projects coming out of the ecosystem. Uh, and then you don't know like which one to push. Uh, are they competitors? Can they work together? So there is a lot of like uh, lack of the clarity on this part. I think uh, in the last couple of months, this started being more clear because we actually were like like the whole ecosystem was doing more uh, more on the mapping of the project, like who can do what, how. I think we still have some way to go, uh, but I but I do agree the the common the common experience that can be provided by everybody else uh, from the ecosystem outside and within the ecosystem uh, is definitely something that we can all work on, and, and the cultural aspect of it is something that will make a whole lot of the difference and. I'm really happy that we have events like NearCon, that we are coming together. Uh, and I think the hubs are playing a major role because we can bring the insights from the specific locations. Like it's one thing to research on the internet, it's the other thing to actually be present there, speak to the people, get the insights. So I think like when we are all communicating together, there's like so many ideas coming up and now it's on us to actually like put them into the specific action and make sure it goes on and hopefully like next year we have more colleagues from other hubs joining us as well. Absolutely, absolutely. I completely agree. And it's so cool to see all of you like coming together at the NearCon, sharing the ideas, the collaboration part and everything else. So I'm really looking forward to what the next year will actually, you know, bring in in, in, in terms of the collaboration. So Scott, David, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah, three things. I think uh, um, in terms of a BD, we are too shy, I think, at the beginning. Uh, I think we are too focused on the tech. And uh, I think we are just building infras, you know, from for almost two years. So I think at the end of the day, uh, we have to raise the brand awareness, and we have to, in order to play the playbook games, we have to be winning the top level accounts, like you know, uh, major corporations, any companies that you heard of, we should be winning that deals. And I think we should uh, put a better effort uh, to winning that deals. And and Korea is becoming a battleground for layer ones because. They are throwing money, you know, they're throwing grants and they want to build a bigger deal. So I'm not trying to say, you know, we should, you know, invest more, but uh, we, we should be smart, you know, uh, bringing these uh, corporations, you know, by uh, playing playbook games. And secondly, I thought we were doing uh, great communicating, communicating within the ecosystem. You know, we're doing roundtables, tunnels um, every week or, or uh, biweekly. But to be honest, I was just told that uh, Ilya is becoming the CEO during the <laughs> offsite, during the NearCon here this year. So I was arranging all the meetings with Chris Donovan, but I found out that he's a CEO now, so I had to change all the <laughs> schedules you know, at, at the NearCon. So uh, we should do, do a better job, you know, actually um, internally communicating to all the uh, partners, you know, regional hubs, any, you know, stakeholders uh, of the near ecosystem to be able to, you know, uh, make a strategy uh, uh, um, and then actually uh, tell your partners, look, like we are communicating very well. And thirdly, um, I, I totally agree with the camera on that. You know, a lot of people are getting confused with the BOS, BOS, whether it's a blockchain operating system. Is that for the device? Are you competing against iOS or Android? You know, um, but that's not it, right? So we, we need to be uh, able to do a better job, you know, sending out a message to the you know, general public that, look, it's a very easy to use uh, blockchain. Um, we don't even have to use a word blockchain. It's just uh, basically, um, they are one that anyone can use, easy onboarding, simple. Uh, I, I think at the end of the day, we are competing against Web2 companies and Web2 products. So uh, we need to be able to do a better job in terms of marketing. Yeah, and I think the only thing I want to add is mostly the biggest difference in sort of our operations in Vietnam that I want to kind of focus on was mostly before, most of what we do was mostly 
uh, through social media. And a lot of the content we share is just limited to just the posts or maybe some of the videos. So what we kind of lack was credibility. So in big shift in our direction sort of heading towards the beginning of this year was sort of partnering with more institutions, traditional institutions to get that kind of credibility for us to kind of push a lot of the message as well as a lot of things that Neo is trying to push. Particularly in Vietnam, I feel like um, probably you may have heard of uh, chain analysis report in 2022. Uh, being the number one in terms of crypto adoption. But in reality, when you look at that, the majority of the people that are adopting is from a speculative standpoint, and even still to this point right now. So we ask ourselves, what are we not doing right in terms of communicating really more on the technology aspect of uh, what Nier is bringing? And so, yeah, a big part of what we, we want to do uh, now is, is once again, uh, partnering up with traditional Web2, either I institutions or businesses in order to deliver the message, as well as bring a lot of global speakers. So near APEC was sort of like that event for us to, to bring that here to actually focus more on you know building things rather than speculative nature of it. Yeah. That's a very good point. And in terms of, you know, you all have this kind of very strong background and you know also how hard it might be to actually get started in Web3. What would be your like number one recommendation for a person now looking in and just wanting to get involved. How can you get involved in near ecosystem and what should be the first steps that you would recommend? So maybe Ida? It's just like uh, get ready to <laughs> push your head through the wall. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I mean, essentially like uh, Web3, we sometimes like make uh, sci science out of it. It's not a science, it's like every other emerging tech. It's just like the new one which time has arrived. So I would say like all of the people who like to explore new technologies, who like to explore like new frontiers, new opportunities in general. Um, why Nier is great and why I liked Nier when I, when I decided to join Nier is because it put a lot of a uh, accent on the user experience. And I believe like my background is in marketing and user experience and I think like with everything you do, with everything you offer, you need to think about the user first, not what you find good and cool and relevant or beneficial, it's what they would find. So I think, uh, and this is a lot, of, like it's also a lot of discussions we are having within the ecosystem, like how to bring the user experience up, how to think users first in the products we are building, uh, in the events we are organizing, all of this stuff. So I would say like whoever wants to join Web3, Near is the perfect starting point. Uh, we just need to communicate it better. And it's part of our user experience building as well. So we kind of are in the position where we can now start walking the talk even better. Uh, but all of the people we had the chance to get in contact with in the region, when they did start like doing something on year, building on year, like getting in contact with the new community, they really liked it. Yeah. So I think it's, it's, it's a nice way to, to onboard them into the yeah. ecosystem into the open web, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Anything you want to add, Cameron? Yeah, I mean, it just starts with, go back to this point, like, what are, you, what are you interested in? Like, I always start at, you know, there's so so many verticals. You can get into decentralized governance, NFTs, DeFi, ver verifiable privacy, distributed systems, like, it goes on and on. And so, uh, just meeting people where they are, and then sending them resources that kind of get them to go down that rabbit hole. And then if they're like totally new in Web3, I tell them to read white papers. I know it's like potentially boring, but <laughs> if you really want to get into it, um, that's the best way to, to really get involved is understand how this works. And then if they're trying to like work together, then I force them to teach because if they can't teach it, then I don't know if they actually know it. And so um, this is a forcing function for them to learn it, uh, generate some good content out of it, uh, and ultimately get them more comfortable just speaking about it because that's also what we need. We need more people that actually know what they're talking about um, because this industry already has such a bad reputation with frauds and scams, so we don't need more people on stage waving their hands telling you to buy this thing. We need people who actually understand like how these systems operate at a fundamental level. And so I'm optimizing for uh, quality over quantity, like 1,000%. If we wanted to you know, onboard all these people to Web3, we could just give them money. Um, I don't want to do that. I want people who are genuinely interested in the open web. So, uh, yeah, quality over quantity every day of the week. That's really beautiful. I think there's just one thing I'd like to add to that in terms of like the message and how we communicate it. 
is I think from my perspective, it would be great if we can do more a lot of like comparison to why we need a lot of the fundamental thing that's Web3 is kind of offering and then compare that to traditional Web2 and then put that comparison like really obvious right next to one another. And the reason why I want to point that out is because, well, at least coming from my perspective in Vietnam, seeing how a lot of how the contents are delivered from a variety of different sources, uh, just to give some context, most audiences within my region, language barrier is still kind of a big issue. So we kind of rely on a few sources for us to kind of learn more about the space. And just the way things are presented right now doesn't really communicate really how the values that Web3 bring is actually all that, you know, how does it actually impact the users? What value does it bring for the users? And I don't think people really see that in order to sort of appreciate that and discover more for themselves uh, to really get engaged into the field. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, Siska? yeah. Just to be um, quickly to add to that, um, I'm, I'm getting out of a lot of comments from all the all the companies, and especially the dev teams are saying that you know Neo has a great documentation, uh, such a great tooling. Um, all the SDKs are great. So, um, but at the end of the end, end of the day, they are making business decisions, and and, w and I need to be able to you know persuade them why Neo is better, not 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 only the text, but but also from the business standpoint. And um, I, I'm glad to see more consumer apps, you know, coming from Nier, such as, you know, Kai Kai and uh, Sweat. And uh, we need to be able to see more consumer apps dri driving, you know, this uh, mass adoption. And hopefully, um, I think gaming is one of the consumer apps as well. You know, uh, they're playing, you know, in their daily basis. So I'd like to see more and more uh, sort of uh, massive user-based apps on Nier. Uh, I think I, I we have the right platform to do that. So. Uh, I want to push more deals um, uh, to achieve the mass adoption. Yeah. Can I add one more thing to this Of course. Um, so we've tried going also a lot onto the non-Web3 conferences because this is, this is, these are the places where the new users are going to come from. And I think one of the very relevant things is to choose the right people to actually speak about Web3. Because what we've seen also so far, there is people who have been in Web3 for quite some time and the lingo that is being used, like the others are just staring and have no idea what we are talking about. So I think we all need to kind of, again, to the point of like know your audience, adjust the language to the audience. Uh, it, it's a very important first step in how they see Web3 in general and then how they see specifically for us near. So I think choosing the right people to represent near and Web3 and open web uh, is a very crucial part that maybe sometimes we don't look so much into. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a huge opportunity. Absolutely, and that's why we have such a smart people leading our regional hubs, right? <laughs> we we <Okay>. hope so. <laughs> yeah, I hope, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, do my best. But yeah, I think this is a beautiful, beautiful thought to actually end our panel here. So thank you everybody for joining us, and I hope you're gonna have a wonderful conference ahead. Thank you for, for your time. Thank you, Riley, for having us. <laughs>
Um, the first is having the opportunity to speak on the hacker stage. I want to focus on how um, a media outlet can help present both projects, founders, and developers um, in the in the near ecosystem, but just mm -hmm. in the open web in general. And the second thing is, I would like to offer a perspective on how NERIC has been able to use and leverage a lot of the products that are currently being built in the near ecosystem um, and find genuine use cases for them, right? I think that's always one of the critical things when um, we're building something and that is to see how can it be used and how can projects in, uh, in the ecosystem leverage the near tech stack to its fullest, fullest capabilities. And that's what I'm here to present. So let's see how this clicker works. Um, it is not working. There we go. OK, so what is NERIC? NERIC is a near-centered media outlet in the ecosystem. Um, we, both um, we both activate and present projects, but our core focus has been continually to support projects and founders within the ecosystem um, on a continual basis. So this is something that we have done with our newsletter, the core product, but that newsletter is attached to one of the most active DAOs in the near ecosystem as well. And so we have um, both a curation process, but also an aggregation process where we're able to successfully leverage the near tech stack to scale up our processes beyond what is possible. Um, because we're still a small team at, it, at our heart, but we're able to actually, in a transparent way, get community participation and have our newsletter be an aggregated version of um, collected data by the community. So community is the core focus I want to talk about. It's a buzzword in our ecosystem together um, with a few of them. But what does it mean in, um, in practice, right? So I want to focus on NERIC as a community platform and what we're able to do for developers within the ecosystem. Um, both projects and founders. I think there's two core focuses when we talk about impact, right? It is both on the ground impact that we've seen near leverage within regional hubs and so far, but it is also within like eat events, um, hackathons, and then there is the social media based impact. You'll see like our near social, um, our near social page in the background, and that leverages um, like both the newsletter, it leverages our Twitter profile. And then on the ground impact where we help cover like these uh, uh, dev related events. I think those are the two core avenues that measure community based impact when we talk about developers in the ecosystem. So here's our core product that we've had. It's the newsletter. Um, we've been sort of leveling up our tech stack, um, both with the help of um, artists within the ecosystem, but also AI. Um, since we're, it looks like NIR is going back to its AI-based roots. But what I want to focus on, um, the core product here, is actual genuine community engagement and representation. Right. I think it's something that NIR has fundamentally struggled with um, as a whole. We've often seen people complain that um, you know, this and that entity doesn't represent the NIR ecosystem, NIR doesn't have community or whatnot. Well, NIR Week is here to prove that wrong. Um, we have our newsletter that is aggregated via community input on the DAO. We are able to then, when we distribute that on a weekly basis, actually represent the core practices that are being held within the community, right? So there is a centralized project uh, process of curation, but that ensures quality is maintained. And it allows us to, for example, have you know, Lisbon featured on last week's newspaper, um, you know, the DAP library when Pagoda um, released its DAP library on the two weeks ago, um, three weeks ago, focused on like the fast op SDK that got announced. And this is how we're able to, via curation and community aggregation, we're able to actually re represent the near community in a very accurate manner. And I think this is something that has been hard to do. It's something why I'm very interested to be at the hacker stage as well, because it is um, both using and leveraging the near tech stack to talk about the near tech stack. And so even though I'm not a hacker at heart, it is something that is quite interesting to talk about and share our, our perspective at Near Week. So we are able to both house and merge talent within the ecosystem, such as our collaborations with the artist Lomakin, right? Um, together with like you know AI, 
with dev stuff, with dev related news, and be able to merge them all. And I think that is something that community at its core is, right? Yeah. It's not, you've often heard buzzwords such as NFT community or um, DeFi community that is just there for, you know, like a quick buck. But what is actual community representation? And I think it co covers multiple faceted processes, right? And it's um, an ability to merge that. I think it's an accurate picture of the NIR community, and that's what at NIR Week we aim to do at our core hearts. We're here to support your projects within the ecosystem, and we're here to <laughs> both um, educate people about the NIR ecosystem, and the true way to do that is to talk about the community at heart and have them actually help us enhance our own products on all levels in our tech stack. So. Next, I want to talk about Near Week as a media platform. I've talked about community impact, right? The community impacts both on the ground, um, via you know, helping us at EAT events, social impact via our newsletter. Next, I want to talk about how we're able to leverage um, the open web tech stack that Near has created to enhance our media output. So Near Week as a media platform, um, we we're in the process of launching our own BOS um, our homepage on the blockchain operating system. Um, this is quite often has been the case for numerous projects within the ecosystem. But what I think makes it special is that the boss allows us actually to leverage um, multiple parts in the Web3 based tech stack to enhance what is in essence a Web2 product, right? You think a media platform is like a Web2 native product, but we're able to actually identify core Web3 aspects that we're able to enhance our processes as a Web2 platform. And I think that's very interesting because it highlights the fact that um, potentially other media outlets out there can actually use Web3 fundamentally to enhance our core value. So what do I mean with that? Well, actually, let's see if I can go back one step. So you'll see multiple widgets here, like our newsletter widgets and whatnot. But what we would also have able to integrate here is, for example, our DAO widgets, right? So when I talked about community participation on the same page uh, in, our <coughs> in the Near Week tech stack, what I mean is the boss allows us actually to leverage Web3, Web3 native um, components, for example, um, to enhance our Web2 products, right? So um, content. This is sort of um, another side of Near Week and what we've done so far. Um, Quite often you'll see, um, you know, like news outlets like CoinDesk and Coin Telegraph and whatnot cover the near ecosystem around major announcements. Um, but these are quite often major announcements uh, in nature, right? So what we aim to do is we aim to both provide content that talks about the near tech stack as a whole, and um, this cov this means also, um, you know, initiatives that may be too small to fall under the radar of um, like a big media outlet like Coin Coindesk, but it also is like an archival nature, right? Um, we want to be the one place where people can both learn about the ecosystem, but also be redirected to places to learn. So for example, um, these are just three banners of like content we've written so far, but I think it gives a pretty good overview of how we're able to successfully represent the near ecosystem. Um, all the way in the back, we had a blog post that um, Near Intern wrote for us, cover, um, further delving it deeper into the blockchain operating system. And we're able to successfully show how, um, you know, shortly after the announcement, when not much was known about the, the bus, um, where we could sort of go from here with that. We have a Polygon ZKAVM one when the dashboard launched that we did in partnership together with um, Sun who you may have seen on Twitter, um, he does quite cool content. But um, that's a DeFi-based um, blog post, right? And there were not a lot of media uh, outlets that covered the, the Polygon ZKVM partnership. Then we have here, for example, the collab, it's kind of meta, right? But like the, the collab that Near Week did with Pagoda, where we have like our own widgets on the homepage. Um, but we've also been able to cover like other smaller updates, such as like the fast auth, the SDK, and whatnot. And um, being able to sort of delve into that as a media outlet, I think is quite valuable in nature. So I think that is high impact because we're very niche in that regard. So now I want to talk about how we're able to enhance that Web2 based process, right, via using the leveraging the open web stack, because that's what we're here um, to talk about and why I'm so happy to be able to talk on the hacker stage. So we've been able to. Um, 
Yeah, I think like we posted a blog post on Medium, right? And um, Ilya commented like, why is this not on the buff, right? And I'm like, oh, okay, like, cool. We're trying to talk about, <laughs> the <laughs> we're like, we're trying to educate people um, about what we're doing in the near ecosystem. But he did sort of have a point, right? And um, it made us think at near week. And so we made that a core part of our process. And together with Robert Yan, who, um, you know, he does quite a bit of development work at um, Pagoda, I think MetaWeb too. Um, he's been able to help us successfully migrate the blog post process to the buffs because I think something that, for example, like Ilya would say would be like, well, um, you can already put blog posts on the buffs, right? Um, we've seen like foundations put their blog posts on the buffs. But I think to successfully as a media publication utilize an editor and publish um, posts on the buffs, it needs to meet some requirements, right? Um, to give an example, we need to be able to edit the post after it's published. We need to have be able to have like our own control over like hyperlinks, over like graphic display, over infograph display. And these are fundamental processes that we're able to just identify as a web, like as a media platform, um, able to identify that we need to make an editor successful, right? Because we can't be talking about like, you know, let's say one mark NFT marketplace that then um, sort of abandons the ecosystem, right? If we have a blog post on that, we need to be able to update it and continually uh, maintain accuracy within the ecosystem. It needs to be usable, it needs to be functional, and it needs to look good. So where can we go from here? Well, by able to having, uh, by able to <laughs> for Near Week to have identified like the core processes that make a functional editor um, possible for blog posts. So these, are, uh, these blog posts are posted natively on the bus using the editor. Um, we actually would require some feedback, like um, we've been working on this together with Robert Jan, um, but soon we'll pro probably be able to publish the links and get some community feedback around this. It'd be very cool to see some other media outlets and projects within the ecosystem leverage the editor that we've scoped together um, to be able to put their own content natively on the bus. But where we're able to sort of go from here is now we've identified this core process, right? we can actually identify ways to scale it, scale it up quite effectively because we've identified a sort of um, product market fit, like a real genuine use case, right? Which is um, now we're able to have these blog posts that are not actually um, part of any centralized service, right? So they're not reliant on any centralized service and we're able to, in a composable way, if you saw the homepage in the beginning, right? The Near Week homepage on the bus, integrate them. So what do I mean with that? Well, you can imagine that now we're able to easily, now we have a native blog post on the bus, we're easily able to make that like an iframe component, right? And then have you, for example, click on a blog post um, on near.org or on another gateway, and without ever having to leave that, um, that gateway, able to browse native content. And that is just a better user experience, right? Than having to open like a separate medium tab be directed with like a sign up to Medium here, you know, closing all these notifications, um, signing away your data by, you know, accepting all these EU regulations. Um, we're able to do that. And that is a better open web based experience. And I think that's also what Ilya highlighted in his talk, right? Users, they don't care about is it on the bus. They care about does it offer a better open web based experience. And I think this does. But both from a user engagement side, but also from a builder side of a, um, people uh, sort of posting their native content on the bus. Because where we're able to go from here is sort of enhance this core product with an like RSS feed integration with Medium, for example, where on our side at Near Week, we can keep on posting like our native content on Medium um, just because it's like a seamless UX and then that gets automatically um, transposed to native content on the bus. So both from like a posting side as a publisher, a media outlet, um, we're able to enhance our own core processes. We're able to enhance user engagement um, by sort of having iframes in the composable nature of the bus. Uh, we're able to enhance that browsing experience. Um, and that is sort of how we're able to leverage the tech stack of Near while talking about the tech stack of Near. So um, I'm sort of reaching the end of my presentation. I was giving 15 minutes, but I just wanted to have the core highlights be community impact, right? And how Near Week as a media platform is able to actually find genuine use cases of a lot of the products that we're building here in the ecosystem um, while talking about this. 
So we've been able to work with some of our close partners, right? Like Pagoda, as you saw with the homepage widget, um, Near Foundation, who has been very kind to also help us like streamline a bit more of the announcements. Um, they've been a pleasure to work with. Proximity, when it comes to um, relating to like the DeFi content um, around the ecosystem, but also sort of helping like these projects that quite often uh, with DeFi we find come from external Web3 based ecosystems and help the help connect them within um, projects within the near ecosystem, right, to find their ground. And near DevHub, uh, which everyone here probably knows, right, um, they've been doing an incredible job. And uh, it's been a pleasure also to help um, work with them and sort of act as a media arm representing um, the developer community within the near ecosystem. So as a final call to action, it would be, um, I think in all our core processes where we talk about content on the bus, we talk about content on Near, it is both also leveraging the Near tech stack and I think our Shardog partnership um, that actually allows you to collect um, every weekly newsletter that we do as a NF time-based NFT is a core example of this. Um, so my last call to action would be to subscribe to the newsletter, but I would offer, um, I would go a bit more in depth here and say, how can we ever actually measure impact, right? I think impact has been a core focus uh, of where we're heading as the near ecosystem. And I've sort of shown where that could go with like the RSS feed integration of the medium content on the bus. But where could this simple collecting of an NFT go for actual impact, right? Well, this is just, um, you know, it's not work in progress at the moment. It's more just uh, a thought I'd like to end my presentation on. But it is, for example, a core thing we've seen the near ecosystem, I think, struggle with is how can we measure um, an actively engaged wallet or user within the ecosystem, right? How can we measure like proof of participation within the ecosystem? Um, there's a lot of like um, barriers within that, right? For example, um, do we measure transaction volume? Um, it's very easy to game. Do we measure the amount of near you hold or like the amount of funds you hold? Well, this is also skews the metric, right? Um, and I think also you don't want to give like early adopters the biggest benefit over this. But because we have like a time-based partnership that we do like with the Shardock tech stack where we have a different newsletter every week on a weekly basis that people claim every week as like a, you know, like a photo album, a snapshot representing the near ecosystem. Well, you can imagine a future where that could be um, one of the core metrics to provide proof of participation within the ecosystem, right? It's a very genuine use case because it's time-based um, and it doesn't require any funds from users. So this is like something that I've been thinking of personally. Um, I think it's a, one of the less controversial means to measure proof of participation. But it's something that we at NIR are very interested to explore. It's like how can we leverage the NIR tech stack and further it using our core processes. So the last call to action, like I said, would be subscribe to the newsletter. Um, reach out to us if you need any support for your products. Um, you can always submit news via DAO. You can always reach out to us if you need to connect with someone in the ecosystem. Um, if you n you're not sure where to go with the ecosystem, with your projects as a startup, um, we're always able to sort of help connect you. And um, so do reach out to us. And we're here as a community platform. But most importantly, we're here to represent what is actually the near community. And that's a multifaceted face. Um, but we're proud to you know, we're proud to represent that on a daily basis. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Johan. If you're not already, definitely give uh, Near Week a follow. They always uh, come out with amazing write-ups, amazing news, keeping the audience engaged. Uh, and they're doing a lot of really cool stuff on Boss, so definitely make sure you, uh, you give them a follow, check them out. Um, so, next up, uh, we are going to be hearing from Pavel Kudinov from the Pagoda team on utilizing near blockchain data for dApps and analytics. Can you hear me, guys? All right. Good, good to see you all. Thanks for coming. 
uh, <laughs> I'm uh, very excited to talk about uh, data. Um, I'm working at Pagoda. I'm the engineering manager at the data platform team, and we're looking after uh, different tools for analytics and uh, for developers to build uh, rich user interfaces. Um, I'm going to be talking about indexers today. Um, so there, are, there is a, a little bit of confusion when people talk about indexing. What, what, what is indexing? It's actually a lot of different things. Uh, so as you know, blockchain is a stream of transactions, actually a stream of blocks, and every block has a bunch of transactions. Uh, but it's very hard to fetch some uh, uh, transactions in the past or make some aggregate queries on these transactions. Uh, to make these queries, you actually need to do indexing. But the catch is uh, you need to do that differently depending on the use case you uh, are solving. And uh, I found through uh, almost two years working in the space that there are two major use cases uh, usually. Uh, and one is analytics. Uh, let's say you're a product manager or a blockchain analyst and uh, you want to see the behavior of users of certain uh, smart contracts or certain apps um, and you want to see this in time uh, and you maybe you want to find some insights. So this is what we call analytical use case. And the other use case is probably more important to uh, attract more, u more users is to build rich user interfaces. Um, and for that, you need a different type of indexer, which is uh, real time and which gives you uh, uh, all information needed to show on the user interface. So let's talk a little bit about analytics first. And uh, we recently released a public data set on Google Cloud. Uh, this is supported by Pagoda and uh, this is uh, updated near real time. And this is solving this analytical use case. Anybody can come in uh, and build SQL queries to get different insights. Uh, we store uh, and provide the full block uh, data, uh, all the transactional data, receipts, execution outcomes, uh, and even parse near social DB uh, data. So you can see all the content and query all the content gener generated on near.org and other gateways. Um, one of the s simplest uh, use cases is to actually understand the, uh, the number of users that interact with uh, your smart contracts, right? So uh, with this, this is a sample query that does that. I'll, I'll just quickly show you how you could use this query. Uh, so if you go to docs.near.org and search for BigQuery, you will see uh, a guide on how to use this. And here you can just click on the uh, view the public data set. This is my account on Google Cloud. Um, you click view data set. Uh, and you can just take this query that I had on the slide and I'll walk you through this quickly. Oh, sorry. Paste it here and execute. So uh, what it does is we're looking at all the receipt actions. So these are all the receipt actions. We are then joining these receipt actions with uh, the transaction that this receipt is originated from. And if you analyzed near blockchain data, you know how sometimes complex that is because receipts are executed in uh, different blocks. So when you're looking at receipt, you don't necessarily know which transaction it was originated from. So for that, we created this table receipt origin transaction. So we're joining on receipt ID. And then finally, we're joining this receipt, uh, th this, this data set with a transactions table and to get the, uh, by transaction hash, to get the signer. So this is what we're interested in, the signer who signed the original transaction that produced the receipt that interacted with in this case, it's token.sweat uh, contract. And I'm only interested in function calls, and I'm only interested in anything that happened uh, this month. And so as you can see, um, we have uh, roughly 80 to 100,000 different signers daily uh, signing transactions that interact with token.sweat contract. If you replace this with uh, any other contract that you uh, manage or contracts. You can use obviously things like like, uh, statements, etc. cetera. Um, you can uh, build different insights. Um, this is available 
uh, for anybody to use. Uh, it is not completely free. Uh, it is free from Pagoda side. We are not charging for this, but you're charging. Uh, the Google Cloud is charging for compute. Every time you run the query, you need to pay for the service on Google Cloud. You can copy this data daily to your data warehouse. You can take a portion of this data, and we have some uh, big companies already integrating it to their ETLs, ETL pipelines. Um, we are soon going to be adding more data to that, and we want to hear your feedback. Uh, what else do you want to see there? Uh, we're also looking at the patterns of uh, data usage. Uh, but the things that are coming are fungible tokens, NFTs, and all the different events. So basically, if you want to look at the events, parsed events for your smart contracts, uh, you'll just be able to make simple SQL queries um, directly on uh, BigQuery. All right, so let's talk about rich user interfaces. Um, basically, what is that? It's uh, allowing users to find the information on your apps, and I see designers smiling because designers always have a lot of things, a lot of ideas to, uh, uh, to show, to, to make uh, the, the use of interfaces uh, easier, right? But how to get the data there and how to get this data um, uh, in the right shape and form and also make it up to date, right? So that's the real question. Um, what are the common UI patterns that we have? So first of all, we want to show user-specific information. When we have a logged-in user, we want to show um, assets and information that they generated or that is relevant to them. Uh, we want to aggregate across multiple smart contracts. So for example, if you use a DeFi application, there might be multiple DeFi pools or lending pools, uh, and you want to aggregate across all these smart contracts. And as new smart contracts are deployed and created, you want to automatically track these smart contracts too. Uh, you want to aggregate over time. So for example, you want to show weekly information or uh, information for the past uh, few days uh, or monthly. Uh, and you might want to aggregate across users. So if, there are, uh, if a user has multiple accounts and they want to see information across all these accounts, you want to show this information together. You want to allow users to filter information. So let's say there is a history of transaction and they might want to filter by certain parameters. So filtering should be quick, which means you need indexes on these columns that you're uh, uh, indexing, uh, uh, filtering on. Uh, of course, you might want to implement pagination because there might be too much information and you want don't want to download all of it, which means you need efficient ordering. Um, and of course, you want this data to be near real time, which means that when your users make the transaction, uh, and your user, your user interface reads from, uh, from your database, you want it to be up to date, uh, ideally instantaneously, right? So how to achieve all of that? Well, actually you need a database for reads. Um, as you can see, we have a, a very happy user who uses near blockchain, uh, a dApp that is built on near blockchain. Um, it makes writes to near protocol directly, which means sending transactions, signing and sending transactions through read RPC. And um, the blocks are then streamed. Um, and then how to get them to the user interface? Well, you actually need to look at every block and write something that we call a projection. Uh, and then this projection is a piece of code that looks at every block, extracts information that is needed and relevant for your DAP, and puts it into the database, which we call the read database. And this is fairly traditional uh, Web2, so to speak, approach when you have a database specifically designed to serve queries that are needed for certain user interfaces. Uh, and you can build what we call materialized views there. And then this user inter the user interface, the user, when they want to see something, they actually query from this database and not from the protocol itself because making queries to protocol will result in hundreds or maybe thousands of RPC requests and making user interface very slow. Um, so how to do that? Um, well, first of all, uh, we, more than a year ago, maybe more than a half, one and a half years ago, we introduced Near Lake that allows you to stream blocks directly to your server. You don't have to uh, run a node. Running a node is very expensive. You need to maintain this node, you need to upgrade it, 
So if you don't want to do that, you can use Near Lake. It's a storage of all the blocks uh, in JSON format. Uh, it is uh, always up to date. It's less than three blocks uh, away from the tip of the network, usually. Uh, it is roughly 25 times cheaper than running a node. It can stream 300, sometimes up to 600 blocks per second. Uh, and currently we have more than 50 indexers live on mainnet. Um, you receiver pays, so this is AWS S3 receiver pays policy, which means we pay for storage for maintaining it, but whoever is running the indexer will need to pay for every query, for every download of this JSON uh, block, and as I said, it's 25 times cheaper than running uh, your own node. We have uh, indexers live in JavaScript, Rust, uh, Python, Go, and even Ruby. Uh, we officially support JavaScript and Rust. A majority of indexers are actually written in JavaScript. Um, so how will the architecture look like with this approach? Well, we have Near Lake, which is an AWS S3. Um, we then create here an AP141 indexer or Near Balances indexer. These are two standalone applications that just read uh, blocks, receive blocks as they show up in Near Lake, uh, process them, this is our projection, process them, extract needed information, put in PostgreSQL, and then HTTP server specifically written for this use case is uh, serving this data as users requested. Um, we have this running as an enhanced API on pagoda.co. Uh, these two GitHub repositories have the source code for it. If you need tokens, history, balances, uh, for near tokens, for fungible tokens, for uh, non-fungible tokens, this architecture is uh, uh, implemented in these two repositories. And on pagoda.co, there is enhanced API that you can see live for yourself. This was one of the first implementations of production indexers that we had. Um, but then, as, as we were building more and more indexers, we found that actually, first of all, this is the pattern that keeps repeating. It's almost always the same pattern. And you, if you run multiple indexers, you need to look after the architecture, uh, the infrastructure, sorry, of these uh, indexers. And you need to make sure that they're not failing, they're not lagging behind, and uh, the API is always live. So we find that the, this is one of the best practices to uh, have the database optimized for the use case and to have GraphQL uh, ideally automatically generated after your schema to make sure you do fewer queries to the API. And then we thought, well, uh, developers want to build apps faster. They normally don't have database engineers in the team. Uh, they, don't, they normally don't have time to build a proper architecture right away because they need to show traction to their investors, so they want something quickly. Um, so we uh, started working on uh, Query API. It's a fully managed serverless indexers uh, and storage and GraphQL endpoints. This allows you to create an indexer without maintaining any infrastructure. This is what means serverless. Uh, we do have servers, of course, but you don't have to worry about them at all. Uh, we are out auto-provisioning custom indexers for you. Uh, this is not a specific indexer for, let's say, tokens. This is the indexer that you need for your specific set of smart contracts. So without qu query APIs, you had to build smart contracts. The data from smart contracts comes to Near Lake that I described before automatically. Then you need to create a database schema you need to write the JavaScript or uh, Rust code to uh, process every block. Then you need to run a database instance and to manage this database instance. Uh, you need to run an HTTP API server. You actually need a load balancer because if you have a spike of transactions, you want to scale this and you want to serve this traffic. Um, and ultimately, you need probably to do some client-side transformations if you build REST interface as people usually do uh, when they build um, these APIs. So with Query API, all you need to do, besides your smart contracts, of course, is to write, think about the SQL schema and the JavaScript code that reads every block and uh, transforms data from this block into the schema that you just created. All of the 
other components are provisioned automatically by the service. Um, so this is a I, I want to show you a live demo, but this is a screenshot of uh, a DDL schema for the near.org main page social feed. It is powered by Query API today. And uh, this is the a couple of tables, actually three tables for posts, comments, and likes. Um, fairly, fairly standard Postgres schema. So you just create this right in Query API. After that, you write JavaScript index your logic to process blocks as they appear. And then after that, you have automatically provisioned GraphQL API to access this data. So what is the workflow? How do you work with Query API? What is, what is the process? Um, so first of all, you go to designs. And once you have the designs, the user interface that you need to implement, as, let's say as a front-end engineer, you look uh, at all the screens and you think of these screens and think of uh, what are the queries need to be made to the backend to receive this information. And you want to actually have fewer queries on every load of the screen, right? So you need to design database after the schema that is needed to show the, to, to implement the, the, the Figma prototype, right? So you create this SQL schema and then you find few block heights uh, that, block numbers, right, uh, that you want to test on. Um, and you write JavaScript code to inspect those blocks, extract the information. You can even debug this code right in the, br in the browser. I'll show you in a couple of minutes. Um, then you store the code and you watch the logs. The code and the schema is stored on, chi on chain, on near blockchain. Um, this is the, this the storage layer for Query API. Um, and then after a few minutes, the uh, uh, infrastructure will be provisioned for you and you will see the logs and you will have the database and the API. Uh, obviously, you might face some bugs and certain things won't work right away, so you'll go back and fix those bugs following your own logs. Um, and then after that, once everything's working, you can go to graphical playground and generate queries and export them. So when you're creating an SQL schema, um, you need to try to design it for upserts, which means you might want to re-index your data. You want, might want to rerun your indexer from scratch, and your schema should support that, as well as the code. Um, to make GraphQL work well and efficiently, uh, you need to create foreign keys. Um, you shouldn't forget about indexers, indexes to ensure that the data, there, there are no full scans uh, when, when they're querying the data. Um, and sometimes you might want to show some aggregated data, let's say group by date or group by week. Uh, so for that you can use views and GraphQL will automatically generate a special query for these views. Um, this will reduce the, number, the amount of code you need to write in JavaScript. So when you're writing uh, the indexer logic code uh, in JavaScript, uh, we're providing a near lake primitives library, which allows you to extract data from the block easier with fewer lines of code. Um, you still get access to the whole block. You can extract the receipt args, uh, arguments, outcomes, uh, receipt outcomes, uh, events, everything that is stored in the block. And then you can use a context.db method to access the database, write data to the database that you created. And you can also write logs there. So once everything's working, uh, you can go and look at GraphQL queries. We have a graphical playground. Um, you can click through and just you know, select the fields that you need. Uh, you can try the queries right there, debug the query. Uh, and then from there, you can directly export uh, code to be used in the BOSS component. You can even change the query uh, keyword to subscription keyword in GraphQL. And you will receive WebSocket connection uh, with, uh, with that subscription automatically. Uh, let's try to look at the demo of how this works. So first of all, this is near.org main page. Uh, how can you qu uh, find Query API? You go to Applications, Develop, uh, and find near Query API. Here you can see different indexers that uh, people build. There is one specific that I want to show you.
This indexer is currently running. You can see the, the status. Um, it shows the logs that the user created. Um, you can see the current block height. You can see the status that it's running. Let's look at the code. Uh, this is written directly on near.org as a widget stored on chain. Um, the editor experience is powered by a separate uh, web instance because we wanted to produce as much, uh, you know, as rich experience for editing as possible. Um, and here uh, you can see the code that was written to extract the posts, the comments, and the likes for the main social feed. It all starts somewhere here when we look at the block, we look at all the actions, we go through all the operations, we extract function calls and set methods. Um, and you need to know this information, you need to know what to query, uh, you need to know your own smart contract. Um, but this is a key value storage on social.near, so we need to look at the, all the set methods. And then we're basically looking for posts and likes. And uh, here, if we found a post, we run handle post creation, or we, handle, we run handle comment creation, or we handle a like. And here, these are the functions. Let's say handle post creation. We assemble the post data, and we just simply context.db.posts.insert the post data. Um, this is the schema that I showed you before. We have the post table, we have the comments table. The cool thing is we generate types on the fly so that it's easier for you to um, write. So let's say you can s type uh, context.db.comments uh, and then you can say insert and you can uh, add the, the object that you need. The names of the fields are uh, the same as in your uh, schema. It makes uh, makes access to the database easier. Um, so to, I just switched to the uh, actual indexer that is running uh, in production right now that powers the main feed. It's um, deployed under data platform .um, I wanted to quickly show the uh, debugging experience. So let's say there is a block height where there is a post, we can actually uh, take the post, uh, I'm choosing a block, but let's say this block. In reality, when you're editing an indexer code, you need to use Explorer and look at the transactions of uh, into your smart contract, and you need to find the blocks where these transactions um, generate receipts to your smart contract. And this is where you want to debug your indexer. But here, it's just handy for me here on the stage to find this block. I go to indexer, and I can switch, off, switch on the debug mode and paste this uh, block height here. I can press plus, open the console, the, the browser console, and just hit play here. And so what will happen is uh, we will fetch the block and we will execute this function right away in the browser. And everything that you're outputting, these are the, the logs that the developer uh, output in this function, we will show it here in the console. And hopefully, this will make it easier for you to uh, troubleshoot uh, the, the indexing on every single block that you have. Um, we don't touch the database in this debug mode. Um, so you cannot select and you cannot insert, but uh, you can simulate the processing for every block very easily. Um, now let's look at the graphical interface. So here, let me switch off the debug mode. Uh, here, I can create a query for the indexer that I just created. We have a bunch of indexer, uh, a bunch of tables here. We name them after the creator of the indexer, the data platform near, and then social feed is the name of the indexer and then the table uh, that was created in the schema uh, follows after that. So let's say I want to query the posts. I want to find five last posts. Last means I need to order by block height descending. And I want to take the account ID 
I want to take the content, and maybe I want to look at the post likes uh, aggregate, which means I want to know the, the number of likes that were under this post. So I just assemble this query, I can hit play, and I'm right away getting the index data from here with the latest posts. Now what if I want to build a user interface with that? Uh, if you want to use it in the components uh, on near.org, you can hit uh, share uh, icon here, uh, which opens the code exporter. And right away here, you have the code that you can directly copy paste into uh, Sandbox, which I will open here. So you can copy paste it here and if you look at the preview, we're just rendering the JSON object, but you can put anything here. So for example, a.account ID will show us the account names that created the last posts, and after that you can implement your user interface. Um, we have, uh, I have also the example of the widget activity feed uh, that is a subscription. Hopefully somebody can uh, sends, uh, uh, let me refresh maybe, but while I'm talking, maybe somebody will uh, edit the uh, widget and this, will, this user interface will automatically update because uh, it maintains a WebSocket connection to Query API uh, and, and, and shows um, live stream of uh, all the edits to widgets. Uh, but it didn't happen, uh, it doesn't happen very often. But you can check the code and uh, here uh, you can look at the details of this component and if you want you can fork it. There is a bunch of styles as always. Um, it looks at near query API at pagoda.co pagoda and here we have um, uh, a bunch of code that needed that is needed to maintain a WebSocket connection and update the user interface. All right, that's uh, pretty much it for uh, for the demo and my uh, presentation today. Uh, Query API is available in a beta uh, mode where where uh, basically we need to add you to whitelist to use it because we don't want to. Uh, we want to maintain the service for everybody and want to make sure that everything is stable. Uh, we'll just have a short conversation uh, with you about your use case. If this is one of the smaller smart contracts and you don't need to index the whole blockchain, you're just building a DAP, uh, we will give access to you and uh, work with you to uh, bring your indexer to production. Uh, you can use this QR code to fill up the form. Um, and uh, we have uh, two minutes. If you have any questions, I can answer them now or you can find me afterwards. I see people scanning the code, that's good. So, uh, see, you, see you around, yeah. So you don't want the query API, you want to build query API, but the API itself, you want it to be uh, private. You want. Right, uh, well, query API, uh, everything's gonna be public with the current setup. Uh, query API is open source, so you can find it on uh, under near account in GitHub, and you can run a copy of query API yourself. Uh, it's a bunch of Docker containers, you run them, um, and uh, this will make a private uh, API for you. All right, it's great to be on time. Thank you so much. <laughs>
introducing decentralized identity solutions with the uh, IDOS. Yeah, hey everyone, um, glad to be here and uh, thanks for listening in. Um, I'm uh, Julian Neidloff, I'm the co-founder of the IDOS um, and Fractal, one of the building partners. And I'm Johan, I'm project manager working for Pogoda on identity processing team. So uh, this talk is all going to be all about uh, identity and uh, introducing the IDOS actually uh, going live today uh, on Mir with an, the identity operating system, uh, which is the identity layer of Web3, which um, hopefully works a little bit better than my <laughs> clicker here. Um, so the IDOS is um, trying to solve something that we've been talking about for quite some time. Uh, decentralized identity is probably one of the first primitives that we talked about um, probably as early as um, eight years ago, ten years ago. And um, for such an effort to really bring it into the ecosystem, we uh, teamed up with a bunch of folks, um, specifically with Nier, uh, where it's going to uh, debut uh, today. Um, we also have Quill, LF0, and Gnosis um, partnering up to build the IDOS. Um, what is the IDOS? The IDOS is two things. It's a decentralized storage, so a federated system of nodes that uh, store identity data, and it's an access management protocol. Um, so you can think of it as uh, being an IPFS style decentralized storage um, that is specifically made in a compliant way to host identity data and an access management protocol that um, users are actually in charge of their information and can give access to that identity uh, throughout the ecosystem. So I already touched base on um, that we've been talking about identity for quite some time, right? And I mean, Vitalik is writing about it every four years, um, urging the whole industry to adopt and go to a native standard of how to manage identity, and we still haven't gotten there. And it's not for the lack of trying, right? Like we've seen many approaches um, of how to, how to solve it. Um, and if we're looking at the identity landscape today, it kind of seems like medieval Sorry. Europe, um, where if you want to travel to your neighbor, you have to identify yourself and again. Uh, and if we take this metaphor to like um, an ecosystem, it's not just uh, that identity can freely flow uh, or users can freely flow across ecosystems, it's even from depth to depth that we have a problem where we keep on forgetting someone's identity and we need to ask for it again and every dev needs to build the whole thing again. Um, and we don't think that this is great and we do think that we need to have a solution to solve it, have a layer to actually make this work. And so we welcome you all to the future of identity on the blockchain where IDOS and Nier come together like uh, peanut butter and jelly. That was my attempt to make a joke. <laughs> uh, but seriously, it's essentially a partnership that's been meticulously crafted to ensure that we respond to the need of our founders and developers on Nier. And it sets a standard of what identity should be looking like on Web3 going forward. So, uh, yes, that's fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, go, can you go back a bit? Thank you. So like, imagine a world where your data is as fluid as your thought and as private as your diary, right? This is a world we've been dreaming about for years in the decentralized world. Right? And today, NIAD isn't just dreaming it. Right? It's actually doing it, right? Today, we're not just introducing an identity layer. Today, 
we are taking the essence of identity and integrating with IDOS into NIA. We are enabling our builders and developers with the possibility to create what they've been doing, innovating dApps, but also make sure that these dApps are compliant and self-sovereign. So I know it's a bit of a <laughs> overstatement perhaps for you, but for me, I truly believe that it's not just an announcement. Today, we are making history. NIA becomes the first major blockchain ecosystem to integrate identity at its core. Right? I want you to think on that for a bit. And it's not just about the technology. Right? It's about enabling a community and an ecosystem for widespread adoption going forward. So I am, as a use case, thrilled to announce that we are integrating IDOS with Nia.org today, right? And so this is a video <laughs> uh, that introduced how this is working out. Um, if you want to go now to Nia.org on your profile, you can look on how you can create an account and how you can manage your credential easily, right? So this is the video that's going through. Why now? We went through the profile and we are connecting um, to IDOS. Here, the connection provide, like, ask you to like, connect your wallet. If you do not have an IDOS account or wallet connected to it, it would create one. Connects you to Fractal ID, and then um, you know, create an account, connect your wallet, decide there's a bunch of wallets you can decide from. We went through a KYC process, so it requires you to you know, provide uh, a document. Here, we choose to provide a national ID. It requires also uh, proof of liveness, so you can you know, put your face in the camera and uh, get scanned. And uh, more importantly, you need to set up your, your password to, to make sure that the data is private and owned by you, right? And when this is done, you're going back to near.org where you can see, um, you know, it can take a couple of minutes for it to be approved, but you can see that you've been approved, you have your credential, and you are verified. You, there will be a QR code at the end. You can test it out yourself, but this is, this is already out there. So the cool thing is that this is actually live. So you can go to near.org right now and uh, really test it out. Um, you then have a credential, right? And the question is, what do you do uh, with this credential? And there are several use cases, and we are really keen to discover more that you guys might have in mind because it is an open layer that you can build up on. So the first use case is to really enable DeFi and DeFi that also touches people's everyday lives. Because whenever we're talking about, you know, for example, having a debit card, opening up a bank account, identity is needed in a compliant way um, to, uh, yeah, to just onboard. And um, we opted to build uh, a native layer to actually enable users to hold their own data and to pass it on as they, uh, as they wish. Um, another application is um, uh, proof of personhood. So making sure a person is really a person, or a person is a unique person and hasn't created like 10 or 20 different wallets already. Near is the ecosystem that has really early on focused on users. So user growth, applications that are actually helpful for, for real users out there. And it's, from my perspective, it's taking it a, a step forward because we're going from, from users that are unique wallets, active wallets, to actually verified users. And this is specifically interesting, not just from the proof of personal perspective, but also when you're talking about enabling um, real-world DeFi rails where you go to near and you would have 50,000, 500,000, 5 million people that are already verified that with one click can onboard to even um, financially regulated applications. So how does the IDOS really work? Um, if, we're looking at the if we're looking at the whole flow, a user comes, and we have seen that before, wants to put in data. They can just put in data that of their own choosing, but they sometimes you want to have verified data, like for example, KYC or proof of uniqueness, right? So they go to the identity provider, 
they get their data back, they encrypt it themselves, and they put that data package into the IDOS. Then if a DAP or near wants to request um, that data, they go to a node to request access, which is being forwarded to the user um, to actually uh, consent to that, to that process, so to grant an access, um, access request. The user then takes that data, decrypts it, encrypts it with the DEPS receiving public key, and uploads it into the IDOS. And that's the cool part, so that in the future, the DEP can also go to the node to request the data even if the user's offline. The IDOS is a data storage and access management protocol. But there are cool things that are on top which is that you can actually add any type of data to it. You can add uh, reputational data. You can add a social graph to it, if you like. Um, and you can build up on it, because it's really a composable identity stack. So for example, um, imagine um, lots of dApps are using the IDOS, and you, for example, want to build an analytic tool so that dApps finally can see what you know? What type of users they are, are actually using that app, or you want to build an incentive system that works for real users and not just an army of bots. That's something that the IDOS enables because it's permissionless. You can just build on, on top of it, and you can build with the IDOS as a module. So I was talking a lot about how. We have been, as an industry, thinking about de decentralized identity. And I want to come back to it, because you might be asking yourself, why in the world is the IDOS now going to solve it, where others have failed in the past? And we think that we identified five different reasons uh, for it. And there are some concepts that might be uh, familiar to you, like a soulbound token, NFT type of um, identity uh, solution, identity wallets, monolithic chains, and uh, just regular decentralized storage. And one part that we see is compliance. Because in the end, if you want to build an application, if you want to have a service, and you have your a lawyer or in-house lawyer tell you that this doesn't work, for example, because there are um, privacy uh, data privacy issues that are standing in the way, the whole solution is just that doesn't, isn't feasible. Um, this was important for us to solve. Permanent data availability. If you have an identity wallet and you go to a DAP, you have two choices as a DAP provider. You either download the data and you put it into your AWS um, Web2 databases, or you don't do anything with that data. But if you do the, the, the first step, then you have, you have to build the onboarding flow again. You have to uh, make sure that you maintain this uh, content management or client relationship management system, and the data is growing stale. It's not chain agnostic. And for us, a very important point is it's not standalone and an end-to-end -end solution. So if you provide um, a solution that is an on-chain solution, but you don't provide the service to go with it, you can't really use it. That's what the IDOS does different to other solutions out there. So, what is coming to the IDOS in the next couple of months? Um, we are going live today on year. We are super excited about it and really thankful that you guys took the first step because you always need to have an ecosystem that um, has a conviction here. Because, you know, no one's really doing it, so do I need to make the first step? Do I really need to be the pioneer and fight like with the first uh, implementation? Do I really have to have the effort of bringing this live? And Nir said, yes, we really strongly believe in this. Um, we believe in actual real life uh, use cases and uh, user growth, um, and we are super excited for what's to come and what others are building with it. We also partnered up with Gnosis for example, to um, give users the ability to have a, a self-custodial debit card. So even for highly regulated use cases, in this case in the UK and in Iceland, like a full, full bank provider. And we have LS0 that uh, are adding um, a privacy layer on top of it. And 
this is even more important, we already have uh, dApps integrating it. We have 14 different dApps that sa said, yes, this is interesting to us that um, are right now integrating the IDOS so that you can not only create your identity on near.org, but you can also consume it for very different use cases. So all the way from proof of personhood, um, which is very light touch where you just want to know if someone is a real person, not a bot, to highly regulated use cases. So what we've announced today is just the beginning. I think, honestly, um, the potential of IDOS is vast, much more than what we just talked to you about. Um, so I'm going to take a few minutes to talk to you and walk you through some of the use cases we've put together. Those are just uh, concepts, just to be clear. They're not live yet. Um, or what, how you could use IDOS going forward and how you could develop on, uh, using IDOS. I want to say a special thank you to the design team working on this because I'm presenting, but I didn't, I didn't build that at all. <laughs> so it works when I don't speak. Yeah, there you go. Um, cool. So uh, imagine something. You go to your favorite coffee shop, and you get yourself a brew, and you use your uh, near debit card, no fuss, no muss, just like a smooth transaction. feels like magic, but it's not magic. It's IDOS. IDOS is enabling you to use your crypto in a real world. Right? Um, it's not just a concept. It's actually the future of uh, what it could look like. Right? This is the example. Because we have uh, already saved all data within your own account of IDOS, you can just honestly just like link it, digitize it here, and create, um, make that transaction. Right, second example, um, for those of you that are more like into sports, not necessarily with me, but, and, and like to, you know, like reward yourself after uh, running with like a cup of coffee again, because uh, I love coffee, um, you can do that, right? The concept would be you simply go in there, get your reward from Sweetcoin, and use that to just pay your coffee, right? This is not just like a design or concept or anything like that. This actually could be a reality. It could be going forward, the future where you can just pay your coffee, leveraging your own efforts, and making sure that the transaction is secured through IDOS. That's the video, I forgot, but yeah, this is it. <laughs> right, similar concept, using all the little data that you saved on IDOS and uh, purchasing your coffee. And then finally, if you're more like me, you like to hustle using um, your task and you want to use your rewards for like real life or like transferring your money to a bank account and things like that, same, very easy. You can simply log in using your IDOS account and it's as easy as just clicking on withdraw, putting your IBAN, transfer the money, right? So again, this is not just like a concept, this could be the future and it's, it's as easy as just like praying, placing pray on, on, on this video. While the designs that we just saw um, is something that we talked to the teams about, if we can show it as like a way to uh, showcase how it can be used, uh, but it's not live, the concepts behind it already work because you can transfer that data um, to a recipient that is uh, using it to onboard you even in compliant use cases um, to, for example, with one click add a different module that is... Um, yeah, even a financial use case. We are super thrilled to, um, to, to present the IDOS here because um, you guys are the ones that are building cool dApps, that are building cool modules, and we really want to uh, get the community excited about it because uh, um, the IDOS is the layer that you can use to build different applications on top of it and also improve. So, for example, um, if you feel like a social type of login is missing here, or um, a recovery function. That's something that you can do because it's a permissionless stack. If you feel like you want to add an incentive system for users that are real humans to check out uh, a different application, you can do it. If you want to build highly regulated modules that throughout the near ecosystem, every dev can just take to plug it in without having to worry about uh, compliance, 
uh, you can do that as well. So uh, please check out the developer documentation. Um, if you're curious as a user how it works, um, you also find the link here. Um, please give it a go. Um, it's uh, live today. And we still have a bunch of uh, time to answer some questions. Yep, if you have any questions. We'd love to hear from you. I think there's a mic coming for you. Uh, yeah, that's really interesting stuff. W when you link, uh, it looks like you link an IDOS account to a near wallet. Is, is, this, uh, is that linkability visible on the blockchain? So you're effectively doxing that wallet in any way? Uh, so the creation of the, um, the IDOS account isn't visible. Um, what is visible is if you're giving an access grant, this will show up in a smart contract that uh, gives that access uh, to another receiving address, which uh, is the DAPS address. Um, but it doesn't show what is being shared. Okay, public so, so the, the people who are granted the access will know that this wallet is linked to you, but the general public can't look at a blockchain and go, oh, that's your wallet, and then, you know. Yeah, uh, so the node providers um, know which address is linked to which ID, but they also don't know what's in that uh, verifiable credential because it's encrypted by your uh, um, uh, public key. Yeah, um, well, I, I'm amazed uh, at the number of organizations that you were showing in that map. Yes, I pulled. Uh, so I am not 100% sure if my question is really fair. Uh, you are probably aware of uh, Bill Gates Foundation uh, MOSIP system that's uh, being used in parts of Asia and Africa. Uh, do you have any plans to work with them or or you are not aware of it, which, you know, would be fair because there are incredibly many the number of organizations and companies working on this. We have plans to work with everyone. <laughs> and uh, we've been reaching out to a couple of, um, of builders in the space already. Uh, we've uh, participated in the, uh, in the all hands and introduced the concept um, uh, a month ago, roughly. Uh, but we do not know what you guys are building. Uh, so if you think that there might be a fit, um, we have a booth at the main venue where my colleagues are at. Um, we'll also be outside, and if you think that there is something how we can help with the IDOS, we would love to uh, get this really embedded into the ecosystem because that's also something to say. It's like this is not the first time that um, a decentralized identity play was just um, implemented into any ecosystem. We've seen many of these, but those are all deserts, and it only lives and th that's the major difference uh, because it's really implemented at the heart of near um, but also because um, devs are already starting to implement that because it needs to live it needs to be used for it to be useful in the first place because a decentralized identity system that has no users or devs using it is um, not useful at all yeah if i can add to this uh, thank you if you have like i think we're quite limited in what we think about at times um, I came up with some use cases and we came up with others and our teams as well, but uh, the reason why we're here as well is to gather this kind of example you mentioned. So. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thanks. That was an amazing presentation. Um, just a quick Thank you. Uh, question regarding the organization. What's the relationship between the fractal ID and IDOS? That's a good question. Uh, you you want to take it? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so um, Fractal is one of the building partners of the IDOS, um, and we've been um, pushing that uh, in the beginning to make it work. Uh, but we are really building that together with Near, with Gnosis, um, with LF0 um, on the ecosystem side, but also, for example, with Quill, which is providing one of the fundamental uh, decentralized data, so it's a SQL-based system uh, layer. So it, it's really not just us, and this is what we want to also uh, implement in the whole um, uh, setup. Yeah, I'll just add this. So um, on the verification side, Fractal ID right now 
is very high, but going forward, there will be other yeah. like ver the, uh, entities that can verify. It wouldn't be just tied up to Spike for ID. Thank you for the Cool, cool, yeah. We will be outside if you have any other questions. Thank you so much for listening to us. Uh, have a good day. <laughs>
you sort of need that gas fee and storage fee when it comes to deploying smart contract account. The worst is, if you're not on near, you're in EVM, then you just need to deploy it every time you go to a new blockchain. Second thing, easy to use. Is it really easy to use? I think we'll go through th this later. But right now, just think about it. Every transaction you do is going to cost you 200 to 500% more in terms of gas fees. And setting up smart contract account, there are many ways, there are different vendors. Once you engage in them, you might get vendor lock-in, which doesn't sort of give you that compatibility um, in terms of like Web3, which we always like. Third thing is robustness. I mean, that's really good bas because it's basically programmable. You can do whatever things you like. In terms of security, it's good. Um, not as good as Ledger, for sure, because essentially you still sort of have your wallet key somewhere that's accessible, in the, like, access, have access to internet. And the last thing is cross-chain compatibility. This is a really big issue right now. There are a couple of solutions that we're going to go through, but it's generally just not good enough. And if you look at this table, interesting enough, you'll find that the best way right now to onboard mass users is just MPC which is essentially what sort of fast off is doing. So here's a shout out to them. I think they're definitely doing a great job. And then we definitely believe that in a short term, at least short to medium term, MPC solution is most likely going to be, be the most affordable, easy to use, and also less burden way to onboard users. Well, so we've mentioned a couple of things just now. And here, let's summarize some of the big problems that we're seeing. The first one is fragmented UX or vendor login. Basically, we talked about it just now, like you've got a couple of different smart contract account vendor. They all sort of have their own features. They have their own way of create wallet. That means they are not compatible to each other. Say you've created a smart contract account with vendor A. If you go to vendor B and trying to use their wallet, it's probably not going to work. Second thing is inconsistent account across blockchains. Unfortunately, when we talk about account abstraction, it's often about EVM ecosystem. It's a good thing and bad thing. But EVM ecosystem itself is kind of, not to say fragmented, but has their own implementation. How do they support account abstractions? In what level do they support account abstractions? Is that true smart contract level or is that true um, native protocol level? That is still not so compatible with each other. Third thing is higher gas fee. We mentioned about that. And the last thing is every account requires gas to deploy. If you look at it right now, we do have a lot of problems, but there are many talents and projects and smart people that are trying to resolve these issues. If you look at it, ERC 66900 is trying to define how we have the modular smart contract account. Before this, it was just started from project like Safe Protocol, like Rhinestone, but right now they're trying to do it on protocol level. And then we have um, Safe Protocol Rhinestone we mentioned just now. In terms of like inconsistent account across blockchains, we have different parties managing them as well. Higher gas fee, maybe best transactions. I'm not so sure about this because it seems like it can reduce gas fee, but it has certain conditions. And eventually, if people is batching your transaction is trying to get that lower gas fee for you, they also want to extract some value. That's essentially what the, what do you call it? The, just forgot the word, but that's essentially what's happening. If people is providing you value, they would also sort of want to take it either through swap or either to uh, maximum value extract. Maximum MEV, sorry. And the last thing is native gas sponsor. This is currently happening on Polygon. Even though it might appear a little bit hard for users to actually get on board with smart contract account, it is easy for protocol or blockchain itself to just sponsor and allow users to get on board with smart contract account directly. So with what we have mentioned just now, I think it is very clear that smart contract account might not be the best way for us to onboard the mass users. It is very likely that we, we are still going to see smart contract account being used only for sophisticated users in specialized areas, for example, organizations where they need security, privacy of delegations. In terms of gamers, they always want uninterrupted sessions, and the session key can come in and help. DeFi traders, they want automation, better strategy. NFT collectors, they want safety and uh, scam prevention. Social users, they want identity and communication. That identity is often, co often connected to the Web2 application as well. And we have seen all players across these different domains, and they are doing pretty well. Coming back here, how about AA on NIR? Do we have anything similar? We have mentioned about the current situation of account abstractions on EVM. What are we seeing on NIR? 
currently we do have account extension that is sort of equivalent to modular account extensions on EVM. Well, we have shown two more jargons here. First is account extension, and sec second thing is modular account abstractions. We're going to talk about it right away. So first, what is modular smart contract accounts? Just now we mentioned about things like vendor login, and there's another issue that we didn't mention, which is if you deploy your smart contract to your account and you want to upgrade it with more modules or features, how are you going to do it? Is that easy to do? Maybe or maybe not. It often comes to a balance of flexibility and security. If you want it to be super simple to be upgradable, then it might come with security concerns. And if you want it to be very secure, then you probably don't want to touch your smart contract account, account as frequent. And the last thing is reusability. With the things we mentioned just now, different smart contract vendor, they just sort of have similar set of features. For example, social recovery, 2FA, and everyone just sort of have their own solution. That's why they sort of, on EVM, we sort of see projects coming up with modular smart contract accounts which different party can just create the module of features, then they can publish it. Of course, these features come with a certain set of standard interface and whatsoever, but anyone can essentially just develop and deliver their own feature, and anyone can just plug these features into their account and play it. So that just presents to, presents to us a, more, um, a solution that's easier to manage, upgradable and reliable. So, we mentioned about modular smart contract account. Why is that similar to account extension? What is account extension about? Well, on near account extension is actually a collective of any piece, more than one, not just one, missing the S there, that ha aims to increase the usability of network. And there are a few of them. First, global shared storage. Second, synchronous WASM submodules. Third, account namespace, and a few others. Disclaimer, these are all based on my own researchers on GitHub discussion and stuff. I have no idea whether or not they are really being Im implemented, whether or not what I'm, trying right, what I'm trying to deliver right now really match the outcome of the development and whatsoever. But here's a few things that I sort of got to know. First, global shared storage, what it does is it would allow in near protocol a shared storage that anyone sort of just gain access to. That would allow us to install Instead of deploying our own smart contract account to our ID, you can point your account to those sets of smart contracts. So for example, we're probably going to see a very commonly reused social recovery smart contract feature. So instead of you deploying that smart contract feature, that chunk of code onto your account, we have this shared global storage. Instead of doing that, you just point it to that. Now immediately, your account gets extended with that features. And we, if we have more features like this, essentially your account will just be like a Lego blocks that you have different piece of features that you put in, and if you don't want them, you just disable them. It will make things a lot more reusable and composable. composable. Second thing, synchronous WASM submodules. And this is a super interesting one because we have oft often known near broker as a uh, layer one that's quick, has very low finality and stuff. But if you try to do a swap, there might be cases where you might need to wait more than 10 seconds, 15 seconds, or even 20 seconds if you're missing out some things like, for example, storage deposit, for example, you're communicating through different smart contract. Because the nature of near protocol is that it is running transactions in asynchronous way in which a block might not finalize your state of the transactions and it might pass the, the rest of the transactions to the next block to be executed. So if you are trying to communicate with, say, five smart contract accounts, sorry, five smart contract, most likely this is going to span across next five to six blocks. And if you have things like storage deposit, and if you're doing more things, then it's essentially going to take like seven to 10 blocks. That's why even though near has a around one second block times, we often still have to wait more than five seconds or even 10 seconds. Synchronous WASM submodules just allowed us to execute things in an environment that is synchronous. So if we have this, we can sort of put some of our codes in this WASM submodules, and then we can execute things within this environment itself that we doesn't have to follow the way near defined asynchronous transactions. 
So in these sum modules, it will just finalize the details. It will give you the output. You just change the state. So it can reduce the finality by a lot. And the last thing is account name spaces. Just now we mentioned about global shared storage. That is just a shared storage. Essentially, it is account name spaces that allows you to extend the features of your smart contract account. There are a couple more others, um, and I just doesn't have enough time to research more about them. But based on what we have mentioned just now, the outcome would be we are going to see very soon composable near accounts that easily you can easily plug and play with different features, and it is extremely cheap to deploy, and you will have a lot quicker transactions. So how that might look like in the future? Just now we mentioned about smart contract accounts, and we compare that to different ways to manage your accounts. With the account extensions coming in, here's the improvement we're going to see. So first, in terms of cost, cost is going to be extremely low because now you're not going to de redeploy your smart contract over and over again. You're just going to point your things to the account, and then it allows you to immediately gain the similar upside of deploying that smart contract account. Second thing, you're going to be able to have a better user experience in which the transaction time is going to be minimized because otherwise, if you are deploying different features of your smart contract account, the cross-contract cost is just going to take way too long. So having them under the sub-module wasn't, sub wasn't execution environment would just allow it to be much, much quicker. And the next improvement is about cross-chain compatibility. So this is something Elijah just mentioned yesterday about account aggregations. Of course, this is something that we are still not entirely sure what's the detail for implementation, but it is pretty possible that this is going to be the way the future, the future wallet's going to handle cross-chain transactions because it just provides you with a much more consistent user experience that you can sort of just inherit the benefits of your smart contract account while still being able to abstract out and interact with dApps from different blockchains. So after mentioning all this, I'm represent representing Meteor Wallets. Here are the next few things that we're going to do. So first, we're going to deliver our mobile apps. It's sort of like delayed, but we're still working very hard on it. Second thing, we're going to work closely with the ecosystem to bring out the full potential of Near Protocol. The third thing is we'll try our best to deliver the first smart contract account product, which is Meteor Savings Account. This is very interesting. Just Im imagine that you have all the funds in your non-custodial wallet right now, and every day you just see extra cash coming in without doing anything else, and the money is still there, still have 100% control, 100% transparent. You can withdraw your funds anytime. And the last thing is we're going to explore the possibilities on modular smart contract account. Of course, this is all it's about. So that's it about the sharing. If you want to chat a little bit more about wallet or smart contract account, here's my TG. And then um, that's my Twitter as well. And just doing a shout out to Banyan and Dev, Dev Group. We sort of have a account abstraction hack on near Broco right now. And the URL is abstracting.org. So if you're interested about smart contract account and you want to try and hack something, go ahead and participate in the hackathon. So that's it about. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, nice talk. I have one question about account aggregation. So when we say account aggregation, are we also talking about accounts that are created outside the near ecosystem? For example, I don't know, MetaMask, uh, Phantom, and others. Uh, and if so, will they still have to go through the Meteor ecosystem, or will you create a, an interface where I can you know, still use MetaMask, not go through the Meteor ecosystem, and still use them? Uh, on any DAP, maybe on near or any other chain? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. So <coughs> again, a disclaimer, because this thing is rather new. I hope what I'm understanding is correct. What I'm foreseeing this is we sort of have the smart contract account on Meteor that would just implement all the logic to verify the transactions before you want to sign anything. It sort of control the logic on whether a transaction can be signed on any other blockchain. So if you have that, you send the transactions on near blockchain, it sort of go through all the checking, validation, and stuff. Is it approved? Transaction is being signed. And that transaction can be propagated to other network through the near validators and stuff. So it first inherits the 
benefits of having smart contract account, and second thing, you can still interact with smart contract or dApps on any other blockchains without having the burden of worrying about whether or not I want to care about the smart contract account there, why I need to care about that. It just abstracts out the complexity of other blockchains while you being able to interact with it. Media order. So I guess that's it about it. Thank you, guys. I'm just gonna leave this. Thank you. Awesome stuff. As uh, a lot of you probably know, and for those of you that don't, Meteor Wallet's been uh, killing it on Near for a long time. So awesome part of the ecosystem. We're gonna go into a short break. Um, you know, definitely stick around. Go check out some of the awesome deep tech boots. Grab some coffee. Make sure you earn some NCON while you're out. But uh, definitely come back because we have some more great speeches and panels lined up. Our tool to help uh, the community to organize hackathons, to organize events. We already have. We have already 12 co-host events. We are four like full native uh, hackbox events, and we have more than 200 submissions. So. If you want to launch a hackathon, launch an event, please uh, talk to us, talk to Maria, and we will give you this you know, one-click kit for you can start doing this with us. And near campus, oh, uh, I'm, 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 I'm leading this initiative. We decided to start engaging uh, camp, uh, blockchain clubs. We have multiple stations near campus. We are in the first one that is uh, approaching uh, blockchain clubs. We are trying to... The, Blockchain clubs have their own natural pipeline, so we're trying them to, to give them the tools so they can uh, keep doing this, but include near in the in the in the conversation. Also, we have plan for researchers and you know other levels. So now we are in the first stage that is the blockchain clubs. We already have uh, more than 50 universities uh, in, engaged, um, including some big names like uh, University of California. Caltech, Cambridge. Uh, tomorrow we'll give a more expans expanded version of this presentation if you need more information or you can just talk to me. Um, we have universities in Euros, in Europe, in USA, in Europe, in Africa, in Latin and Asia. Um, we have the fellowship programs. Uh, you know, we are bringing fellows, so they want to have their manage their own programs uh, related with the uh, developer journey. So we've been working. Uh, Vlad is uh, spearheading that. That, uh, present that program, so we have more than 500 commits, 20 projects, major releases, a lot of contributors. Right now, the, the most recent, uh, we are uh, helping uh, you know, improve the documentation from, for NIR. So if you think you can contribute, you probably definitely need to look at the fellowship program. Um, so what we can do, right? How, how we can help to bootstrap you know, the, the traction for those Builders and founders and, and developers that you know need traction with their, uh, their applications, right? So today, the all the all the developers they solve their own, they they figure out how they start the, the apps, how they launch. So the cold start problem they have to do it th th themselves. They they have to figure out their own content. They so and they need to figure out the, their way to market. Yeah. So if you, if the what we call the you know clo closing. Uh, uh, crossing the, uh, the, the chasm, right? So they have to do it themselves with limited resources. So we want to help them with that. So that's, that's the current status. But then it, we have a lot of content, right? We have a, a lot of debates, a lot of interactions with the community. So we have a lot of ideas and solutions. We actually live complex debates. If you see the forums, you see that there's a lot of conversation happening, a lot of coming and going about our content or what is what 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 is being done? We have a lot of real life activities. We have the hackathons. We have the the online the online uh, the, the real life courses, the online courses. So many topics, many many areas of discussion is constantly happening in DevOps. Uh, we have committees. We have the uh, we we talk with the communities with the watcher groups. So that's what the kind of content we have. So what how we can how we can make this content available, right? How we can make it to the, to the people that actually need it, right? So what we're trying to, what we have now, kind of what we have now, we're working to is 
the kind of uh, uh, data we get from those posts in social, in, in, in near social, right, in social DB. So we have the social data, like the, the, the first layer. You have the title or description, the tags. This is the information that the, the, the person posting has. You have the basic. So then you start getting the mentions. You have the reactions, the replies. We also have the, uh, if they edit the post, the, the edit history remains there, the links, the notifications, right? But then we want to add an, another layer, like another metadata layer that it should call the sponsorship. As it means how, how many funds, uh, the, 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 the funds they have received, the attestation that we do attestation, right? We someone make a post and we, we let anyone to give their, their opinion about that post. So the attestations are there. Then we want to add GitHub integrations. We want to add community data, Kanban, Wiki, the access control. So that's the second layer of metadata. We, want, we, we are working on adding to the DevHub posts. Uh, but what, what to do with the data, right? So for example, once, once this is up and running, we are, it's, it's in process, will be uh, hopefully very soon. So you can see, for example, Nirwik uh, putting their own visualization layer and working on top of this data to, for example, get bounties data. Or you can see Near Horizon taking uh, putting their own visualization layer on top of us, so you can co company data, hiding data. So that's this is how we see uh, this is happening. We encourage it could be any other kind. Doesn't have to be doesn't have to be like a near with type or or horizon. We need everyone to put a, a layer on top and leverage the information we have there. So what kind of apps could we think could leverage this kind of information, like social apps? payment processing, hiring, job-related applications, fundraising, promotion, marketing, governance, reputation system. All this is some ideas of the kind of application we think we can uh, live on top of the social data we have, right? So now, now, right now, we have our own contract. So it's the DevHub uh, smart contract that is uh, gathering those, those information, but we are planning to eventually migrate to the social DB, uh, the, the, so the social DB contract. So please work, I mean, come work with us, uh, with the community devs, if you want to use this information to help improve your traction process. So this, comp uh, we are opening the, the forms and opening post your proposal. If you need more information, come to the, to the portal. Um, this is the, 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 the website address. You can get it here. So it's, if you want to get the, the, the fastest way to get acquainted, go to the, go to the forum, read the proposals. Uh, we are in Discord. We have the Telegram group. We can, you can get us on Twitter. The team is always all around. We've been attending a lot of hackathons, a lot of uh, uh, conventions. On, so please, talk to us and let us help you use this amount of data we have and so you can use it to improve your traction of your app. Uh, well, I think that's it. Thank you very much for your time. And yeah, we'll be around. Knock on the door. Thank you. Thanks so much for sharing more about DevHub Boris. I'm really looking forward to getting near campus off the ground within the next few weeks, uh, starting in London. Cool. Um, next, what, ne next up, we will be hearing from David on multi-chain accounts on Near. Um, and you'll, we have a click over here. Yeah, perfect. So here we go. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, David Milladarren. And I'm here from the Emerging Technologies team of Pagoda. Thanks so much to the DevHub team for that really great talk. I'm really looking forward to seeing um, the community development grow sort of as much as it possibly can. I'm here to talk to you today about multi-chain. We have a view inside our team, which is that users shouldn't have to know they're using a blockchain. Now, I'm not normally the type to quote Ronald Reagan, but uh, if you're explaining, you're losing. 
we found that you should only be talking to people about the benefits of blockchain, and they should never know about the costs. They should never know about how the thing works unless they're interested in how the thing works. So most of our research is focused on hiding that from the user as much as we possibly can. Right now, blockchain accounts are relatively immature generally. Users need to have um, a sense of what a private key is. They need to have a sense of how you need to store a private key. They need to know what a uh, seed phrase is. Um, they also need to understand how they link between different chains. These are all deeply complex and deeply nuanced things. Every time we onboard a user from a web to web, two to web three, we have to explain these things. We have to make them confident they're doing the right thing, and we have to take them through the steps to get onboarded. Generally, if you work in Web2, you'll know that about, for about every step you make a user do, you'll lose sort of 25 to 30% of users. Right now, there's sort of eight to 10 steps involved in onboarding to a regular Web3 application, which is terrible. Generally, the numbers we see in our industry for people losing, their, uh, for users making it through to the end, is between one and a half and 2%, uh, which is really, really awful. We tried to address this this year. We released a product called FastAuth, and the aim of it was to obscure the cost of gas on our chain using something called metatransactions. It was to use a standard way of having accounts, which was email. People are very used to typing their emails in to sign in. Uh, and we used biometrics instead of passwords because it allowed people to more securely store their identities without using passwords. The problem with this is it only works on near. So people still have to onboard when they're using near chain. They have to have some sort of concept of what near chain is. And they have to have a real willingness to use it. What's more, we can't do application interoperability between any of the chains right now. We're completely siloed. Our whole industry is smaller than a large American tech company, yet, you have to make every single ecosystem every time on every single chain. Mad. So what we've been working on for the last couple of months is multi-chain accounts. Accounts are really the crown jewels of the near blockchain. They're a not so understood feature, but it's the one thing we can do which is better than almost anyone else. Every single near account has a full smart contract running on it. You can do full key rotation. You can uh, define arbitrary rules that give you arbitrary amounts of control. So for example, someone could sign in with Google. If you see an OAuth token, you can give them a certain level of access. But in order to withdraw more than a certain amount of near, they need to take extra steps, like using their ledger device, finding their private key, all these kinds of things. Just having accounts and not having much else is not particularly useful. So what we're trying to do is bring the best of the near blockchain to every other blockchain. This is account aggregation. What we do is we allow a near account to control any other account on any other chain. This means that once you've created one crypto account, you have every crypto account. Your near account can hold Bitcoin. It can transact on Bitcoin. It can work as well, and I'll show later, better than any existing key storage technology. It gives you greater utility with the ease of use that you'd expect from something like FastAuth. How does this work? We created a technology called Chain Signatures. Chain Signatures put a potentially unlimited number of private keys inside of every single smart contract and every single account on the near blockchain. This means that you can have all the upsides of a near account, you can hold a key inside your near account, and then you can interact elsewhere. Using key derivation, you can add an arbitrary string to any one of your private keys and securely generate a new key. This means that you can have, you could have one account that holds 10 million keys without any storage costs, provided you can derive those keys correctly. 
how does it look to developers? We are adding a new host function to the, uh, to the system. This host function is called sign. If your smart contract calls it, any arbitrary payload can be signed. The way it is signed is that we have an MPC network. Now, MPC is a really cool piece of technology. Effectively, MPC, in it, when you use MPC, you have a virtual machine with secrets inside of it. No, many nodes run this virtual machine together. They run a computation over the secret, but no individual one of these nodes has a secret. What's more, as the nodes change, the keys remain the same. So you could have, over a period of time, the nodes will come and go, ship a Theseus style, and eventually you'll have a completely different set of nodes, but your keys will be completely preserved. This is particularly secure because the key is never assembled anywhere. There's no, no individual has any ability to misuse your key outside of the protocol. So we have accounts. We have the ability to sign in and interact with a chain. But we need more than that. FastAuth only works because of something called relayers. Relayers are a technology which allows, previously on Near, if your user wanted to use your application, they had to pay in the native governance token for the gas of that application. We saw that application developers were, were saving pennies worth of gas, but losing dollars worth of users. Or literally orders of magnitude difference in like, the effect on cost of acquisition. So what we did was we allowed sponsors to exist. Sponsors can selectively pay for people's near transactions. When, you pay for, when they pay for a near transaction, they observe what it does, they make a decision about whether or not they want to pay for it, and the user has no ability to extract the funds in any other way. So how do we bring this cross-chain? The current model is you have a near account, that near account holds a key, that key interacts with Ethereum. Very simple. The user still needs to top up ETH, and what's more, he needs to have a concept of what chain he's using. Users should never have a concept of what chain they use. It is not relevant information. I don't care whether a website is hosted on AWS or GCP. I just want to use the application. So what do we do? We bring the sponsors back in. The sponsor runs an on-near chain application. That on-near chain application develops a series of rules of what can be done with the sponsor's funds. That, the rule, those rules control the key inside of the near account. And that allow, gives them the confidence to put Ethereum in someone else's wallet without it getting immediately taken away. These faucet attacks are very common, and without protections against them, you will get your faucets drained almost immediately. You can start to see the power of this, uh, this solution now. It's not just that you have a key, but you have a key which is governed by a smart contract. So you can trust a smart contract to operate in a certain way without trusting the individual, unlike with a regular program. It's exactly the same with these keys. You can trust that the key will behave correctly at all times, because it, it is governed by a transparent smart contract that you can have some sort of say in. Business models we want to see when this comes out are people using things like Sweat to pay for uh, things across chains. So provided you pay Sweat to the sponsor, they will sponsor your Ethereum transactions. This allows for people who have developed tokens on Near to have new forms of tokenomics. You can get paid by application developers to onboard your users onto their chain. You have burn me mechanisms for your, your uh, token now. You have real utility across chains. So it's three forms of revenue. First of all, you get paid for the users. Secondly, you get burns. And thirdly, your users get more use out of the token, so there's more demand for it. This is clearly new and interesting economics for, for our chain. Now I'm going to start to talk about what you can build on top of this chain. These are things we haven't built yet, and we may not be able to build. And the beautiful thing about being in the near ecosystem is that we don't have to build everything. Everything we do is open source. Anyone can jump in. I'm going to make the argument right now that there are four or five huge businesses you could build on top of this technology if you have the wherewithal. And I would encourage any of you to have a serious think about doing this. With these MPC nodes, and the signatures, we have the ability to do a very clever type of encryption. This encryption allows any individual to have an encrypted communication with a smart contract, deposit an encrypted payload on that smart contract, 
and then have that content be re-encrypted and sent on to any arbitrary third party. You do not need to know these third parties up front. So in this example, this, this rather old individual is writing a book. He posts that book on chain, and he says, anyone who pays me 10 near will get a copy of this book. These, uh, these customers pay those 10, those 10 near and will receive an encrypted copy of the book that they can decrypt using their own key. This is an incredibly powerful tool. This allows content creators for the first time to use decentralized systems to gate their content. You can make a decentralized medium. You can make decentralized podcasts. You can make anything that requires any level of privacy. Messaging services, incredibly simple. You can make a version of WhatsApp that doesn't lose your messages when you change devices, but remains wholly encrypted end to end. Furthermore, there's very, very interesting economic things that shake out of this. One of the real problems on chains like Ethereum is MEV, or minor extractable value, or maximal extractable value, depending what you want to call it. People, miners can see transactions before they come in and take actions which extract value from those users. What you can do in this situation is you can get every single user to send encrypted bids to your chain. At a given point, when the bid closes, the chain will take all the encrypted bids and decrypt them and synchronously evaluate all of them. This allows you to do things like Dutch auctions and generally do more efficient trading with lower slippage for the individuals involved. This is something you can't do right now on any other chain and is you know, sort of potentially a really useful thing. On top of that, you can have encrypted pools of transactions that control keys that interact with Ethereum. So you can have efficient, cheap gas hidden transactions, no MEV, leading, and then settling out on another chain, which has higher levels of liquidity. This means we can make the fastest, most capital efficient DEXs on near without necessarily having the TVL required to do it. The next very interesting technology, and this is a pretty significant amount of work, so if you're planning to do this, I would say get some money first. Domains and websites, front ends of smart contracts, are the ugliest part of our industry. We have this beautiful decentralized system where no one can tamper with any of the code running on half the applications. We have these sort of audited, really thought about smart contracts on the back end. But on the front end, it's basically just a website. And the person who runs that website can arbitrarily change the code on that website and cause it to take people's funds. There's been over a billion dollars of funds taken out of people's accounts in various hacks in the generally Ethereum ecosystem. The reason is everything from swims, uh, SIM swaps to insiders to password leaks have led to hundreds of millions of dollars disappearing in individual hacks, whole projects going underwater. What's more, it's difficult to trust front ends, which makes you have to do terrible UX decisions that really push people away. When you have the ability to sign something with a smart contract, you can use a combination of DNS sec and signed exchanges to prove that every single thing served off your domain is always approved by your smart contract. That means you can use regular smart contract governance to decide what hashes of what assets can and can't be served at a given time. This gives you transparency, so you can be sure that the application being served is the correct one. And as well as transparency, it gives you the ability to vote for changes in your application on a full stack rather than just the back end. If you can make a secure smart contract, you can make a secure front end. And these technologies are well supported. You can upload this, these assets to Cloudflare and generally any edge technology and serve them as quickly as you'd serve anything else. There's no need to bounce off a smart contract each time. It's just there for the signature when you change assets. This also allows an incredible level of censorship resistance. Because anyone can host your assets, you can have an open field to allow any individual in any jurisdiction to host your assets, and you know they'll be correct. So you can allow them to use your domain incredibly safely. I'm going to have to speed up a tiny bit because we've got far too many of these use cases. Um, the next one is heterogeneous sharding. A big part of, near, uh, of uh, the blockchain ecosystem is private blockchain shards. Private blockchain shards kind of suck right now. They sort of do their own thing on the side. They have their own little world. They have their own little tokens. And basically, no one can really interact with them in any kind of meaningful way. Uh, any other near shard, private or otherwise, 
can sign transactions, send a message from one shard, it can land on the other, and they can respond. And you can have a fully decentralized form of custody of these messages, meaning that messaging on any other shard is just as easy as messaging on the shard you're currently on. This allows for potentially limitless scalability and various different properties of each shard. Capabilities. Capability, uh, there is a small cult of capabilities inside the blockchain ecosystem. It's a very nuanced computer science system, but if you can sign payloads, you can attach a proof to messages saying, I am who I say I am. I represent this user. I am holding 100 near, and if you have this thing, you can take this and, put it on, uh, and bring it back. It's almost like a bearer bond. This allows for very quick, very cheap cross-chain transactions. Key markets. Key markets are incredibly simple. Because you can govern keys by smart contracts, you can deposit funds in a key, be sure these keys are locked, and then exchange keys for one another. Or, alternatively, you can have exchanges that, do, that hold things like Bitcoin and Ethereum that run on near, but you can withdraw by getting keys that have, say, 10 Bitcoin in each one of them. You get control of that key, you withdraw it to an address you like the look of, it gets burned. Finally, let's talk about signer economics very, very quickly. Traditionally, in systems like this, the downside is that if all the MPC nodes were to collude, we would be in a situation where they could potentially use your key. So what happens is they all need to stake. Generally, when you stake, you need the value locked needs to be less than the value staked. We've come up with a new system, tentatively called the RAT protocol, which allows people to do a form of quadratic staking. What this does is, for each node you have participating in the system, you require uh, the, the, <laughs> the amount of stake each node requires is the square root of the amount of stake that needs to be there. The reason is that any individual node that gets pulled into, a cl into collusion can prove that people are asking them to collude. This means that if people ask me to collude and they have three bi Bitcoin worth of stake and I have but only one Bitcoin worth of stake, I can take their stake if they ask me to collude. This means it's impossible to trust people when you're attempting to collude. It's a very interesting problem because people say, I am dishonest and I want to steal from people, but you should trust me. It makes it almost impossible for people to take from this system. So what's the timeline? End of this month, we're gonna have something out on testnet. If you're thinking of building one of these things I've been talking about or anything else using this technology, you should jump on that. We're going to have documentation out. We're going to have something working, and we really want to get you building. February, if you're a capital allocator or you run a validator node, we want to get you to the next level of validation, which includes running these signatures. You'll get higher rewards. You will need a slightly higher stake, but, but it's going to be worth it. Finally, March 31st, we're opening this up to users. It'll be on mainnet. People can use it. People can start using the experiences people have built on top of this. I genuinely believe that this is the most exciting feature to come out since launch. I think it, may, it allows whole new business models and allows you to build things that were impossible to build on any other chain. Thank you so much for listening, and let me know if you have any questions. That was an amazing talk. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you so much, David. Um, amazing talk. I love what you're building, Pagra. I've been watching what you're doing for the past three years. Sure, so, speak up um, so yeah, I have two questions for you, man. Sure. First one, explain, please, uh, some of the main benefits that sponsors have when they pay uh, user transac uh, transaction fees. And the second one, um, due to the fact that now with near uh, protocol you're 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 starting to focus on the multi-chain uh, infrastructure for everyone let's say and be it becomes global it potentially can become very global thing right how do you essentially make um, actions that are f i'm talking about the front end on chain how do you make signless um, uh, every action? Because right now on near.org and near horizon platform, you still have to sign every action you make on the website. So what are your thoughts on that too? Thank you so much. So 
Um, I'll ask your second question first, and then I may, you may have to ask me your first question again because I will have likely forgotten it. No, the, why would you want to pay for things across different chains? The reason is that, first of all, generally, applications that are trying to bootstrap users on any chain would be happy to pay their users gas, gas costs at the very start. So likely, you're, if you are paying in sweat on this chain, sweat will not actually be paying anything on the other end. The application developer will likely be paying a large portion of the cost. So the people are incentivized on the other chain side to take very low fees and effectively pay their own gas fees, provided it's civil resistant. Um, secondly, it's ease of use. Uh, if, you, if you are going around, you have an application, it's easier to get hold of one token rather than manage 40 different balances of 40 different chains. So generally, I believe, even if Near was taking, uh, even if the token issue was taking a 25% cut, the ease of switching would be such that it'd be, most people would uh, they'd be better off just using one token. But we allow you to select the token you pay for things with. So we, just, we make a decision, you know, if, it's, if you are doing something on Ethereum and you have Ethereum inside your account, we will generally, unless someone is willing to pay for you, we would generally prefer that you use the Ethereum. Then we'll look at sort of the next most expensive one and the next most expensive one, the next most expensive one. Um, the second part of your question was about signing on the front end. You are completely correct. So generally the signing process is relatively quick. Um, on its own, it takes currently about uh, 240 milliseconds if the nodes are relatively close to each other. So it's slightly less painful than what we currently have right now. But you would have to go through a round of consensus which is 0.7 seconds on, side, on, the, on top of the NIRS blockchain on top of that. So we're talking about roughly a one second interaction. This is imperfect. But when you look at the speed of other chains, it's going to be a very, very small part of the latency of the total action, we believe. There are some fast ones like Solana, but generally it's going to be relatively acceptable, we think, but imperfect. We do not have the ability to do effectively limited access fees. So what you could do is you could have uh, a signature on chain that you receive and then you do a key derivation on top of that using the sort of encrypted protocol. Uh, I'd have to think about it more. We can maybe talk about it afterwards. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting a bit into the weeds. Yeah, so thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, to me, all this sounds revolutionary and not only for near ecosystem, but for other like Ethereum or any other chain, right? Well, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, and I also like DA, all the announcements that we got yesterday, like to me it seems it is as promising for us as it is for other chains. So my question is, what are you guys doing in order to, you know, spread the word about all this amazing stuff to Ethereum people, right? To say, come here and do all this beautiful stuff. Thank so you. So in my opinion, Ethereum is a very hard nut to crack and it wouldn't be where I'd start. Right now what we're doing is we're going out and we're talking to as many other L1s as possible about partnerships. And we have had very, very positive responses from some which I can't name right now, um, basically saying, look, we don't want to do what you do well. You guys are fabulous at your niche. You know, if you're a Bitcoin L2, you are the best at transferring Bitcoin, you're the best at Bitcoin DeFi. But we're pretty good at onboarding. How about we, you use us for onboarding and we'll use you for your sort of Bitcoin L2 thing. And I haven't come across an L1 yet that thinks that's a bad idea. All of us realize we need to focus on what we're good at. And I think we're gonna really, I hope we're gonna see some really great partnerships come out at the start of March because it shouldn't, this is not just near, this is a whole blockchain thing. All right, well, thanks so much for having me and thanks for listening. <laughs>
and I'm here to talk about uh, data and analytics. The first thing I wanted to tell you about is how I picture or imagine blockchains. And I really see blockchains as public libraries with open doors, right? Information is here, ready to be collected. Whether this information is, you know, raw, directly, directly extracted from the blockchain, or turned into a more human readable content. And that could be a widget, like you see here, or that could be, you know, charts or even text based information. So this is an example of a DAO uh, proposal that has been approved. And as a builder, sometimes you may want to have raw information because you can extract everything from it. But sometimes you want to have sim something simple that allows uh, your users to just grasp the information uh, at once. For builders, there is one thing I believe which is very important, is that the more information you accumulate, the more opportunities you create. And this is not coming from me. I stole that from Billy Walters, who is allegedly one of the most successful gamblers in the history of sport betting. And he started his career uh, in the 70s as, well, the best used car salesman in Kentucky. And he told us that basically was collecting every single information about his competitors. Looking at a specific neighborhood, he knew that those people were willing to sell their cars in the next three months. And obviously, he became the most successful gamblers because he was collecting 50 plus data points on every single match, right? From pitch condition to weather, to, you know, if the team, how far the team uh, traveled before to get to this place, etc. But he was evolving in a traditional market where information is broken into pieces, not easily accessible, and painful to reconcile. Uh, another example to illustrate that is obviously accounting frameworks. In Europe, we have IFRS rules. In the US, we have US GAAP. And it's often painful to reconcile that. Obviously, on the blockchain-based market, information is easily accessible, more standardized. You have a transfer. Well, what are those attributes? They are all the same. A sender, a receiver, amount, and type of token, right? But it's not fully standardized. You might have different approaches to solve the same problem. Look at a swap, for example. So that's the reason why I didn't write uh, fully standardized. And obviously, information is immutable. You can cheat. You can trick the data. But if there is one thing you must take out of this presentation, is that there is zero excuse to not accumulate information in this market. And the common thing with Billy Walters is that you, be to, you need to be a hustler. You need to want this information. It's not coming to you, right? So, but back to his time, that was like fucking painful. But in a blockchain-based market, it's easier. Now, for builders, you often go through three main phases, right? Ideation. Is the problem I'm solving painful enough that people will care about? Is the problem growing? And then you build, and then obviously you unveil. You go to market, and potentially you adapt, right? Uh, depending on the market's reaction. I don't like the term scale, because sometimes you want to solve a problem for a very tiny community. You don't necessarily need to scale. But in every single journey, you might have challenges, surprises, and you might encounter serendipity, right? Which is a fantastic thing. One of the best examples is Christopher Columbus, who set sail to discover Asian lands, but ended up discovering America. Another example is post-it notes. The founder wanted to create super strong adhesive, but ended up creating a weak one. And a colleague you know, raised his hand and saw a potential for a bookmark. Um, and 
that would be, you know, that would stick to a page but could be removed easily. And if you want to foster serendipity, again, you want to have a lot of variables in what you are doing. And again, the more you accumulate information, the more opportunities you create. But the key question here is, what's your market? Who are your competitors on the blockchain? How many users do they have? What's their uh, spending behaviors, right? Do they use ABC before using your product, for example? Or, yeah, how much uh, they spend on your competitor's product? You want to know about that. And obviously, once you are live, you want to let the world know how well or not you are performing, right? You want to know how many users are using your products, if they come back, obviously. And then you want to monitor everything, right? Oh, there's a wave of 100 transactions. They are failed transactions with very weird parameters. Maybe you want to look at that. Or there's a transfer of 10 million out of your contract, if there's 10 million uh, initially, but you might want to look at that. So you need to, uh, yeah, you, you need to have the whole uh, things um, to look at in your project. Speaking of near, what does that mean, right? Well, how big is the knowledge base? How big is, you know, in how much can you leverage information? Well, you have 30 million plus accounts that have already executed half a billion transactions. And if you want to deploy a Web 2.5 company, then you have basically the best examples right now with Sweat Economy and Keqing, right? But the great thing is, only looking at the blockchain again, you can understand their operating models, right? This wallet is managing this kind of thing. Another wallet is doing this. And then all of a sudden, you've mapped out the, enti the entire operational stack of the largest Web 2.5 uh, project within the entire ecosystem. Um, also, the knowledge stack is getting more substance, right? This is only on near. You have many verticals, and we've tagged over 2,000 addresses. And you're doing an NFT project? You should pay attention to those projects and to those contracts. What's their approach to solve the same problem you have, right? Maybe there is something you can take out of that. Maybe there is something you can copy, right? You look at socials, well, you have near social, obviously. But Popular, who has, which has been launched recently, has a completely different approach to solve also how community grows, right? So you might want to look at that. And obviously, over 100 uh, DeFi contracts. So again, you have zero excuse to not accumulate information if you are building on a blockchain-based market. Finally, context matters because Let's say you look at a, you know, you have a project, you look at this user who has been interacting like every day. Well, okay, this is cool information, but what else? Well, actually this user is the largest user in terms of spending in your ecosystem. So you want to understand and you want to give substance to, uh, you know, context around your transactions because that really matters. You don't want to end up like this dog chasing its own tail. You don't want to end up in circles. It's amusing, but it's unproductive, right? So context is really important. Oh, yeah. Thank you. So if you have any questions, uh, I would be very happy uh, to take those questions. I will head to the community HQ afterwards. Um, I have a booth, so if you are building on here and if you want to uh, yeah, know everything about data and analytics or how can you leverage uh, our tech stack, then please feel free to get in touch with me. Okay, if there is any question, uh, any questions? Otherwise, we can move on to the next talk, and you can find DDA just around the corner.
Awesome. Um, next up, please welcome Jordan Gray from Heroes Build. Let's see. There we go. Yeah, this works. Awesome. Y'all are heroes for showing up, first of all. You made it. Give yourself a pat on the back. Yeah, let's go. So okay. if you're here, you probably already know what Heroes is. But just in case you don't, Heroes is a bounty platform. It's streamlining bounties end to end. And there are a few key important things that it does um, that separates it from other bounty systems. And those are highlighted for easy reference. Uh, there's escrow. So when you put funds into the system, they're escrowed. It builds trust on both sides. Uh, invoicing is built in. So if you're running a business and you need invoices, all of that is automatic. Um, we have optional KYC. If you're somebody like Foundation and you need to disperse funds only to non-sanctioned countries, then the KYC is important. And it all winds up allowing people to run real businesses using blockchain technology and be tax compliant. That was a lot of words. In less words, we bring together the funders and the hunters. It's a two-sided marketplace. And these are our users. If we're talking product, these are our, um, our, our two personas, is people that have money to do funding. And that could be a DAO. It could be an individual. It could be a regular old corporation. Um, and then the hunters, the, the people who are available to do work. And um, if we're talking about these kind of two personas, and we want to focus really on being successful with one of them and making journeys good for one of them, which when you're working on products, you have to do. You have to make a choice about what's important. I want to focus on funders and looking at what Heroes does to make things really easy for funders. And don't worry, there's still some call to action for hunters, so you'll have some earning opportunities later. But let's look at funders and what Heroes does to make it great. Um, the big problem for funders or people with money in general is that delegation is hard. And this is not a Web3 problem. This is just a universal problem. It's hard to pass work off to somebody. It requires trust. It requires having your finances in order beforehand. So if you're in a corporation, that means talking to your manager and having funds released so that you can go and do your thing. Um, and then it's always deadlines. Things are too late. It's always too late. So these are just like issues that exist with delegation that we can solve by using systems that are streamlined for allowing people to easily delegate work. So that's what we're trying to solve for funders, is just this whole issue of delegation is gnarly. How do we do that? Four simple steps. Um, you, you connect. You've got to have a wallet. That's kind of the first thing uh, in Web3 is you connect your wallet. Um, and then you post a bounty. And then somebody fills the bounty. And then you P-A-Y, the bounty. <laughs> um, and it's, it's that simple. So if, if we want to go into a little bit more detail and see in the user journey kind of like how that plays out between the hunter and the funder, we got the purses up here, which are the funder, so your DAO or your corporation or whatever. And then the bows represent the hunters. And you create the task. So with this. Um, I always recommend using AI for doing this step, because if you describe your problem to AI and it comes back and it doesn't understand it, then it's really rare that a, another person is going to understand your problem. So just working with AI to really define your task well. Um, and then there's the claim step. So if creating is kind of like putting out an RFP or saying like, hey, we've got this work that we need somebody to do, when a hunter comes along and claims it, then they're saying, I want to be able to start this work then the funder delegates. They say, yes, you're allowed to do this work after they check them out and are like, your profile is filled out. You're an actual real person. You're not just going to scam me. Then they say, yes, you can go do the work. And that's the delegation step. And then after the work all happens, the hunter submits it. And then the funder verifies it. And then you repeat and repeat and repeat. So once you've gotten this kind of flow down and you're used to doing it with your work, 
then more and more things start to make sense as doing bounties, and you start thinking more about how to right-size work to get the hunters to be successful at contributing to whatever you're trying to get done. And having all of that in place means that we're able to do things like run all of the official NIRCON bounties through heroes. And if you want links uh, for any of the slides, just go to linkstack slash at heroes. And you don't have to try and remember all the URLs and stuff. Just hit up the link stack. And in addition to the official bounties that are on dev post, we're also doing a bunch of side bounties with people. Um, some of those are on near social, so that's the long link there in the QR code. And then other ones are with all of the partners. And some of these are partners that we've met here at the conference, and we've already published bounties with them. Some of them are folks we've been talking to forever. Some of them, like Near Week, is the reason that Heroes even exists, because Near Week has been used for bounties um, in the ecosystem for months. Um, so go check out all the bounties. Every time you look at it, there's going to be more bounties. Uh, that's, that's the deal. And then all of those are kind of like different um, use cases. So like Assister is an AI company, and they've got a bounty out where if you get an answer back from the AI, you can post it to Stack Overflow and show that you're like helping make the AI system better. And they get people, the hunters, get paid out bounties for that. With New Week, people get paid for submitting news. Um, there's a button and dice game where if you teach somebody a game, teach to earn, you can get a bounty. So there's all these different use cases for how bounties can be um, used. And that's kind of the go-to-market, is right now we're focused really on near ecosystem, making sure this works for the people who are close to us. And then as we get that right and we've got everything like end-to-end -end great, then we can expand to be more accepting of like other crypto-native projects, and then eventually just take over the whole global freelance market because it's more efficient and better than anything else out there. Numbers go up. And I mentioned Near Week earlier, and this is really what was the genesis for Heroes. Near Week on AstroDAO has over 9,000 bounties completed. And those are, that's been happening, like, yeah, <laughs> so many bounties. And after having that be successful, um, that was kind of like a proof of concept that it was necessary that something like this could work decided to build some software from scratch that actually makes that process streamlined, end-to-end. -end, and there's the built-in kind of marketing use case, like people come to Near Week for marketing using this bounty system. Near Week is able to efficiently provide those services. And then we're looking at like kind of the next use cases of like, what do developers need? What do technical teams need? What are the different like uh, personas that we can really make this perfect for end-to-end? -end? And we've got heroes build bounties too, so um, go check those out. There's a lot of different prizes. Kudam, put these together. Let's go. Go earn, go earn. Okay, this is the like one more thing moment. Steve Jobs style, like, oh, there are zero fees for, for yeah. <laughs> for the um, for NearCon, we have removed fees entirely from the system, so there's no excuses to either put a bounty up or to go hunt a bounty. Um, we're not taking anything. We're just helping people, public good style, um, get work done in a more efficient way. So no excuses. Go sign up. Um, you just go to Heroes Build Bounties, and you can sign up with either GitHub or an email address. And then you connect your wallet, and then you can go do bounties. If you run into any trouble, um, we've got a Git book, which kind of goes through the process of how to like make a bounty um, end to end. And it also has some like facts and things like that in there. So if you get stuck, that's the first place to check. If you're still stuck, hit up our Telegram community where we've got hundreds of people who are on both sides of that equation, the funder hunter equation, um, ready to answer any questions or anything that you've got. And if you're really interested in getting a bounty up, something like that, reach out to me. We'll figure it out if you want to just brainstorm what your bounty could look like. Um, totally happy to do that kind of thing. Grab some calendar time with me. Hit me up on Telegram, wherever, and we'll get it off the ground. And that's, that's it. That's heroes. <laughs> Any questions? Grab a shard dog. Like, yeah.
I don't know if we actually do questions or not. <laughs> Are there any questions? Everybody knows what Heroes is now? We're good. Awesome. Thanks so much for introducing us to Heroes. Um, and next up, we are going to hear from Eric. Um, and uh, Eric, Nelson, Julia, and Gus are navigating the future of work in the Web3 era. Please have a seat. Smart as well. Oh, in your eyes. Have like smart. A, okay. All right. Hi, everyone. So welcome to the uh, next panel. Uh, my name is uh, Gus. Uh, I work with, uh, with Jordan from Heroes, as you can see, that uh, was just descending, and also uh, founder of uh, New Week. Uh, so we have, as all of these panelists, been experimenting a lot uh, about what are these new technologies, blockchain being, of course, uh, one of them, uh, changing the way we work um, and, and really like reflecting on this. And this panel will, will be the main focus. Uh, before we kick it off, we'd love to also hear an intro from, uh, from you guys. So maybe Julia, you want to start? Yeah, sure. Thanks for the heads up. Uh, hi guys, my name is Julia. I'm HR director at Inc4. We do blockchain development and consulting, and also I do some consulting on my own for the HR direction. Uh, I manage a team of 100 developers, which was a team of 10 developers when I just came. So we've been through some scaling processes. We've been through some Web3 related changes. We've been s through like setting up all the operations inside and. I feel like there is a lot of stuff that we're missing from Web2 just because we have this weird feeling about claiming that that's the past, the past is bad, we've like survived that, let's forget that. We should actually transform stuff from that, our experience, and use it in the modern world, in modern team, and follow these new rules that would be created by the experience we've received. So uh, my main approach here when we're talking about the future of work in the Web3 era is follow the rules, but create your own rules based on the experience other companies, other like markets are giving to you. Uh, in our case, it would be about creating the politics that will enhance your um, skills and your talents, and they will help you automate stuff you do not want to deal with. So it will save time, save your emotions, and it will help you to create new technologies that are really, really needed on the market. Thank, Thank you very you. much. And very in interesting stuff. I will definitely make sure we touch on, on some of those. Sure. Um, Eric, I know you have a very long uh, <laughs> history, basically, experience in, in work from also serving as a C CEO from a very large uh, enterprise. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, Please tell a bit you. about yourself. And Thank and you for uh, reminding me that <laughs> yeah. I'm the oldest in the room. <laughs> the most <laughs> experienced <laughs> one. <laughs> Let's point out. So my name is Eric Abensur. I'm today an executive coach. Uh, I've been managing business in the past. I was CEO of technology and telecom business, mainly in the UK and the US. And uh, for the last uh, seven, eight years, I've been uh, an executive coach. Uh, and uh, I work mainly with uh, young leaders and co-founders not only in technology, but mainly in technology, and specifically for the last uh, few years, uh, uh, thanks to NIA Foundation and the uh, NIA ecosystem, I've been able to work with many uh, uh, leaders in the Web3. And uh, as you have uh, uh, reminded everyone, uh, I have a long experience, so <laughs> I remember the Web1, I remember the Web2, and uh, I'm so pleased to be part of the Web3. And, um, what I discussed with uh, some of you uh, a little bit earlier, 
have remembered the mistakes we made uh, at the time of the Web 1, Web 2, when we will make a number of promises that were quite identical of the promises of the Web 3, about decentralization, about transparency, about openness. And uh, I want to make sure, and that's what I would like to do uh, with uh, Web3 leaders, they help them make sure that we don't make the same mistakes than in the past and we create a better world. That's Thank awesome. you very much. Yeah, please, Nelson. Go yeah, on. sure. So my name is Nelson. I am, amongst other things, the global head of HR for Gate.io. We are a centralized exchange. Um, for, for the few of you who might not know, on the side, I also advise and I consult for Web3 startups. This means that I work with Web3 founders and leadership teams to do everything from developing HR processes, people management, vision, and strategy as well. And I also sit on the advisory board for two uh, Web3 growth platforms and a couple of uh, VCs as well, which allocate me to uh, Web3 projects on their rosters. So I support and I contact a lot directly with founders and so on, uh, helping them take their people vision from uh, zero to one. On both these scopes, uh, we are often confronted with what is, what will the future of work look like in Web3? What does the present of work look like in Web3? For sure, at gate.io, we do our best. Uh, and I would say the bulk of our job is to educate leaders in what it means to decentralize, to distribute work, to hone and to manage people in a way that is truthful to the, answer, to the essence of Web3 and decentralization. And actually, we were just having a conversation a few minutes ago. I hope we get to touch on that. How often issues that come up with product and with delivery in Web3, you can trace them back to the preparedness or lack of from the leaderships and managing people in a decentralized way, but still very often concepts like distributed and decentralization get mixed up and confused. So I would say there's uh, underneath the surface of many, many issues that we all know Web3 has, there is a people solution in there. And I do hope we get to touch on some of those topics today here. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point that uh, Nelson is making. Uh, some Sometimes, if not often, there's a confusion between having leadership and having a, a vertical organization. And clearly, the mistakes that we have experienced in the past is we have implemented organization very verticalized. And therefore, we ended up what we have today, which is uh, an internet controlled by four or five organizations. I think it's possible to... Uh, deliver the promise of the Web3 and to have within those organizations of the Web3, your organization, a more decentralized type of organization while having a leadership. And that's that conflict that seems to be obvious actually is not a conflict and can be successful. And actually a number of organizations, non-web related, like Pentagonia, have created very flat type of organization where everyone is very much accountable to each other, owning their task and creating a very successful organization. I don't really agree with you, by the way, on this one. Uh, I don't know, did you notice, but lots of companies right now, the ones I'm talking to, they tend to decrease the number of management and they move uh, forward like more responsibility to some uh, employees on their, they will like, find the piece of work, piece of process they're responsible for, and they will be like kind of managing it, but it's not the exact like work of management. It's the whole process when you kind of pay attention to it and you feel the responsibility and it might uh, um, affect your decisions in future based on this work. So lots of companies try to decrease the management costs and times for the management and move to more responsible workers that are actually interested in the success of the whole company. Yeah, it's, it's exactly that. So uh, we, we, and we still have today uh, the role of the manager being in some way the one who decides of everything, decide of the technical choice, decide of the performance review, there to resolve conflict, while actually some of those tasks can be uh, spread out across the organization and have another group of people resolving conflict. 
making the technical decision by another group of people and reducing, as you said, the number of managers having a more flatter organization. So uh, zooming, zooming a bit out and, and reflecting on like the future of work in, in Web3, I think it's, it's, it's fas interesting to hear a bit, bit about and frame the discussion around uh, what is the big paradigm shift here? What constitutes this new paradigm shift to work environments we have had in the past? Uh, obviously, we should not go through the whole human history, uh, but I think we can agree that there has been certain tendencies, different uh, technologies converge, the educational level, interconnectedness, what the internet has provided has already changed a lot. And now we have suddenly this uh, public good type of generalized computer that you can deploy small programs on, smart contracts. You still have a lot of data that is uh, off-chain, that you're doing uh, regular interactions that is not on the chain. But if you also are working these tool, using these tools in your work process, you also begin to have a lot of on-chain data as well. Uh, and, and what I've seen, many different crypto projects approach that a bit differently. What is the on-chain thing they're looking at? What is the off-chain thing? Um, to incentivize organizations or try to you know, look differently at the at managerial uh, vertical organization. So yeah, I just, I know that's a, that's, that's a lot, but I've, I just specifically like, for example, from you, Nelson, like what, give some examples on how, how do you approach this today and, and like what, what are we actually doing uh, with this stuff and, and yeah, how do you view this? For sure. So like so much <laughs> in Web3, I believe there's a huge long tail between what we can do today and what is actually being provided to people as a solution. And also in the job market, I think this will have numerous applications. First of all, let's take the front of um, the job search, for example. I honestly, I wish I had the time, uh, but I don't know what's stopping somebody today from starting a job marketplace in which everybody's CV there is an NFT, where you get paid symbolically for your data, for your information. Every time a company wants to get your experience, they go on there, they pay you whatever, a fraction of a cent of a Satoshi, whatever you want. It's not for you to get rich off of it, but at least the principle of the job search is closer to the principle of decentralization in Web3, in which you get paid for your data instead of some recruitment agency getting paid 15, 20, 25, 30% of your gross annual salary so that you guys can get hired and their job is basically to promote a handshake, you know? So the very basic principles, I think, of how we apply decentralization, even before we zoom into how this is applied in uh, people management, yes, not everybody here for sure uh, wants or, or will manage people in, in an organization, but everybody here at some point will look for a job. So there is a huge base of the pyramid where we can apply decentralization processes in the future, the present, if you will, of uh, the workforce, of the future of work. And so many opportunities are out there uh, just waiting for somebody to grab them. And it seems like it's just another reflection of one of the biggest issues in Web3 in which everybody's always so focused on the next big thing, the, the bleeding edge. I have these conversations with VCs often. Uh, the money is all pushed towards the tip of the sword and nobody's looking behind to see the technology we have today, how can it be applied to so many people, you know? So this is one. And then briefly, zooming into uh, the work within the organizations, I would say that to the exception of DAOs, there's really no other type of organization that is competently applying the principles of automation, decentralization, using smart contracts as rule definition so that every one of us can work more effectively and then in a more distributed way as well. We were talking about the future of work and what that will look like. One thing I'm willing to wager, and just to make a bridge to what we were just discussing, is there's always such a discussion around, will jobs survive the future of work? Where there will, will we have jobs, quote unquote, in the future of work? I'm sure we will. One thing I'm not so sure will survive the future of work is the job of a manager, yes? I think Web3 will pave the way for lessons that very quickly uh, Web2 and other industries will learn from to integrate in their own industries. And I think at a faster rate, we will see jobs be extinguished. We will see manager roles be extinguished before the more 
because the more you automate and, and implement smart contract-like protocols in other industries, such as Web2 or others, the more you will find that the need for a manager becomes smaller and smaller. And this is something you're already preparing for at gate.io. Uh, and I'm happy to discuss this as well if anybody wants some hints outside. Thank you very much, Nelson. Do you want to follow up? Yes, yeah, so uh, that's where I would disagree. So uh, I would agree on the end goal. I really believe uh, it's possible over time to remove the management layer. Hmm. However, I don't believe that would be only through technology that that would happen. <coughs> the reality is still today and over time, we are still dealing with human beings, meaning that we have uh, personality trait, culture, education, all different. We have bias, we have insecurities. That's what makes uh, the organization difficult to implement a decentralized type of organization where everyone is accountable. That's why there is a number of skills that are required, and there are those soft skills. We know them, we've been trying to implement them, but they are difficult, and from my personal point of view, they are absolutely necessary to implement if you want to implement those smart contract technology and the end of management. And those skills is, first of all, self-awareness. I need to understand all the bias that I have. I need to understand what energizes me and what drains me. I need to be a great listener. I need to be able to manage difficult conversation and conflict because conflict and difficult conversation are necessary in an organization in order to create commitment and accountability. And those so three skills, self-awareness, active listening, and uh, being able to provide feedback and having those difficult conversations, you n won't be able to replace them through technology. So, yes, but have those skills. And that's really something that uh, I think all of us, whether we work in an organization as a manager or as an individual contributor, or simply as a human being, should master. I really like this perspective, but do you think these qualities, they're still as important as it is in Web3 when everyone is working basically online, everyone in their random places, and all the communication is basically some texts and emails? I mean, AI works perfectly for replying a in a very polite way to something that pisses you off, you know? So you just can ask AI to reply in a way you want it to be and do not really think on how to propose something, how to... I don't know, put your mind in it. So, maybe I'm old and uh, <laughs> I'm with those uh, old uh, uh, concept of uh, soft skill, etc. But yes, on the contrary, I would say that the more you work in a remote type of environment, the more as a human being, we make up stories. What yeah. is he really doing? Why she's not calling me? Why didn't me involve in that meeting? Why, etc. Why, why, why? So. And theref therefore, more communication, more effective communication are essential to really create uh, the culture that you want to have in your organization. And those three skills that, again and again, I believe every human being should master. And you think that in school, the teachers had to calculate, had to code, had to talk, uh, but they don't listen, they don't teach us how to listen. I think that's pretty. Uh, I would say. So those three skills, self-awareness, active listening, and how to manage difficult conversation are essential to implement, I think, the promise of the Web3. May I just add uh, just another yeah, thought? Sure. Um, I fully agree with what you said in terms of the, the human skills needed um, today from managers, from everybody working, even in Web3. I would, however, bet, uh, or taking from the... the what I see in my, my usual practice, this need for the humanization of the workspace and therefore the need for people practices in the workspace, it will become less and less significant, I believe, over time. Uh, and we see this even, uh, whether with the projects I work with or at Gate, more and more, especially the younger generations coming in to the job market, they're not asking about the communication style in a company. 
They're not asking about the leadership style. They're not asking about what's the culture like. They're asking about what's the tech stack like? What's the communication tools that you guys use? What are the resource sharing tools or the project management tools you guys use? More and more, especially from Web3 or remote native audiences, I get the feedback that people regard work as a place not to bond or to grow or develop, but as a place to work. And that's okay. We try to promote some um, online gathering event or some buddy system for onboarding, and people tell me, I would rather just spend time having real beers with real people in my neighborhood, or, you know, let me set you up with a great course for you to learn this skill. And the reply is, my university is Discord or Reddit, or, or I have online people who do this for me. So there's also this dehumanization of the workplace from the younger generations coming into the workplace. And whereas a lot of my HR colleagues tend to see this as an existential threat to HR, uh, I think we should roll with it and say, and that's okay. And that, that's fine if people come to work for work. Our priority should be to meet expectations, not to impose what our expectations are of what people, what we think people want, because then is when we will run into this existential wall where we will have this um, HR uh, stubbornness where we're trying to revive a dead body who's not responding because we're not giving them what they want. So to the extent that today people still require exactly this humanization and these skills of management in the workplace, I fully agree. However, I have a big question mark in regards to, not even if, but how long it'll take until, until this kind of dwindles and the workplace is a much more colder, dehumanized, uh, and just robotic uh, uh, environment. And again, if we get there, that's okay. I'm not particularly concerned. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have a lot of thoughts around what you guys are talking about, so I'll just like take one uh, from, from the beginning. So I really like the like specific soft skills you talk about, Eric, um, and I think how I view an organization, you know, any organization, whether it's a country or a small startup, is, is, you know, you need to have some purpose, right? The clue uh, and the purpose, you know, there's a certain amount of what's, what's right and wrong there, et cetera. And, and how I think about, you know, small startup, that of course comes often from like a, a founder team, managerial, like embedding that, hopefully also like leading by example, <laughs> uh, if, if, if it's working well. Uh, and I see with smart contracts and DAOs a tendency that some of these soft skills, either in like the, w the, the way the process, work process is organized, there are certain like, you know, responsibility and certain obligations, et cetera, use rights. Um, but you also have some of the same kind of values but coded into like HR policies in a, in a DAO. So I've, I, I sometimes have seen like these soft skills still exist, uh, but it's less person-driven suddenly because it was more like the founding fathers of the smart contract that, that did that. Um, and, and I see like in like blockchain, in the beginning it was all about uh, first narrative at least, like uh, trustless, right? Trustless tech. Uh, maybe you need to trust the developers or maybe you, you know, trust the code if you, or the developers that say they understand the code if you cannot verify it yourself. So I think we switch more to like ver verifiability as, as, as like but at the same time, trust in humans interactions is, is everything, right? That, that is the like, soft skill that makes everything glue. So I just, how, how do you guys see that? Like, what is, how does trust play a role? Something fundamental trust in a, in a Web3 area in terms of like, yeah. You know, I guess uh, for the first time we've faced that at uh, COVID era, when uh, we first started working online from home, from whatever place you're at, and uh, there was a stigma that if something goes wrong when you switch to working online, it's because you have bad managers. Uh, I don't think that's completely true. Like something is wrong in your politics system approach, etc. but it's not the manager, it's mostly the employees as well. So you have to uh, cherish the employees they, that don't come just for work. So it's a whole different uh, approach about motivation types and stuff, but People who just come for money, they won't uh, try working hard for your business, for your success, for your team's success. They will just think about their own success. So 
trusting someone is hard and usually um, <laughs> it gets people fail you. Uh, that's quite common stuff, but uh, you have to be as transparent as possible with them. That's the only thing that helps. You have to set clear goals, clear expectations. What do you want them to achieve? What do you want to achieve with their help? That is what's important. And with that, you can like see problems secure much earlier. And that's the only thing that helps, yeah. as I think. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, Gus, you're absolutely right, and uh, Julia, you're absolutely right. Trust is the essential. You must have a very good coach, uh, Gus. Um, so uh, <laughs> I think it's it's essential because with trust, I come back to those difficult conversations that we need to have in an organization. Um, I have the uh, privilege to uh, coach uh, co-founders of a, a young startup, uh, and as soon as they raise money, immediately <laughs> challenge is taking place. And, and uh, I do coach them uh, at the same time in the same room, like a couple therapy. <laughs> and it's exactly the same challenge. Is, uh, we have to build trust. We have to make sure that we have right communication, that when there is a, a, a conflict, and there will be conflict. That's necessary. That's it's human uh, uh, being. So we need to have those conversations so there is the commitment and then there is the accountability. So trust is absolutely critical. There are techniques to build trust uh, and, uh, and they are necessary if you want to make your organization successful. For sure, you need a great product, <laughs> you need a great technology, but the history of uh, startup is founders have been able to work together through the difficulty of product delivery, product fit, pivoting, fundraising, and uh, the one who have been able to be successful is the one who have been able to have those difficult conversations. 100%, and also from working with, um, hmm. okay, so l let me be the advocate for Skynet here again, yeah. <laughs> so more and more also, and again, agreed that trust is a key absolute key uh, concept and skill for, um, for founders, more and more, especially with younger founders, and maybe because knowing how to trust is not a very well honed skill because you have to know how to trust, not just trust blindly. Um, I might send some of them your way because they would benefit from having <laughs> Eric uh, 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 shaping them and helping them uh, in honing their skills, but more and more, I see founders having a bias towards trusting protocol rather than trusting people. So can we smart contract our way out of this? Can we run this as a Taoist Frankenstein um, so that I have to trust people less and trust code more? And again here, I go back to undeniably trust and, and these skills we're debating are major today. Um, question mark, will the dependency from these skills decrease over time? I think so. Because again, the trends that I see, um, and here I stand on the fence a little bit, but I see founders, and again, it's okay. This isn't good or bad, it's what it is. But I see founders having a bias towards trusting protocol rather than people, building success despite of people instead of in favor of people, and building also their process and their products in a way that's people-proof, in the sense that is failure or success will not come from the people in a project, will come from the coding and, and the protocols embedded in the project. So 100% today, we talk about leadership, we talk about rolling out product and developing uh, startups in Web3, very still people-focused. Is this the trend to maintain and stabilize over the future, yes or no? Or will in a couple of years, we will be talking about this people-focused or culture-centric approach as a legacy approach in Web3? I don't know, but we'll be here to check it out. Uh, but again, if it turns out that we're building companies to be culture-proof and people-proof, uh, much to the dismay of HR, then it's okay. And that's how we have to roll with it. So this is just another instance where I'm not sure 
if the reality and the needs we discussed today will be the reality and the needs that we will be discussing later on. Uh, and maybe in a couple of years, we'll be talking about embedding culture in the smart contract rather than in the people. And at the very least, it'll be fun to watch. So I still have two years of work. <laughs> or as many as you want. Uh, I mean, how fast can you learn how to code? <laughs> oh, God. Thank you very much. Uh, we are getting close to the end of this uh, very interesting panel. Uh, I just want to ask you in the end, Julia. Um, sure. If you were hack like participating for the first time at this hackathon, you were interested in industry, you want to like get into it and also prepare yourself for, for like the Web3 future of work, how, what are some advices you could give people? How would you, how would you see it? Uh, I guess the main advice would be talk. Talk to people, talk about what you do. Like, you have to sell yourself and listen to people what is going on on the market. It's not about the like business, money and stuff. It's also about skills. You never know which uh, mix of skills is unique. And it sells you. Uh, you have to explain to people that you're unique. You will show them you can give something that they don't have. That's like only about being something people want to have. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, thanks to all of you guys. And I enjoyed talking to you. Thank you very much. Thanks and for having uh, us. Thanks, everyone. Have a great conference. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Let's, let's continue talking. Thank you. All right. For the next talk that we have coming up, I'm very excited about this one, is learning how to go from zero to 10,000 users. Please welcome Wilson to the stage. Green goes forward, red goes back. All right, all right, can you guys hear me okay? Beautiful. Is anyone, is anyone, hands up if you guys are founders here. Hands up, beautiful, only one. Anyone else building products out there? Are you guys building products? Not yet, okay. You still should pay attention because traction is everything. Whether you want to bootstrap, fundraise, whatever the case may be, this is super important for you. Um, so for context, I'm gonna be sharing with you a project that we're building called the Fun Pass. And as an example, not to shill, not to anything, nothing to sell. The Fun Pass is a loyalty rewards platform for Metaverse players, such as Roblox, Sandbox, Minecraft, and the likes. And we basically help put brands and these Metaverse players together. Now, as I was saying, it is super critical for you guys, whether you guys are bootstrapping or fundraising, to have your traction. Very critical. Number one is that it shows real interest in your product, not just an idea that you have that you think is super cool sitting in a dorm, but it's things that people are willing to pay for. And that's really the critical point. And that's the reason why we must have the metrics to show for that. And second of all, it is that you're not just all talk, that you have a team to help you execute, that you're capable to be able to execute. And that's the reason why traction is so, so important. And um, yeah, any questions so far? As an investor, they wanna be able to lower their perceived risks. When they see traction, they feel like it's lower perceived risk. They feel that you are a team that is capable. And that's what we wanna be able to prove. Uh, so to make sure that your time is well spent here and that you guys are not just on your phones, share with you the traction that we have. We launched on July 13th of this year, uh, more than 10,000 MAU, more than 100,000 on-chain transactions so far, more than 3 million in social platforms, view-wise. Winner of the Founders Showcase in Blockchain Futurist, and one of the top five partners of this ecosystem. And that's the reason why we were invited to come and share some of the tricks and strategies that we have employed to you guys. Cool? Any questions so far? No? Nope. Okay, let's go. So this is a six-step journey that we have broken down for you guys. Break down the user journey, fail fast and smart, assemble an all-star team, gather facts, not assumptions, show, don't tell, and I'm gonna show you guys the real journey behind this entire project. Number one, breaking down the user journey. This is like truly the foundation of any type of attraction. You must know 
the entire process of this user journey. It gives you the clear clarity on the goal that you're trying to achieve. As much as you want to get users, there are different types of the journey that you focus on different things, which requires different tactics. Second of all, it allows you to understand which levers to push and pull, distinguishing between the signal and the noise. So many times, we get lost on something that seems like a crazy opportunity. But later on, when we look back at this user journey, we realize that, you know what? It's actually noise. It's actually bogus. Waste of my time and resources. So to break down the user journey, we break it down into a funnel model. Top of funnel, mi middle of the funnel, bottom of the funnel. The first part of the funnel is really to get people's attention all the way to a user or even a paying customer. So as we divide this funnel up, the top of the funnel is to showcase how people are finding out their pro your product. Users at this stage, they don't know that they have this problem. They're starting to be aware that, oh, I might be having this problem. I might want to have a solution to this. And so it is your job to be able to capture their attention at this current stage. And that's the goal. The middle of the funnel represents how are you engaging with this potential users. Now that you have their attention, it's your job to be able to provide education, to bring them value, ultimately to, de to develop this trust and this bond that you are the ultimate solution. And lastly, bottom of the funnel, how do we convert this into a paying user? When it comes down to it, at this point in time, your users has all the metrics they need. They have all the data that they need. Now it is time for us to tip that scale, to bribe them. And we always, I'm going to show you some tips and tricks on how you can bribe them. Any questions so far? Nope, good, good, nice. So as an example of what I'm, uh, I'm sharing just now, Part of our goal with the Fun Pass was to be able to help one of our clients, a carnival operator, to sign up users that go to this carnival on this Fun Pass app. So then that way, they deliver, they, they can create this loyalty program, give them rewards. And so for us, the top of funnel is how are we gonna be able to educate the goers into this reward platform? When people are at carnival, they're seeing lights, they're seeing rides, games, and everything, but how do we capture their attention? And this is when we were able to actually train all the staff, operating staff, about the value proposition of the FunPass application. In addition to that, we had signages all over the entire site to showcase the rewards that they're going to be able to get, such as winning a trip to Hawaii. Middle of the funnel, now that they, we have their attention, now that they're excited, they're like, what's going on? How do I win a trip to Hawaii? We then share with them how easy it is to use our platform. A very quick demo of a one, two, three process. Not only that, we also had merch, plushies, digital collectible, everything displayed. So then that way people can see exactly what rewards they're gonna receive if they were to play this game, if they were to sign up for the fun pass. And finally, at this point in time, we need to convert them into a user the final stage to tip that skill, to bribe them. Usually people at this point, they're either sold or they're not sold. They needed something to force them to take that action. And that's the reason why this is the time we, when we introduce them a free game or a double your chances of winning. And this usually is able to convert this into a user. And that's what I mean by bribing your users. Free demo, right? Um, or free games, 50% offs. All these things add up to converting the user. Now, as you can see, from this breaking down of the user journey, if you were to focus on doubling your rewards when they don't even know your application, then you're doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. So being able to understand the user journey flow is critical to getting traction for your product. Now, I'm going to show you a quick testimonial video just to show you guys, like, the success of this application, 30 seconds, we can play it right now. And the reason why I want to show you is because it leads to the next part of the presentation. 
thank you very much for playing the Fun Pass. How did you feel about the Fun Pass app? On the app. Yeah. Feedback. Yeah. Uh, it was fun. Yeah. It was really easy to use, and the prizes are really clear. So it was really easy for us to rack it up really quick. <laughs> yeah. Nice colors. Pretty nice. Because, like, in case you don't win there, you win something here. So in the end, we all walked away winners. I'm glad I got my mug. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, and I hope. <laughs> Quick testimonial video just to showcase what I'm talking about when it comes down to our application. Give it a little bit more context and color. The next step in getting traction is to be able to fail fast and smart because in today's world that is changing so rapidly, we must deliver, develop the skill set of being able to be adaptive. Instead of just being stuck and stubborn about your thesis, you have to know when to pivot. That's number one. Second of all, it allows you to continuously improve and not be complacent. Now, you saw the success, but initially, when we first launched, we only had 50 users. And that was really concerning for me because we spent tens and thousands of dollars on this application. We thought we knew what we were doing. It was a really important client for us, but seemingly, we were failing. And as a result, what we did we actually, we doubled up our giveaways right away. We doubled up the prizes we were giving away. We doubled up the rewards. We were giving out the farm because we wanted and we were desperate for users. And at this point in time, our team was challenging us. He's like, are we sure we want to double up the prizes? Because we're going to run out of budget real quick. We still have a few more weekends to go. And that was when we realized that it was important for us to capture um, surveys. And so within the first week, we captured over 400 surveys, ran doubled in our giveaways and prizes and rewards. After analyzing our surveys, we realized that everything else was not a problem. The rewards was not a problem. Incentive was not a problem. The problem was with onboarding. The buttons, the placement, value proposition, the flow, education, in incentives. All this led to more than eight different iterations on this platform within the next three days. And that was how fast we needed to adapt to. We needed to have a thesis, we needed to test, we needed to collect results of what's happening in the marketplace, not what we think. And that was the key, going back to the thesis. And as a result of that, the second week, we had more than 600 users. And we even cut down on the prizes that we gave away. So that was not the problem at all. This is a format that we follow. And especially when you are launching a product, there's 10 million things that you guys are working with. So it's really critical for you to be able to have frameworks that you follow. And this was able to allow us to really stay level-headed. Have a thesis. This thesis should have as much parameters, success metrics, and ideas that you have, goals. Second is to de develop an MVP and go to market and test it as soon as possible. Finally, collect feedback. Collect meaningful feedback that you can actually cross-reference with your the thesis. That is key. Insightful thesis is really key, not just some random surveys. And finally, reiterate your MVP and tweak so then that way you can actually achieve your next results that you are trying to aim for. And that's why we must fail fast and we must fail smart. Don't just fail smart fast, guys. Cool? Nice. Now. One of the biggest lessons that we had when we were running our first week was that we were not gathering facts at all. I was just sharing with you guys, we were being very reactive. We were doubling up our prizes. We are giving away the farm. It is because at that point in time, it was a lot of feelings. It was very, very subjective in terms of what we think and how we feel. And that's why, as number one says, provide accurate assessment of the situation. Gathering facts allows you to see what is really going on without the BS, without the bias. It's really, really critical. And finally, the second piece is to be able to speak the same language with your team. How you feel versus how your friend feels versus how your co-founder feels. You guys are all speaking different languages, but with data, with insights, with facts, now you're speaking the same language. Now you can work cohesively as a very aligned team. As I was saying, the first week, we doubled up our prizes. 
And we realized that that was not really the problem at all. The problem was that people got lost after entering their email. The users did not receive the, ver the, the code. They didn't see that button. They didn't understand the key value prop. They didn't read the tutorials because it was just way too long. And they didn't know what to do with our stars, this and that. And these are all what we deduced and formulated what really happened. And at the end of the second week, we, doubled, we tr tripled our conversion because we gathered facts. And so this is super critical in terms of getting your traction. Any questions so far? Hands up. Are you guys still following along? Beautiful. Headers, heads are nodding. Thank you. Thank you for participating and engaging. <laughs> and the next thing is to have a team that is fully aligned, a cohesive team that drives on the same direction. It is very, very critical because you guys need to be able to work towards the same goal, have that shared vision together. And at the same time, you need to be able to communicate and collaborate effectively, especially when you're working with all your co-founders. And finally, foster a positive culture. This is what makes work fun. This is why you guys are on this journey together. And it's very, very, very critical. As much as it's cliche, I still think that it is so, so important. And that's the reason why it's on the slide right now. When I'm talking about shared vision, how do we achieve shared vision? Number one is to be able to share your mission and your values. Your mission is really what you guys are doing this for. What problem are you guys solving? Because there are so many different opportunities, you get lost. That's the reason why you need that guiding light to guide you along the path. Values is what works for you. What do you personally believe in? Same thing with your co-founders, same thing with your partners. If you guys have difference in values, it is very difficult to create anything meaningful together. Because through hardship, through challenges, that's when the cracks show. That's when the difference in opinion start to show because of the values. So having that upfront is critical to the success of your team. The second piece is empowerment and autonomy. Provide a sense of ownership, trust, and aligned incentive. The key here is the aligned incentive, not a four-year vesting schedule that's like, oh man, it, it's just not gonna work. I, I think that people need that aligned incentive right from the get-go, especially when you're working from the founders to the devs to the operational team. It is super critical on that note. Finally, foster a positive culture. Make it fun. Nowadays, people are not just looking at money. They're looking at, am I getting ahead? Am I learning? Is progression being made? After a certain amount of money that people receive as compensation, it goes beyond that. They need to feel that they're part of something bigger. They need to feel that they're progressing as an individual. And we need to tap into that as founders. And so this is really key in developing that aligned team because I'm actually speaking from from experience of, of running a traditional team of over 100 versus now I'm running a team of five. Very, very big contrast. So many different insights that I can gather, but those are the three key ones that made the biggest impact for us. One hot take that I really wanna share is operational execution. And this is a key point that I think a lot of people miss out when it comes down to building. You can have a great tech team that can be super capable and turn around your product in a very fast manner. You can have a founder that has a really strong vision, strategies to achieve that. But if your product lack any type of executional, operational execution, that's when th things fall apart. Because whatever thesis you have behind the computer, when it's being delivered out, not the right way, not the way that you are designing the product, then that's when things fall apart. So what I am referring to is from educating the users to the touch point of being able to execute precisely to how the product works, to finally gathering insights that are actually important for you to actually make the changes and tweaks. So really focus on your operational execution if your product requires any type of operations. Right? If it's fully online, that's a different story. But overall, operational execution is something that I, I feel 
a lot of founders that I'm talking to are struggling on because there are more developer backgrounds, software engineers, and whatnot. Next piece is show, don't tell. Trust is being able to build on execution and not just talk, especially in today's world. If you guys are going to market to raise capital, you're not going to be able to raise a dollar by just having an idea. You must be able to show that there's traction, show that people believe in you guys, show that you can network, show what you're doing. It proves that you can do the job. And on top of that, it allows people to actually experience it and develop that loyalty to you and your product. So far, uh, by the way, hands up if you guys know anyone that plays Roblox. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. You guys are going to be the best auntie, uncle, dads, whatever the case may be. Please take a picture of this. Send it to your friends that play Roblox, okay? I guarantee you they're going to be over the moon. Like, I'm trying to talk to my, nie uh, my niece of 12-year-old, and she won't talk to me for the longest time because we don't really connect. But when we, when we showed him this, he was completely over the moon. He's like my best friend now because of this. So that's the reason why I wanted to kind of give you guys this gift um, for today, spending time with us. If you can't f see this, come find me for a physical card later as well, okay? And I'll give it to you. My whole point of demonstrating this is that I'm here to show you what works and what doesn't work, not just tell you and preach, because it is so important to be able to, especially in today's age, to be able to deliver that value and establish that trust. Us as a loyalty platform to match brands with metaverse players like Roblox, Minecraft, and the likes, it was critical for us to be able to show the users what are they getting in return. Not just having a digital collectible, badges and whatnot, because it's seemingly so untangible. That's the reason why we had to merge it with merch, collectively aligning this entire reward system for our users. So the reason why I wanted to show you this is plot it into your own model. Figure out how you can showcase the value prop and not just say and tell the value prop. For us, when we were doing fundraising, we were hosting multiple different VIP events. We held gatherings with 50 different VCs because we want to be able to showcase and demo what we're doing and not just be sending a pitch deck. We need to show them we care. We need to show them that we are focusing on the little details. And that's the reason why you guys must show and not tell. Lastly, the real journey is to be able to create a product that a lot of people really want to buy. It's really your goal. Whatever your product you guys are working on, your startup, your idea, this is the mission. Create a product that a lot of people want to buy. It's, it's so, so simple, yet it is so difficult to achieve this mission. And the reason why it was important for me to share the real journey with you today is because, as you can see, we launched the FunPass product on July the 13th of this year. But really, we have been working on this since 20, November 25th of 2021, two years ago. We started with a digital collection, sold more than 30 mil in secondary transacted volume. Same time, sold 200K in merch, and yet nothing happened. As much as we had the traction, there was nothing that came out of it because we didn't have a scalable product. We even had partnership with different brands. We created a marketplace because we felt like we don't have a product. Well, a marketplace is a product. That's the hot thing. We continue to pivot. And after two years, everything you see here, nothing more that came out of it. And that's the brutal truth of this real journey of what you guys are going to go through, potentially is that you're going to go through so many different iterations. You must continue to pivot and find out what works for you. And so that's the reason why, for us, we have collected all the different things that we have learned. Digital collectible, rewards, loyalty, partners with brands, creating a hybrid marketplace, and finally coming up with a product that collectively takes everything that we have learned, all the thesis, all the iterations that we have gone through, to develop the FunPass, a loyalty rewards platform, 
for Metaverse players. Guys, final message for you guys is to don't give up. Truly, don't give up. Continue on your pro process. Getting metric is only the first step. It is way longer than that. At the end of the day, it is a journey. So yeah, don't give up. This is my six step journey. If you guys want, I can send you the deck. Uh, apply the frameworks, principles, so then that way, key is to be able to find your product market fit. Uh, and if you guys want to connect, feel free. This is my email. And thank you so, so much. Yeah, thanks so much for this this talk and those insights. I think that was super, super valuable to really see, you know, some actionable steps on how to get to 10,000 users. I think those are probably going to be, no matter what you do, the hardest ones to achieve. Um, next up, I'll please, I'll ask you to please welcome Marcus, as we will be talking about from code to community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Welcome everybody, thank you all so much for being here. I just want to say we're incredibly lucky to be joined today on stage by this all-star uh, panel. Um, a lot of these people, or all of these people up here with us today are Nero OGs. They've been contributing to or building on Nier for well over a year, some two plus. Um, so in this panel, we're going to be diving into the intertwined journey of technical development and community cultivation in Web3. Uh, as you probably all know, I mean, the impact of, uh, of a successful community, um, you know, in Web3 is, is pretty much, it's massive. Um, so who better to discuss this topic than this diverse, uh, this, this um, panel full of people with diverse backgrounds. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and let them introduce themselves, uh, you know, provide a little overview of what you're working on, um, you know, what you do, and we can dive into it. Naomi, we'll start with you. Yeah, uh, I'm Naomi, and I'm, as you can see, the only one who doesn't have like a project on there, because I'm, um, yeah, I'm a freelancer mostly. I work at the Asta Foundation, but I've been in the Near ecosystem for roughly a year. And last NearCon, nobody knew me, and now everybody thinks I work for the foundation, so I must have done something right. Um, and yeah, I'm excited to be here. I'm quite fond of the community topic and looking forward to talking about it. Me next. Uh, hi guys, I'm uh, Riza from uh, Ludero. Ludero is a gamified Web3 uh, in market intelligence platform. Uh, we use games to collect zero-party data from your users and help you make better decisions. Uh, hello, does this work? Oh, lit. My name is Shot. Some of y'all know me as Web3 Plug. I lead decentralization at Banyan Collective, which is essentially the US arm of uh, Near and uh, yeah, I work with devs, DAOs, and founders. I also run Minority Programmers. We're an international group of devs. You might see some of our products here in the Near ecosystem. Hello, my name is Dan. Um, I'm the co-founder of Apollo 42. That's a uh, NFT marketplace, largest NFT marketplace in Near. Right now, we have a pivot, which is A42 Lab, a laboratory building mass adoption products, focusing on mass adoption products and also providing B2B solutions. We worked with companies like BMW Europe, Dansu, Japanese agency, and right now creating a whole new product, mobile applications Podium, uh, that is focused on the intersection uh, between augmented reality and the whole web free space. Cool, um, yeah, awesome to be up here with all of you, feel honored. 
Um, I want to like start with with uh, a question, right? Like it's almost like the chicken and the egg, um, and I love your unique uh, kind of approaches to this. What comes first, uh, the community or the project? A lot of times we see uh, a team build out a project and then they start focusing on building community around it. Uh, other times, probably more often, we see people, uh, you know, building community around a concept. Um, you know, wh what are your opinions there? Okay, I can I can start maybe. So I think um, community is great, right? But the I believe that the the real strong community is organically created community, right? Created usually uh, by some true believers in the product, the platform, a protocol. Uh, we have uh, plenty of use cases in the in the web free space. So like mo moderation stuff is important, but uh, but when you, you the, the real engagement comes from the real people. So if you have like moderators and your employees chatting with each, uh, with each, uh, with each other and talking to, to each other in the community, that's not how it works. Unless you want to uh, essentially create pump and dump token on or show some stats to venture capitalists, how many, how many users you have in your Discord community, right? But yeah, so it depends. But for, for me and from our side of view, the real community is essentially a community created by true members of, of, of the whole product, pro protocol, or, or project, yeah. I mean, uh, for me, it really depends on uh, what the community is and what it attempts to achieve. Um, often, when developing a product, I think the most uh, critical thing you should do is address paid points directly. If you're already existing community, uh, that might be the inspiration for your paid point. Uh, but uh, at the same time, a community doesn't necessarily need a product at all. Um, we work a lot in like the near ecosystem in general. Um, that's not necessarily uh, kind of doing this type of eco relation product oriented. Uh, but uh, certain communities, like for example, like the Boss community, uh, we needed like a developer tooling. Uh, so we uh, so we teamed up with Jitsu to build that out. That's the example of like essentially a product coming out um, of a community based on pain points. Um, at the same time, communities may never need a product or they realize, uh, or they're just there to kind of hang out. So I, I, I really am kind of skeptical about projects that uh, build the community first rather than address a paid point. I really think most effective projects come up from um, addressing a paid point in a segment and kind of going to the places where those communities exist. Yeah, and like to your point, um, we've seen like, you know, so we always kind of make the joke of like there's 12 active users in Web3 because I think of all the focus on community rather than the focus on product. Uh, but as like you say, if you're addressing a pain point and then the community can kind of grow from that naturally and you know, you get word of mouth and people tell each other stuff like we're building decentralized system but information still flows in the same ways. So yeah, product first and then community. If you're building a business, if you're just trying to do something else, then it doesn't really matter what the product is. Yeah, I don't think actually everything in Web3 is like worth a business or can even be commercialized. And a lot of times projects build the community to kind of dump on them, um, which obviously then is not a great way um, to go about it. I think another way to build a community can also just be you have some aspirational goal, you have some shared values and you want to do something cool. Like, I don't know, you want to make an army email together or you want to see like a certain type of art be created and then you come together. like. I mean, in the near ecosystem, there's near Chandao, and it's just a bunch of artists making like cute art of this one thing. And it's a community, there's no token, there's no nothing um, like that. And it works, um, people are having fun, and it's small. I think that's also another like challenge. Everybody wants to scale super fast and go from their community from like 10 people to 100 to 1,000 to a million in like really short time. And I think you usually lose like the initial culture when you do that. Yeah, I also think it's important to understand what a product is. Um, often when you're doing a community without a business model, um, there's a lot of operational overhead. There's a lot of someone who's actually onboarding someone, um, or you have kind of a decentralized way of like creating an onboarding checklist or a user journey for community members, um, but it, that's the product in itself. But a lot of times when you have kind of that operational overhead and you don't have a business model, um, the community dies and leaves without that person. And so I think it's um, also kind of important to understand like who in the community is providing that onboarding process, what kind of that onboarding product to the community is, and um, 
yeah, and, and how to exactly sustain that. So yeah, the answer is, it depends, Marcus, <laughs> and it's always better to build the product first. I believe everyone agrees here. Yep. Not always. Um, something I want to address, uh, you know, just I, I guess it's uh, r relatable to the to the group here as well. Um, but with with web th with the open um, you know open source nature of, of Web three, you know, Web three is a space where a bunch of like awesome people are building towards the future of an open web, user owned assets, user owned data. Uh, developer, like an active developer community and presence is super important, but this seems to be one of the biggest pain points in Web3, right, is is kind of how do you effectively build uh, an engaged community of developers that can contribute to the protocol or the project um, and also provide like input from a technical standpoint, but also ensure that they're retained. Like I'd love to hear from some of you with each of your respective kind of uh, backgrounds and roles that you bring to the table, what some like creative kind of methods around this could be or what you've seen that worked um, and, and then kind of what your, uh, what your thoughts on, like what would you do, what would you implement to kind of get something like this going? I mean, I do a lot of like developer relations work, especially um, I, in a decentralized way, even before the near ecosystem, uh, working at the minority programmers um, and it really depends on what the objective uh, of what you're trying to achieve. Uh, so for minority programmers initially, we just want to skill people um, across all the world uh, to actually have upward mobility through development. And this, uh, for us, is how do we effectively equip them with the skills so that they can get a job. Um, that developer journey is very different than having someone retained in the near ecosystem and doing DevRel uh, for that. So um, particularly what I think is most effective, especially with kind of breaking down the numbers in the developer report for full-time developers, which is uh, what I want to see in the ecosystem, is actual um, outside of like, these hackathons and, and just builder groups and touch points there, how exactly can we find them full-time opportunities? And a lot of times um, this doesn't, uh, uh, a lot of the time this trickles down to like who, what projects are effectively getting funded if we could pipeline developers into the founder journey um, and continue it uh, there. Uh, at the same time, I think um, an open source culture um, where people are excited to innovate and constantly innovating not only on the front end but at the protocol level um, is kind of, inherently needed for um, building uh, a robust kind of near ecosystem. Um, but at, at, the, at the same time, um, you see this in like Rust and a lot of times, a lot of the contributors there are also contributing because in their day job, they happen to um, be dependent on Rust for, uh, for a lot of the infrastructure tooling they're, they're building. So um, to me, that's, that's pivotal, making sure that there are companies who are building on near that are, are dependent on this open source infrastructure and that are kind of pipelining junior and senior developers into uh, contributing to the overall protocol. Yeah, I can add some thoughts. Um, is, you know, we, nowadays we have like uh, the biggest developer communities uh, in crypto in the Web3 space are Gitcoin community, I believe, uh, and developer DAO. We have also like Project SHI 256, I believe nonprofit organization focusing on developers. But the main issue there is the issue of the whole Web3 space, is we separate each other from other chains. So even if you are in this community, there are still sub-communities that are working on only one layer one, layer two, or help the, 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 this layer to succeed, the protocol, smart contract, et cetera, it doesn't matter. So I believe the next stage for developer communities is to go multi-chain. And that's exactly, Marcus, what I had like two, three days ago. I told you about multi-chain protocol uh, concept and you said, just wait a minute, then relax. Ilya will say everything. And we had an announcement about this multi-chain thing and Polygon announced. So I think this is the future and this is the first step, of course. And uh, that's amazing. So in terms of developer community, we have near Dev Hub, we have other also small developer communities, and we have to focus on building multi-chain infrastructure, multi-chain protocol, because the future is multi-chain, basically. I think maybe, I mean, I'm, I'm a marketer, and what I feel is like, we are always just like focusing on such a small pie. And I mean, developers want to build for like people in the end, right? I mean, okay, some of them want to build because it's just cool to build and it's fun. Um, but I mean, if you look at Web3, it's so small. Like Roblox probably has like 10 times as many monthly active users as Web3. So if you want to like <laughs> make 
money and maybe also get your work out to a big audience, then maybe that's where you go. And, and I think that's like a bigger problem in the space is that we, and everybody's been saying that, that we have too much infrastructure now and we kind of lack the consumer apps and now we've got this focus. So um, maybe once we actually get to the point where we have more consumer apps then it also gets more attractive to build on Web3 in general. And of course I agree like multi-chain, but also it shouldn't be so hard, right? Like it's like solidity, then there's like Rust, there's Wasm, there's like whatnot. And even like if a chain like Solana has Rust, but if you want to write Rust smart contracts on Solana, it's a very different beast than writing Rust smart contracts on Near. So I think there's still a lot of like things that can be improved to actually make this multi-chain dev experience easier and maybe also possible. Yeah, I think like, you know, just focusing like the, for better or for worse, People are focusing on developers, but um, kind of like entrep non-technical entrepreneurs are probably being overlooked a little bit um, that have ideas and just need a bit of help bringing it to market and on the coding side. Uh, and I think that would be a very interesting way for uh, whichever, found, whichever blockchain decides to pursue that opportunity. Actually, on that note, I think the uh, current move with AI is really interesting because even people like me who've got no clue of coding, they can figure out how to build like a POC at least of something that somewhat works without having to know like, I mean, I have some basic understanding of all these things, but you can do it. So I think maybe if some communities figure out how they can empower people who are non-technical to do those things and teach them like, hey, look, this is how you need to phrase it. And then you can get to a stage where you can actually show it to somebody and they might have some constructive feedback. Yeah, and I want to note that, like, especially with the near ecosystem, um, unlike the kind of other siloed, like, developer ecosystems, it's like we have Rust, which is one of the fastest growing languages. We have JavaScript on the front ends. We have the exposure um, through Solidity. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think it's, like, I, I think it's very kind of important to note, like, when we're training kind of engineering talent, um, they're not siloed to our ecosystem alone. This is skills that can lead to overall upward mobility. I think we have that um, really unique selling proposition as opposed to Solidity and Ethereum, people are kind of like, if, if they're kind of siloed into that ecosystem. And so um, that's one of the main things I like about Anir and even on the Rust frameworks kind of alone, it's way easier than chewing glass on, Solaz on Solano, or on Cosmos or on uh, Polkadot is from what I've been hearing just kind of from uh, developer feedback. Well, I'd love to actually segue from there and kind of like build on top of that, right? So, I mean, you know, Web3 right now, like this, what determines the success of any Web3 project? And like a, a lot of these people here might be building something really cool that they want to turn into a project later on, or they've already been building something. Um, so we all know it, it is community, right? So for instance, all of us probably subscribe to Netflix, but do you consider yourself a, a Netflix community member? Like in Web3, it's, it's all about community. So. Again, to kind of like build on that topic, what are what are some of the challenges that uh, that some teams can expect to face in in harmonizing like you know technical development, it's like building a project while you know kind of trying to make sure that they ramp up community engagement? Um, I believe that you know this uh, thesis that Web three is a community. I think we should get rid of it, to be honest, because yes, uh, Web three uh, community is a part of Web Web three, very big part, but. If we're talking about the projects, protocols, products, the main stats should be users, right? Not total value locked, <laughs> not how many community members you have, users, right? Monthly active users, daily active users, uh, et cetera. Because the example is, you know, Sandbox, the game, they have like dozens of thousands of community members, very active. How many monthly active users they have? Around 4K. So it doesn't tell a lot of things. Yes, these people want to get some benefits from interacting, um, you know, with with each other and get some rewards for that. You know how Discord communities work, right? But still, we need to focus on users first and attracting users, not community members. Well, I think it depends on what you're building. Like, for example, take Neo Social. I mean, to be honest, I don't use it much because I think it's not as great as other decentralized social networks. Um, but what I've seen, for example, when using Farcaster is what they managed is that the initial community they seeded was like really high quality and everybody kind of had a shared understanding of what is like 
socially acceptable in this context and what isn't. And there was a lot of alpha as well. So if you were there, you would usually get uh, some news early. Um, and now they're scaling it up. But I think um, if you have a product like that that lifts from the community interactions, then you definitely should focus on building that community. Or if you have, I mean, some NFT projects, um, depending on how they structure it, they might want to get a lot of input from their community, right? Um, and maybe they want to have like a collaborative thing because I think that's like one of the main uh, propositions of Web3 is that we can align incentives, we can work on stuff together. We don't have to be as cutthroat, which, I mean, we're not there yet, but. Yeah, can I, can I uh, add something? Uh, yeah. I totally agree, Naomi, with you because, you know, but we, uh, I speak from the products point of view, you speak from the community point of view, right? So, um, and I totally agree, but um, we have to keep in mind that it depends on the user conversion from the community to the product, right? If you have like hundreds of thousands of um, community members that are interacting with each other and have just 2K monthly active users in the product, doesn't work like this, right? Yeah. It's, it's a failed project essentially, but it depends how you really attract those community members to really use your product and that's the, the, the essential task for you as a head of product uh, or, 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 some, or someone from, from the product of itself. Of course, yeah. unless you use your community to sell your token to, and if all these people buy a token and your measure is like, how high can I pump my token, then it might still be a success. But that's a bad yeah. way of doing things, Yeah, right? of course, of course yeah. it's a bad thing, but I still think it's like 70% of the projects at the moment, I mean, um, which obviously has to change. But. I think they're completely like kind of different uh, Personas. I mean, a token holder is not a user, yeah, yeah. and a user is not necessarily a customer. Yeah. Um, and I think in Web3, we overhype community. Um, and when you look at the overall near community, how many people are actually using the protocol on chain? I actually, everybody on my team, I have all their wallets. I have the Learn Near Watchbot wallet. I track exactly what applications they're interacting with. Um, and I, uh, yeah, completely. <laughs> so it's not near. I literally will walk up to them and show their transaction hash um, because I, I want to make sure that everybody on my team is actually, especially as ecosystem practitioners, are using the projects on near. I think there is a, a also a disconnect of uh, between uh, kind of the biggest like. I don't necessarily know if my if, Lu if Ludero users are also using my applications too. I think uh, when it comes to community in Web3, um, as, a, as a product founder, I think it's very important that we understand kind of how in the ecosystem this community translates into user retention across applications. Otherwise, they're just kind of people there um, to hype and they're actually not using the core product. And to me, one of the most valuable things um, the community can do is provide like user feedback and help us actually develop a, a more meaningful product. I mean, take take the example of like like Nier's a great example, right? We have Kai Ching and Sweat, two of the most two out of five of the most active users, uh, active DApps in Web three, uh, but they're not really part of like the Nier community, right? They're like they're sending transactions through, but they're not active on Twitter. They're not. M I guess the majority of them aren't active on Twitter or Discord but there's still value being derived to the chain, right? So like like you said, uh, Shot, like about different personas and like where they're driving value and ultimately we, uh, you have to ask yourself is like where's the end goal in that customer journey and what does good retention look like? Does it mean them coming over to Twitter and degening spaces with us and like, like buying like crappy NFTs or is it just like using the tech under the hood and driving value to the chain that way? I want to add to Riz's word. I think Near has a reverse problem because we have so many transactions accounts being created, but we don't really have as big as uh, community exactly. as de depending on the transaction uh, quantity of transactions and stuff. So uh, that's actually a very good thought. So we we have in Near ecosystem has a reverse problem because yeah. we need to create community to essentially uh, make products and board people to products. But w uh, as, as Ilya and Near Foundation, uh, Near Protocol works on the fact that uh, users should not really see what's the pro protocol they're building. Most of the users are in the Near ecosystem, they don't know that they're using Near, and that's exactly. the whole point. So we need to work on the community side of things too, right? So we yeah. create more um, products and products. But e even that in itself, I think, is a product like pain point. So we have all these transactions on chain, but we don't ne necessarily know on what level of the progressive onboarding process they are. A lot of these wallets are made on behalf of users they can't export, um, but we as the ecosystem have not trickled that down um, there. I think 
think wallets, I think about a quest, a bunch of kind of onboarding infrastructure can be put in place so we do accrue that value. But I think uh, like overall that strategy needs to, uh, to be developed because uh, the fact of the matter is like, like building products that are very near native where uh, the, the user owns their seed phrase, we're not getting the benefits of Sweat and Kaching. Um, mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's just some things we need to strategize. That's why we need to track every employee's wallet <laughs> to really understand uh, the activity of, <laughs> of the near ecosystem. <laughs> well, uh, you know, definitely important to like dog food the ecosystem and make sure that kind of things that are being built in any ecosystem are actually being used, you know, by the, by the kind of like core contributors. Um, we have about five minutes left, so I kind of want to end this off on, um, we have, you know, everybody up here has a, a very important kind of, um, you know, they, they bring a really unique element to this, this topic, right? Um, for instance, like Naomi, you, you have your own community behind you that you've built. I mean, you, you have a crazy following that's very engaged, uh, a big, big following on Twitter, like <laughs> your Twitter spaces are popping off. Um, Shot, you have like done amazing work in the near ecosystem, curating, um, you know, developer communities, vertical communities, uh, you're on top of a lot of things. So I would love to hear from all of you um, what advice would you give to, to these amazing people here today that are building, um, you know, projects uh, to foster like a vibrant ecosystem while advancing their technical goals? I would say, um, is your community going to last if you die? Um, that's, that's one of the things I kind of really worry about. Um, a lot of times, especially in these ecosystems, like, uh, a lot leaves with the person. There's time for onboarding. I think uh, you have to design a robust ecosystem with a bunch of uh, stewards and, and align incentives from the beginning because, um, and, and this even happens for a lot of projects building. Like you'll build something because it's cool but you never had an inherent business model. I think uh, community incentives are along the same lines. Um, and I've spent a lot of times, I made a lot of mistakes uh, uh, in my past and, and even today where I'm hustling and bustling uh, but I didn't build something that scales. So I, I think that should be uh, the biggest priority or um, I, this is what I say often, like you may feel like you have motion but you're really running up a wall and getting nowhere. Um, so um, yeah, keep that in mind. Yeah, I think ask yourself like honestly and genuinely like why should anybody care? And why should anybody, if, if, any, if somebody has like 30 minutes a day, why should they join my community? when they could be joining like any other community. Uh, and that's not an answer that you're gonna get like pretty quickly, it's gonna take over time, you're gonna have to get feedback and engage with your community. Uh, but just being really critical of what you offer, where you stand in relation to the market uh, will help you make better insights. Yeah, I mean, for me, the community that I guess Marcus is referring to that's behind me, that's mostly just based on vibes and being very honest with my opinions and uh, high integrity. And people value that, especially in a space where everybody is moving on to the next hype thing so fast, just in order to like grab a few more people from here and from there. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, sometimes uh, humans aren't just motivated by money. They are also very much motivated by just hanging out with cool people. So I think if you start your initial community with the kind of people you'd love to spend the entire weekend with, no phones, no nothing, like that's, I think, a good start because if you have an organic, very active like community that maybe even rallies behind your product, I think then, uh, yeah, even if you grow fast, they'll make sure that still the initial culture remains. And yeah, so I think vibes are very important. When proof of vibes. Yeah, proof of vibes. <laughs> Cool. Dan, anything to say? Any I advice? Thi I think these guys know about community building much more than I do. So, <laughs> well, I mean, you've been I around. You've built I agree to every everyone. Uh, awesome here. communities. Yeah. Well, it's been great hearing from you. I'm completely honored to share the stage with with all you amazing people. Hopefully, you got some value out of that. Um, but yeah, let's give a round of applause for this amazing panel, everybody. Um, next up, we're going to hear from Alejandro, Jordan, and Vinay on growth hacking tactics for near projects. Please welcome Vinay to the stage.
and hacking. Two things we do often. Yes. In life. Got to hack this audience to be grown. How do we hack this audience? I don't know. Maybe uh, we could put up a bounty on heroes to come watch us talk and <laughs> pay for some engagement. That would be one way. Bounty, an open bar, engaging, smart guests. Oh, wait, we have that. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, I think we can get started. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us for this interesting panel on growth hacking, something we really look forward to in the near ecosystem. So uh, I've got with me two awesome people who are very well known in this ecosystem, uh, Jordan and AVB. Um, yeah, I think we can get started with presenting ourselves. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Jordan. Uh, in the near ecosystem, have built a lot of DAO and NFT infrastructure, and lately I'm focused on growth hacking for Mintbase and also helping out on the Heroes Project, leading product and also growth there. So kind of my favorite thing right now. Thank you, Jordan. Hi, my name is AVB. I've been around since uh, 2021. And uh, across various roles, I've also been doing some personal growth, some hacking, and uh, no, but seriously, um, there's been many different attempts of trying to find ways to grow the ecosystem, acknowledging that there is value, and that we need to find a way to communicate it. Uh, from the early days, Silicon Craftsman, uh, product and user experience, marketing DAO, podcast, YouTube, I've always been trying to find those areas of opportunity to, yeah, unlock value. Yeah, and um, for myself, uh, I work at the Near Foundation. Uh, I'm part of the community support team. So we always constantly are looking for new ways to experiment because uh, nothing in Web3 is set in stone, right? Um, yeah, we've grown a lot in the Near ecosystem uh, in the last three years. And since we are in the hacker house or the hacker HQ, we are also hacking, right? Uh, but putting those two terms together could mean something totally different. And like, I kind of want to set the stage with defining what we would consider as growth hacking. So if someone would like to um, sure. kind of define what would that look like? Yeah, for me, it's about being able to measure and having a framework in place so that when you have a cool idea and you want to see if it's going to work to actually get people into your ecosystem or whatever you're trying to accomplish, that you have a measuring stick to see how the experiment goes. Um, if you have a framework like that set up where you've identified your audience and you have an activation that you think could speak to that audience and you follow up after doing your campaign, you'll have lessons learned. Even if the campaign was a total failure, you'll have some things that you learned from it, things to do differently, things to do better. Um, if it went well, then you've got things to repeat. But without that framework, you can't really hack. You need some way of seeing if the things you're trying to do are having impact. Yeah. Anything to add from you? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> if I ever say silent, call an ambulance. <laughs> 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 yeah, growth hacking is about having the simplest actions to drive the most value. If you were to compare growth hacking with a traditional marketing campaign, marketing is a bit more drawn out, established, traditional. You may just want to maintain what you have. Growth hacking says, if we don't grow, we're dead in six months' time. And we don't care if it's legal, illegal, whose job it is. We're going to find a hole and get in there. <laughs> and yeah, I think that it, it, it really calls for rapid iteration and uh, I guess gotta find the balance with what Jordan was saying. You want to iterate, but also be able to capture. You know, is it having impact? And if it's working, how do we double down? No, 100% agree. Um, yeah, I think what we could do is give a few examples of growth hacking that we've seen in the broader uh, Web3 space, and kind of then draw similar examples of what have been happening, like in the near ecosystem. Um, so does any one of you want to give Sure, yeah. I think that if we're looking at concrete examples with um, an organization like Mintbase, there's kind of two audiences that are being targeted, and that's developers with the API tooling and then kind of end users with more of the marketplace um, front end and examples like Minsta. So those are like two audiences, and if you're going to be doing a growth hack, you probably want to pick out 
one audience and go after that. Um, trying to capture multiple audiences with a single activation uh, is, is challenging. It means that your measurements are going to mean less because you aren't even sure which one you were going after to begin with. Um, in the case of heroes, the two audiences are the funders, the people who are putting bounties up, and then the hunters, the people who are showing up to do work. So again, you have to have some kind of measurement in place, some framework, and then pick out your audience, and then come up with your legal or illegal or side legal <laughs> thing that you want to do to get those people engaged and make sure that you're like talking to them. And that means coming up with whatever number or metric it is that actually makes a difference and allows you to have a, a single number that gives you some idea of how much impact you had. Yeah, thinking about growth hacking and looking too close to home is challenging because some people may argue that you may not have done or succeeded growth hacking if you haven't seen the growth. So there's a lot of reflection to do within the near ecosystem. If we look at it more historically, which has a survivorship bias, but there's some good examples, even things like Airbnb. Creating a marketplace of <laughs> sleeping at p uh, strangers' <laughs> houses and paying them for it uh, is challenging I if you look at it in abstract. But a growth hacking technique was we're not going to go after every city in the world or we're not going to go after grandma's house. We're going to go after conferences. And we're going to go after tech conferences and we're going to go you know, in, even in specific markets where we know there's a premium so people earn more during that weekend and then there's a break. There's no detention to need to find another stranger and et cetera. So that's a sort of framework perhaps that Jordan is mentioning where you try to find where is your opportunity, how can you get the most value from it, and embedded in that is the experience that you're creating for the user that ideally triggers that flywheel. At some point, people should be coming to you and saying, hey, when is the next conference? Can we do this again? That was a great experience, and that's when you start growing your fan base. That's the definition of product market fit. You actually have more demand than you can serve. Right now, the only demand that we look at is block space, which is the shittest metric in the world. We should be thinking about what are the products out there that people are demanding and we don't have enough capacity to meet. So we have to go recruit new developers and whatever. Yeah, and talking about nailing that, um, that sweet spot of even knowing who you're growing it for, with Kodame, the art and tech nonprofit that I started, um, my co-founder Bruno was doing more like tech meetups, things like that. I was doing music promotion and just by seeing each other around San Francisco a lot, we were like, let's throw an event together where there's a bunch of like tech art type stuff because we had friends coming into town for a conference. And that was one of those things where, you know, it, it was a total experiment. We had no idea how it was going to go. And people came to us afterwards and were like, when's the next one? And that's when we knew like, okay, I don't need to be putting energy into these side things when there's actually something for people to do over here. And the only reason that was able to grow and was successful is because there was something to do. Once the people came into that community, we had workshops, we had art shows where people could come and show their art and share their projects. Um, and we always had a performance schedule so people could come and do something. It doesn't matter if you have a ton of growth and inbound, if there's not some kind of action for people to take where you're, wherever you're trying to get them to go, and that's what needs to be in place before you even think about growth hacking is like, is this thing that we want people to do even worth doing? Like, have you asked yourself that question before you say, we need people? Yeah. And the, the, the particular challenge that comes up in Web3 is because we are an ecosystem and we're all tangentially related, we can just bullshit ourselves with the metrics. So for instance, normally in a startup, you have the luxury and the curse of choosing your own metrics. You can be succeeding or failing. You can just paint it in different ways depending on who you're talking to. In Web3, we may piggyback on someone else's metrics that they're actually failing, but we want to claim it's a win. Number of users, number of transactions. These are all vanity metrics. You really need to see it in context. I'll give you specific examples of good, honest attempts, and then we can deconstruct where we are. You know what a really good growth hacking technique is? Minsta. Superb onboarding experience that leverages state-of-the-art uh, onboarding, fast off SDK. They did it faster than Pagoda, by the way. <laughs> Meta transactions, only application on here that I know that uses Meta transactions. I just onboarded three uh, young fellows from Avalanche ecosystem. They've been in the near conference for three days. Didn't have a near wallet. It was after using Minsta 
the, their mind's blue, and I think they're recovering outside from it. <laughs> so then you have two questions. Is Minster a really good growth hacking application? Fuck yeah. It's free to you. You have the niche flagship event with hundreds or, or thousands of people attending, and then you move into the metrics. Are we just going to look at the number of people that got it? Are we going to look at the number of photos that they posted? Are we going to look at the quality of the photos because we're artists? Or are we going to look at how many people that were hackers saw Minsta, said, these people did all the work for us, and they go fork Minsta and start a real business? Or they add to the code base, and every single conference, we can have richer and richer experiences. Yeah. And that's for you to answer, Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, I do like the direction that Mintface is going with focusing on the infrastructure stuff and, you know, just showing that these kinds of experiences are possible and then enabling people on the other end of that. Um, kind of similar, uh, really tangible example, you don't necessarily have to overthink it when you're talking about what you're measuring. With heroes, we're looking at how many new bounties get made and then how many people are interacting with those bounties. And we're seeing a lot of good traction with people that like got in early on the meme contest that was run and just talking to other founders around the hackathon and having people sign up and start posting bounties right here is like it, it demonstrates the value. A growth hack would have been last night. Well, I wouldn't say it was packed, but there were more hackers than I was expecting building here. I, I woke up on the floor at four o'clock in the morning. I don't know what time other people dropped off. Would have been a good idea to create bounties for somebody to go and get us food. <laughs> Min that, that walked in at 1 a.m. in the morning with pizzas from the New York Foundation. I was like, this is like six hours too late. <laughs> so anyway, um, th those are the small opportunities that we can try to uh, identify. Perhaps other examples would be, you know, the Shardog and Gageathon. It's a fantastic onboarding experience, but depending on how you structure the sequences, it may not have the impact that you want. Unless you require the booths to you know, promote it, unless there is the right information attached to it at the right time, the right set of incentives. Perhaps a better example, and I'd be really curious to see what metrics are attaching to it, would be NCON. NCON is obviously worthless, and we were gonna give out the merch anyway, but being able to build an entire app using the key pump stack, everything from ticket to spending money, this is a case study. This is for a team to take uh, to prospective buyers and say, hey, guess what? We ran a conference with 6,000 people. We gave out 600 burgers. People had a black market for hoodies because we didn't order enough merch. That's what product market fit looks like. And you growth hack it at your own conference because you don't have to convince anyone to pay you a lot of money to do it. So those are the small opportunities that sometimes I get frustrated because I don't see enough people looking for them. I feel that people are waiting for the bulls to return and for the bags to inflate but we're not really thinking of how can we take this technology and activate these dorm cells of very smart people that will get excited at the opportunity to take the technology or, or, or the products and, and, and grow and hack. And grow and hack and grow and hack and grow! <laughs> and I know that it's yeah, <laughs> hacking, growing. To the camera people at the back, we love you. Hack and grow. That's how, um, that's how you crowd hack an, an audience. Yep. Everybody's excited now. The levels are up. They woke up. <laughs> I did. I did at least. <laughs> yeah. So want to take that? Um, yeah. I mean, I, I completely agree. Ancon is has been a huge success to the point where people yesterday were in two states of mind. Like, should I spend 15 Ancon for a slice of pizza, or should I get so myself a hoodie? And you could see like uh, people having those uh, those mental uh, dilemmas, right? Um, but, but even that is a metric of success. Yeah, it is. If right. you've reached the Google level of my made up word is now a verb, you've succeeded. Indeed. Nobody's saying, like, oh, go get the tokens, go get the shitty piece of paper with a timestamp in it to get pizza because you're hungry. Encon is now a thing. But I'm honestly not the best name, but it's a thing. And uh, there was probably a lot of thinking around it's going to be swag. We're going to give it for free, but well, it's going to be swag. It's going to be food. It was going to be free anyway. Like you need to build those experiences. Exactly, and like you could see, like pretty much at the end of each uh, panel talk, uh, especially at the NearCon HQ, people were actually like 
get ahead uh, at front, like try to scam those. And it really like gets people going. Uh, and I think like that's, that's a solid uh, use case uh, for conference growth hacking, right? Um, but I, I really want to touch up on, on the Minsta thing because um, what we've done, or what Minbase has done in the last couple of months, it's kind of created a blueprint. Um, so Min Minsta and Min through the Minbase wallet, they've been now kind of iterating and making this better. And they haven't really, in my opinion, looked at the metrics in isolation. So they haven't been looking at number of wallets, number of NFTs. Obviously, they do as, as stats. But they look at success from impact point of view. And I think that's very important. Like, what is the individual impact and feedback uh, from the people who use this, uh, this solution, right? Or fast onboarding, complemented with like creating NFTs out of your photographs. Um, so yeah, these iterations, we've seen it. We've seen the latest one for uh, Neocon where you have AI descriptions. It's insane how good this is. Uh, and yeah, there's, it, it'll only get better, so. It, with that example, because there is a trade-off, when you bring in the AI description, it's slower. Yeah. And more expensive to them. Do you think that the metric or the desired outcome is that when a photo has a caption, it's just a better experience for people going through the photos? or that they want to showcase that they've integrated AI seamlessly into a smart contract flow, or both? I'd say a bit of both, but the former takes more weightage in my opinion, because we know how cool ChatGPT was when it launched. You People were asking ChatGPT very basic questions just because they wanted to know how ChatGPT would respond. Uh, so th here you have a similar framework where you j you're kind of inclined to take a picture to see what the outcome of the AI description is going to look like. So yeah, I do think there's that feedback loop of, hey, um, yeah, I'll, I'll see what's, what's the outcome of X picture. I think it's more the latter you mentioned with it proving that you can do AI as part of the flow because it's not front and center in the minting experience. Like the front and center experience is you go to the site and you have a wallet and you can take a picture and then it's minted. And that is a very easy, tangible thing for people to understand whether they're in crypto or not. They get it. They're like, oh, I collect pictures. This is something that happens other places. And I keep them forever, and it's in a wallet. Great. Makes sense. Um, the AI thing, I think, is more targeted. Like, that's the first thing is that end users. The AI integration is more to get developers to think like, oh, not only can I have easy access to like blockchain technology that I can throw in my applications, but I can also integrate it with AI very easily. And it, gets those gears turning. So I think it's more thinking about that audience with the um, with that particular activation. Um, but one of the interesting things about Neercon is like we're all here because of the technology. And the technology has brought us together. And we're starting kind of from that technology like stance and point of view. But if we're talking about growth hacking, we really need to be looking at users, end users, whether you, they're developers or end users. and how you walk back from that and meet them with the technology, what you have at your disposal. Um, if you start with the technology and just make excuses for people to come and use it, then you're just kind of like convincing yourself that things are going well. But if you're solving real world, world problems, then everything that we're building starts to add up and make sense and people will start using it because it's better than other things in the world, not because it's cool tech. The term, uh, well, the role of a growth hacker is a modern phenomenon but the reason why you may want to have someone that thinks about that specifically is because it really does take a special type of probably so sociopathy or something. <laughs> you know, if you think of what is the real value of an AI generated caption in a photo, which by the way is hilarious, share it. The fact that there's no a share button and people share the photos on Twitter with a hilarious AI caption. Because I can tell you, I share the shard dogs because I care about the team. Having the same standard message that sometimes doesn't even describe why it is or that you get, can get a free wallet. Like, we don't really have people in the ecosystem who are hardcore product people or who are truly trying to growth hack things. We've all been comfortably and conservatively building infrastructure. 
And that's why we need to put out the bat signal. I don't know, maybe trigger a fire alarm or something, get people in this room, not what people do when a fire alarm goes off. We have reached the point where we have the primitives to truly grow this. And now we need savages out there that do whatever it takes to grow and hack. <laughs> that is true. Yep, got to meet the people. Yeah, no, uh, I agree. I think Shard Dog is are doing great stuff. It's just like, I do agree, like the same caption or like the tweet draft you get when you share, that those are things that can be improved. Uh, but they are improving on another front. So um, I think overall, they are great growth hackers in my opinion. Uh, and Engage Athon is a perfect example of that. Um, yeah, I kind of want to dive into, since we have about five minutes, um, something Jared from Shard Dog had brought up. And I think pretty much when his tweet went out, everyone in the ecosystem felt uh, identified that this was a genuine problem and solution to that problem. So uh, Jared was talking about the fire hose thing, right? Uh, so I kind of wanted to get your perspectives. I think I've seen both of you uh, react positively to that uh, when that went out on Twitter, but kind of get your perspectives on where do you think or how do you think we can make this happen in the new ecosystem? A fire hose? Yeah. I think it's about like fire bed. <laughs> <laughs> I, there's always nuance. Arguably, we did have a fire hose on boss. I am against groupthink. I am against uh, you know, poorly targeted campaign being passed down from above and community members feeling that you can't speak about anything else because it's not sanctioned. So I think that we do need a fire hose approach. Like we need to truly understand the potential of technology and like triple down, but you can have many verticals. Maybe some of the challenges are that leading up to NearCon, we hold back on a lot of announcements so that we have things to say on stage. But now that we have all these really good primitives, people can pick whatever interests them, whatever they may be better suited at, but really triple down. The fact that we have you know, resources to be given out to market and to promote, and that basically no one that I know in the community could explain to me what account abstraction is, and that we've now moved to chain abstraction, we're wasting money. You may as well say, we'll give $100,000, you know, go all in to the first person that brings me users from other blockchains through a chain abstraction. We don't understand it, we don't know. I've seen slides and everyone's in awe that this shit is now live on mainnet. But we do need to, yeah, focus but diversify. Yeah, and I think the tangible example there is bringing it to the real world, again, just to people with things like the Littles where they identified that by going after a night market where there's a captive like audience of like the different vendors, you can actually talk to each different vendor in a night market and get them to sign on to using a token. Like it's kind of NCON but bigger because it's, it's in a market. Like that's an approachable size of a thing that you can do. You're not gonna get a whole city necessarily to do that, but you can take a smaller market and do an activation there where they understand the value of tokenization and loyalty points and things like that. Um, and I think it's rather than just a, a strict fire hose approach of like do it all and there's going to be some conversion somewhere, um, thinking about what those smart opportunities are where it's a, you can imagine being successful um, before jumping off like the, the diving board, like having some idea of what success looks like and knowing that you stand a chance of uh, actually making it happen. It's a little bit big thinking to, to put the technology out there and expect everybody to build on it. Um, if, it if there's no builders that are willing to pick it up and actually bring it to users, then it might as well not have happened. Um, a lot of technologists will focus on the fun tech problems and then once the tech problem is solved, they think that everything is, is done. Um, yeah. That's kind of just the start of having something that you can sell. Yeah, I know that we're almost out of time, but just a really quick example of the way that I've approached growth hacking with a podcast. Every guest is a distribution channel to their audience. So you get inbound new people, and then the threshold is do they stay? But then there's the cross-pollination of exposing different audiences to different people. 
the growth hack is not me using other people to get more views on my shit. The podcast is me asking them, do you have a release? Do you have an announcement? Like, how can my platform serve you so that we join forces and, like, maximize visibility and there's going to be shorts coming up? There's something about organic content that is very valuable, especially in, like, decentralized communities. And, yeah, th th that's a small example of just being thoughtful about the timing of things. And if you're going to do it anyway, just make it worth it. No, I 100% I agree. And I think, like, platforms like your podcast are good uh, windows to showcase what's happening deep dive in some of the different pockets in the ecosystem. Uh, and I know, like, um, I mean, there's, there's I've, I've listened to a few of them, and they really are very insightful. So um, I think, like, y it does... You have a favorite? <laughs> yeah, I've, I've watched a few, but... Um, I kind of prefer the shorter clips because they they go straight to the point and like address a specific thing. Uh, but yeah, I think you're doing a great job on that, and that's another example of how we are doing growth hacking in the ecosystem. Please, I'm gonna stop crying. <laughs> great content re reappropriation. Yeah, cool. great content reuse. Uh, I think we are up on up on time, but uh, was really nice uh, bringing this topic on stage. And yeah, growth hacking will continue evolving. And there'll be more of this in near, especially. So yeah, energy is contagious. You want to see growth hacking? You gotta grow and hack and, and hack grow and hack. And grow and Go <laughs> near con 2023! <laughs> Woo! Thank you. Can you do the? Oh yeah.